Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct to prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's indigenous peoples. Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I move that government business notice of motion number one be called on immediately, and I make the following remarks before I put the question. The government has many legislative priorities. Uh, sorry, in moving this motion, as Senator Gallagher has given notice of, we are signalling to the Senate the priority nature of this legislation for the government. Uh, it's essential that this bill, which is no secret to the members of this place, uh, as uh, it was a clear commit of the Labor Party at the election, pass this Senate today. It's critical to pass today to ensure it can return with likely amendments to the House of Representatives tomorrow, then be enacted to deliver the government's, the government's uh, commitments uh, and to ensure people can be safely transitioned off the card. Unfortunately, the Liberal National Opposition have taken an unconstructive approach to Senate debate in each sitting week since the election and insist on filibustering debates to delay passage. And we are in the position where we need to slip late into this Order. night to ensure Order. the bill gets passed. This is Order. a problem of the opposition's own making. We saw time wasting yesterday and I'm sure we will see it again today. I would like to remind those opposite this Order. government has a mandate. Senator it has Hume. a clear mandate in relation to this legislation, and the government is clear, is clear about delivering upon our commitments to the Australian people. Senator McKenzie. Can I add, make some additional comments in relation to the territory rights legislation? Uh, whilst the government has many legislative priorities to consider before the end of the year, this is one bill I would like to highlight briefly. The Senate has already begun its consideration of the Restoring Territory Rights Bill. It is the government's clear position that we resolve this bill once and all before the end of the year, noting it is a conscience vote and noting that we have taken the view previously uh, that conscience votes ought not be the subject of guillotines. Um, restoring Territory Rights. Uh, is an in, imp issue important to many in this place, particularly the Territory Senators, and I acknowledge Senator Caddy Gallagher, who has advocated on this issue for the past decade. It has been an issue this Senate and previous Senates have considered at length, and we want to ensure that this issue is voted on this year. The motion before you provides an hour for debate on this bill tomorrow to take a further step towards a vote on the bill, and we will continue to look for opportunities through the remainder of the sitting calendar year to ensure it comes to a final vote before the Senate finally rises. And I move that the question now be put. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Wong, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Oh, I just sorry. Um, the question now is that government business notice of motion number one be called on immediately. Oh, those of that opinion say aye. Oh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Uh, one, ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that government business notice of motion number one be called on immediately. The ayes shall go to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order. There being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Government business notice of motion number one, standing in the name of the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher, relating to the consideration of a bill. Uh, Senator Wong. I, I move the motion, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, uh, President, I move to amend the motion in the name of Senator Gallagher, moved by Senator Wong, uh, to substitute all words after that uh, with the words on the motion by leave circulated in my name in the chamber. President, I seek to, uh, to make that change and to be clear to senators what that change would do uh, is to still provide for open-ended debate that would ensure the cashless debit card legislation concludes this week. That is the stated aim and objective of the government uh, and of others on the crossbench, and so the opposition is willing to facilitate that occurring. But what we would propose is that rather than an open-ended, all-hours debate uh, going into the middle of the night tonight, that we actually do this in an orderly way that ensures the chamber gives consideration to these matters at times and in a manner uh, that, des that is deserving of these matters. The government indeed is proposing uh, the adoption at a later stage for the next, uh, next sittings uh, of procedure committee recommendations to apply more family friendly sitting hours in this place that would indeed see us largely consistent with the House of Reps finishing around 8 pm every night. And yet now they've come in with this motion moved by Senator Wong that could see us sitting here until 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. or all the way through Order. until tomorrow. Order. That's why, President, that's why, Order. President, we've proposed an approach far more consistent with the normal practices of this Senate that would see us consider this bill until 10 p.m. tonight. If it's not resolved, the government gets to come back to it tomorrow and consider it until 10 p.m. tomorrow night. And indeed, if it's not resolved, then consistent with the suggestion of Senator Pocock last yeah. week, we come back on Thursday uh, to deal with this. President, that is the way in which we can ensure the matter is resolved, but it is resolved in a thoughtful and orderly manner. Now, President, I do wonder why we're having the hoo-ha about resolving this bill, because the government, Senator Wong, spoke about the clear mandate she claims the government has for this bill. Well, I'm actually uncertain yes, that there's right. much left in this bill yeah, by the yeah. time the government has finished gutting their own legislation. Uh, they've already had to undertake embarrassing backflips in relation to the content of this bill. It now does not seek to achieve what the government took to the election. It barely comes close to it, and yet they're trying to put this on as the order of priority. So, President, we are clear that we are not opposing consideration of this that we welcome the fact that at least the government is not trying to guillotine it, right. and nor are we. And so I put that on record. We acknowledge there is not an attempt to guillotine, and I thank those on the crossbench who probably argued against a guillotine for arguing against it. But it should be done in respectful hours. It should be done in hours where there is thoughtful consideration. It should not be a case of legislation by exhaustion. This is an important matter. It deserves serious consideration. And that is why, President, the opposition is offering a serious, viable, credible alternative. And I encourage the government to accept our alternative and particularly the crossbench to live up to what they have argued before around family-friendly hours, around decent hours for the consideration of legislation and adopt the approach that we have applied. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Senator Wong. I move that the question be now put. So the question is the... Uh, Amendment which Senator Birmingham has put, which I believe has been circulated, be agreed to. Those of Sorry, I'm jumping the gun. So the question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division well, I only heard one voice. Um, so I'm now going to put the motion. So the amendment, beg your pardon. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Birmingham. The amendment put by Senator Birmingham, which has been circulated, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Against? No. 
I believe the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. <coughs> Lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by uh, the amendment is moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
um, stop the count. Senator Hume, we are counting. Uh, Senator Henderson, I'm sorry. Senator Henderson, you're not to move during a count. Thank you. Order, there being 29 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just give people a few moments to get back to their seats, and I intend to put the motion as moved by Senator Wong. I'll put your motion. Uh, senators, please uh, take your seats. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Wong, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute. I oh, beg your pardon, four minutes.
Order. I lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And I just remind senators we'll now go back to uh, documents. So, um, are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? I call the clerk. Proposals as shown at item 4 on today's order of business. I remind senators that a question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, are there... I call the clerk. Okay, Government business order of the day number one. Social Security Administration Amendment, repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam President. I rise in continuation to speak on the Social Security Administration amendment to repeal of cashless debit card and other measures, Bill 2022. And as I was saying uh, in my speech last night, Labor's new amendments to extend the CDC, the cashless debit card, represent uh, a very embarrassing backflip by the Albanese Labor government, but more than that, acting Madam Deputy President, they reflect the fact that Labor has not been listening to the women, particularly the women, in the communities that have been served so well by this card. I want to uh, correct a statement made by the member for Chisholm in his contribution last night when he quite improperly criticised the member for Hinkler, Mr Pitt, when he said when the, the, senator, the senator said they didn't consult with anyone in Hinkler before they did it. They just put everyone on it and said this is the way it will be. Then you add to that a local member, Keith Pitt, the member for Hinkler, who wouldn't meet with constituents who raised issues about this card, who had problems with this card, so there was no consultation before they did it. I want to strongly refute those comments by Senator Chisholm and put on the record that there was very extensive consultation in Hinkler between May 2017 and December 2017. The Department of Social Services conducted over 188 meetings in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay with federal government agencies, community members, local government representatives and service providers. This included five meetings with Commonwealth government agencies, 19 with community members, three meetings with community reference groups two large community meetings with the public, 25 meetings with local government representatives, four meetings with peak bodies and 55 meetings with service providers. 
The Hinkler electorate office contacted 32,000 constituents to get an indication mm -hmm. of their views before the trial was even put forward. 32,000 individuals were sent direct mail. About 500 people were phone polled. An additional 5,500 were sent emails. The feedback that the member for Hinkler received, Mr Pitt, showed that 75 per cent were supportive. Uh, throughout the consultation process, it was highlight, highlighted by numerous groups, schools, frontline service providers, the children in the Hinkley electorate were missing out on the basic necessities of life and needed to be the focus. In May of 2018, the local newspaper, the News Mail and the Fraser Coast Chronicle engaged ReachTel to do a poll. The ReachTel poll showed that the overwhelming majority of people in the Hinkler electorate uh, were not against the card. Just 27.8 per cent of those polled were opposed. So I really want to strongly put on the record and refute uh, the pretty nasty comments made by Senator Chisholm, which were clearly and demonstrably not true. Uh, the member for Hinkler, Mr Pitt, has done an exceptional job in consulting with his community, and I've just outlined uh, some of that work. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, as I conclude my remarks, I just want to again say how sickened I am by the Labor Party's attempts to shut down the cashless debit card. Um, we have now seen, of course, this dramatic backflip where uh, the CDC will now continue in Cape York in the trial sites and those people in the Northern Territory who have voluntarily transitioned from the basics card uh, onto the CDC will be able to rem remain on the cashless debit card. I am also, as I said last night, I am also sickened because this government, the Albanese Labor government, has not listened to those people, those Australians, that this card has given so many positive benefits to. I condemn this government for its attempts to shut down the card, and as I've mentioned and as we've spoken about in this debate, uh, these amendments made it clear that this government got this completely wrong. Not only did it botch its election commitment, it's demonstrated that it has not listened in relation to the overwhelming benefits of this card and the enormous amount of good work that it is doing for so many vulnerable Australians. I condemn the Albanese Labor government for trying to shut down the card, and I hope and trust that common sense will prevail and that this card, which is doing so much good in so many communities, will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Canavan. Oh, sorry, sorry. You're right. Senator Henson. Uh, Senator Hanson. I seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator Hanson, can you just hold and I'll take some advice? Thank you. Um, on the advice of the clerk, Senator Hanson, um, I, my understanding is that you were interrupted yesterday as you were giving your speech. Now, to continue um, with the break of time that's occurred in between, you actually need the approval of the Senate to, to continue to do so. Um, if you wouldn't mind allowing me enough time to confirm with the whips if that, if, if that is if they want to proceed or what method we might need to do to enable this to occur. Um, I'll call Senator Canavan and then I'll come back to you with hopefully a little bit more information shortly. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, this is a very serious uh, uh, bill and it has the potential to impact thousands of Australians and their lives and their safety, uh, their community, as we've heard from other speakers. Uh, the, the areas of our country where cashless debit cards have been trialled and used uh, uh, have been uh, regions in our country that have been tragically and unfortunately uh, afflicted with uh, domestic violence, uh, with, with drug use and addiction. And, and, and the cashless debit card has been a good faith effort uh, to improve 
the lives of Australians that live in those communities, not just those on welfare, but those uh, that would be impacted by or could be impacted by uh, poor decisions made by those on welfare, especially children. Especially children. Obviously, no, no, no children, no young children get uh, welfare themselves or get a cashless debit card, but they're often the victims of, of um, people's lives that are, that, are, that, are, that are tragically gone off the rails. Uh, I want to take a step back because a lot of the debate we've had gets focused on issues of Indigenous Australians, and there's an understandable reason for that because uh, the first trial sites for the cashless debit card were in Indigenous communities. That was because some of these issues I mentioned were highlighted in Indigenous communities, in particular through various corona report, coronas reports about the basics card, which I'll get back to, and, and the cashless debit card grew out of that uh, in response. However, the cashless debit card has applied uh, to non-Indigenous communities, indeed to the entire community of Bundaberg, a, a town of tens of thousands of people, uh, predominantly non-Indigenous. There are Indigenous people in Bundaberg too, of course, but predominantly a non-Indigenous population also has uh, the cashless debit card. So this is actually not uh, a policy or a, a program that is uh, focused only on Indigenous Australians. It is about people. And that's where we should centre this debate. There is going to be and has been a lot of political through, uh, to and fro here, uh, and various claims about orders, orders reports and all these things. But we should come back to why are we doing this and what is its impact on people, on Australian people and their families. And when I think about that, and I'm someone who's fortunately not myself had to resort to welfare over my life, but I'm, when I think about these issues, I, I am struck by the difference between how we approach providing support to strangers uh, that we do want to help, but fellow Australians that we might not know, but how we provide help through this parliament, through our welfare system to do that, and how we would treat our own children and our own family members. Because I've got five children and uh, uh, I, I want to support and help them, of course, grow up. And, they're not yet at an age where they would be applying for welfare, but that will happen potentially soon. Well, soon they'd be in that situation where they might not have a job or might be in between things. And I think about, well, how would I help them? How would I help them if uh, they didn't have a job, weren't in work, or uh, didn't know what they wanted to do with their life, or um, if, they, if they did uh, tragically got addicted to drugs or these sort of things? How would I try and help? Well, I tell you what, I would not, as a parent, go anywhere near or do anything close to how we administer our welfare system. <laughs> I wouldn't do that, because how we administer our welfare system for, for people, not on, the, on a basics card or cash as well card, is we say, look, you're in trouble, we want to help and support, that's an admirable goal and aim, and then we just say, here, have some free money, have some free money, go and go, and go down to this office, this Centrelink office, and you, know, you can get a few hundred dollars a fortnight, and there's no questions asked, just take it and do what you want with it. That's not how I would <laughs> so try and support my children. I certainly wouldn't do that. I wouldn't say, hey, Hey, uh, uh, I'll use a different names. So I'm not, not identifying any kids. But hey, Peter. Here's none of my children are called Peter. Hey, Peter. Uh, here's here's 500 bucks a fortnight. Knock yourself out until you tide yourself over. Until you work out what you want to do with your life. Now, it's not to say I wouldn't provide any help or assistance, or I wouldn't provide any financial assistance to to a child, but I wouldn't do it with any strings attached. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be just handing over money. It would be almost a, a dereliction of my parental duty and obligations to hand over money and, and just let them go. I, I, would be, I would be helping and trying to support, but also uh, in, in response or in, in, uh, in return wanting to see some response from my child, like, OK, I need you to go and do some work around the home, or I, I need you to, uh, uh, to go and apply for this study course or try and train or, or do something. That's what you do as a parent. Now, you might fail. They might not do <laughs> what you want them to do, but you try. You try to put some, some boundaries, some discipline, uh, uh, some, some focus on a person's life and in your child's life while also trying to help them. Because there's just a basic, <laughs> a basic uh, uh, life principle here that if, you, if you're going to give something and get something, you've got to give something in return. You've got to teach people that principle. You've got to teach your children that principle. You don't get anything for nothing. Well, you shouldn't. You do, and that's not like you do. But, but in normal life, you don't get anything for nothing. You've got to work hard to get paid. You've got to exercise to get fit. Uh, and you try and impart those lessons on your children. But, as I say, coming back to our welfare system, we don't do that. <laughs> we, just, we just completely we, 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 we treat um, people that need our help and support 
in a way that we would never even contemplate treating our children. Now, that has traditionally been the approach, but as I mentioned before, measures like the cashless debit card have been good faith attempts to provide more, uh, more, more give and take here. That we do want to help and support people, but there's got to be an obligation that that help and support, in the case of the cashless debit card, is spent on things that are essential for someone's own life, but also, of course, for their family and their, any children they're supporting, some food, uh, <laughs> education, things that are, that are important to them. And so, yes, those restrictions are, uh, are onerous for people. They do provide less freedom than you'd get by earning money in, a, in an employment or a workplace environment. But it's very different than working and getting a paycheck from week to week. You don't get that money for free. <laughs> if you're working in a job, you don't get a paycheck for nothing. You have to work. You have to give up times of your day. You have to give something to get something. And likewise here, those on the cashless debit card get you, give, give support, but there are some restrictions on how you can spend that money that are different from what you would in another environment. Now, that's not to say, of course, with all of these good faith outcomes that they've been perfect or they've uh, potentially solved all problems. They're not going to do that. But the issue I have with the government's approach here primarily is what are you going to do in, 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 when this goes? Like, what, what's the plan? Because uh, we need to think about the history of the cashless debit card. This grew out of another attempt in 2007, 15 years ago, called the Basics Card, to do something similar, to provide restrictions on what could be spent. However, the technology around the Basics Card was very restrictive and uh, it was even worse or harder for people to work under. And so the cashless debit card was a better technology. It provided more focus on, on restricting items that could not be bought using it. Uh, of course, still provides a certain level of cash to uh, people that they can spend on anything, but there's a component that is restricted to items that can be spent on the cashless debit card. It has been, you've got to say, successful in the sense that other people have wanted to join the cashless debit card. That, that we have rolled it out in trial sites, so we haven't rushed this out. It's a major change, and we've tried to take it step by step, as I said, starting in some Indigenous communities, but moving on to, uh, to, to, to broader Australian communities like Bundaberg as well. We've taken it step by step when we were in government. Um, but the, you can tell something's a bit successful when other people seek to join it, uh, put their hand up and say, let's do it. And so you've had uh, the Cape, Cape, communities in Cape York uh, want to convert from the basics card to the, to, to the cashless debit card. You've had uh, people in the Northern Territory uh, want to go from the basics card to the cashless debit card. They've, they can see the benefit in this technology. And, and the government's pro pr proposal here is to take away the agency and sovereignty of those communities, in these cases Indigenous communities, take away their, their, their rights uh, to make that decision and just scrap it all together and leave them with nothing. Like, what, what, what are you going to do? Because if we go back to the old system I mentioned before, we just hand out free money, we know that fails. Like, we know it fails. It's, and it's failed everywhere in the world. It's not something just here in Australia. or It's certainly not something that's just Indigenous community related. This is not about black and white fellas. I can take you to lots of suburbs in Rockhampton that are, that are, that are where I, where I'm near where I live that are welfare deserts because we have destroyed the culture of work, the culture of family, the culture of community through a pipeline of unrestricted welfare. And we pat ourselves on the back here in this place thinking we've done a good job and we put out, put out budget papers. We've spent $2 billion. We're helping people. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're getting them addicted to free money that destroys their lives, that destroys their lives and creates a cycle, a generational cycle that ends up with, with domestic, as I said before, domestic violence and drug abuse and addiction. And we know that. We all have these communities in our, wherever we live. Yet we continue this fiction of thinking that just an extra zero on the budget papers is going to solve people's problems. We know it doesn't, but it makes us feel good. It gives us a good media release. We can go on TV to say how good it is, but we destroy communities from doing it. And that's what the government is proposing to go back to, to go back to the failed welfare policies of the 1960s and 1970s that, that were just terrible and just wiped out whole communities uh, of working class and poor, particularly working class and poor communities when, when factories left or economies changed. You know, take you to re a lot of regional communities have lost their forestry industry or fishing industries, and, and they, have, they have completely... Uh, descended into a, a, to a violent cycle of welfare dependence that we have at least facilitated, uh, sometimes by turning a blind eye. Now, so we're at least trying. We're at least trying with things like the cashless debit card, and it's not perfect. But what are you going to do in response? What's going to be the alternative? Now, we know 
We know what we learned this week, we learned actually more details yesterday in question time, that the government is starting to wake up and understand that they're actually, they, they can't go down this path, that, that, that if we were uh, to completely scrap all of the income management proposals we have in this country, uh, it would consign uh, communities to uh, this cycle of welfare dependence. And you've got lots of communities out there shouting at the government right now to wake up to themselves uh, before we go back uh, to the dinosaur age of free money and free welfare that destroys people's lives. And so we learned, we learned this week that, as a matter of fact, there's going to be a huge number of amendments here in this place today. And for those of you up in the gallery, it'll be a long night if you want to stick around. We're going to be here to the early hours of the morning, probably, because the government has to completely overhaul this legislation, this ill thought through uh, legislation, uh, to reintroduce income management opportunities for communities, to allow the people of Cape York to continue the cashless debit card, to allow other communities across the country uh, to do. Uh, the same, and it raises the whole question now of why are we here? What are, why are we doing this? We don't need this legislation, because the government is now saying, or apparently saying, when we see these amendments, that that they're going to continue the cashless debit card. Now, this is a broken promise I completely welcome, but they have. They went to the election and said they'd get rid of it. As I said, it was ill thought through. They didn't consult properly with communities that are on this card, and they're now realising that and desperately backtracking. Well, I welcome that broken promise. I won't make a political point about it, because it's better for communities, for the government, to, uh, to learn or to understand the error of their ways and turn around here, do a complete U-turn, which apparently we've got happening here in the Senate. But why do we need to do this bill? We don't need to do this. We've already got the legislation in place. The government can adjust the trial schemes as it sees fit. But <laughs> it is embarrassing persisting with this legislation, taking up the Senate's time, making people to stay here to all hours of the morning, making the, 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 uh, the note takers, the Senate staff stay here all night in a desperate attempt to save some face from an embarrassing policy decision they made on the, on the hop, on the rush in an election campaign. So I do welcome that change because what we need to do uh, uh, as a parliament now, in my view, is, is a little bit less talk. There will be a lot of talking over the next 24 hours, unfortunately, because we're here for so long, but less talking and more listening to those communities on welfare, those communities that actually, that actually are affected by these changes. That's what we need to do. Now, I hope these government amendments are apparently going to do that because they're going to allow communities to request these changes. They're going to allow them to do that. So hopefully, hopefully the government will listen. Uh, and not be not 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 uh, uh, not be so prideful to to obsessively insist on on getting rid of something that some communities want and, and works for them. I hope they do listen to them. Uh, Senator Henderson mentioned earlier that Senator Chisholm here completely misrepresented the member for Hinckley yesterday, accused him of of not consulting with his community, and uh, Senator Henderson very uh, succinctly. Uh, um, put rebutted back about the number of emails, and his office had sent tens of the, the member for Hinkler had sent tens of thousands of emails, done hundreds of calls to local constituents about this issue, and overwhelmingly the feedback from the people of Hinkler came back saying they support the cashless debit card. Uh, in the member for Hinkler's case, 75% said they support. In, uh, and it wasn't just the member for Hinkler. The, the newspapers, the local newspapers around Bundaberg, the News Mail and the Fraser Coast Chronicle, they surveyed. They did their own survey, independent survey. And that found less than 30 per cent of people were opposed to the cashless debit card in, uh, in Hinkler, in that area, or in and around, I should say, Bundaberg. Uh, uh, so the communities want it. They support it. And, and the people that are going to be the real victims, if we persist on this obsessive uh, attempt to go back to the era of free money and free welfare, uh, are those people who often are themselves aren't receiving the money but are on the, the receiving end of the destroyed lives that come from receiving free money. Uh, the mums who might be subject to domestic violence, the children who go uncared for in people's homes if we turn a blind eye to the corrosive effects of unrestricted uh, welfare payments. might make people feel good in this place, but it certainly doesn't build homes, it doesn't build communities, it doesn't help people's lives, and we need to make sure that if we're going to hand out support in people, that we also help them with their lives, with the responsibilities that require them to get them on their back and feet in work and rebuild their communities. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Hanson. Taking leave to continue my remarks, and it will only be for five minutes. Okay. So um, you were interrupted by one of the hard markers yesterday, 
and not in the chamber when the debate resumed. So with the leave of the chamber, you will be able to continue those remarks for five minutes. Is leave granted? Leave being granted, Senator Hanson, you may continue your remarks for the remaining five allocated minutes, and then I'll move to the, the prepared program for Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, and I do appreciate the chamber allowing me to continue my remarks. The cashless debit card has been very important to me. I did travel to Kalgoorlie. I spoke to the locals there. I spoke to the, the um, elders and other people and heard their, their plight and their concerns with regards to it. I've travelled to Doomagy, I've been up to the Cape, I've been to Northern Territory, I've been to many places around Australia and to Aboriginal communities. The card, and let's be honest, the card was mostly rolled out in these Aboriginal communities because of the problems and issues that are facing a lot of these communities. Let me explain to the people maybe listening to the broadcast the card was rolled out to ensure that people who were on the card <coughs> had 80 per cent of their money was put on the card and used in services that would pay for rent, buy food or essential services that they required. 20 per cent of that was given in cash to them to spend as they so wished. Over the period of time the card had been introduced, it actually decreased in violence, domestic violence. It decreased um, in seeing um, children stay away from school. So school attendance increased. Violence was on the decrease. You had um, children better fed, and it was helping. In a lot of these communities, what people don't know is that alcohol is illegal to be in the communities. So what happens is they go outside the communities and they sp and spend a huge amount. If they're going to buy a a cask of wine, five litre, it's called a pillow. They'll pay up to about $150 for that pillow, more. A bottle of rum, they could pay $200, $300. So you see, they need the cash, they need the money. So what they were going to, their family members, and threatening to take their money from them, and they did, and they handed over the money to them. And that was spent on drugs and alcohol, not on the children. The people that are suffering out of all this has been the children. And aren't we more concerned about the vulnerable, those people who cannot defend or look after themselves? When you go to these communities, as I have done, you see kids on the street, in the middle of the night, young children, I'm talking about three, four, five years of age, who are not in home, don't feel safe in the homes, not only from the alcohol abuse and the drug abuse, but also from sexual abuse as well. We are supposed to be protecting these people. Also, another point, why shouldn't the taxpayers have some accountability for the money that goes to these people, regardless of your cultural background or whoever you are. If you're going to be on receiving welfare, there has to be a responsibility and show some respect for the money that comes from a hard-earned working Australian who's paying their taxes. And it's usually about $80,000 a person who works and pays $80,000, who earns $80,000 and the tax is paid, goes to support one person on welfare. Their taxes goes to support one person. We have a debt of over $200 billion, or approaching $200 billion, that we pay out in welfare in this country. There must be accountability for it. And this cashless debit card. It's quite funny now to listen that Noel Pearson com complained about getting rid of the cashless debit card in Cape York, and for 120 people, approximately that many people. Now you've listened to, to Noel Pearson. So if you can listen to these people, why do you need a voice in Parliament? Why do you need another voice in another chamber? Why do you need to put it in the Constitution when people can have their say and you listen to what they have to say? So the whole point is, and I'm pleased to see, that you are maybe rethinking this cashless debit card because we've got to look after the vulnerable. And I've got to make a point also of saying I was so impressed with Senator Jacinta Price's speech yesterday. This is a woman who's lived it, who's lived in these communities, has represented people. We who have never, or oh, I'm not Aboriginal and I'm not a person in welfare, but to listen to someone who spoke from the heart to try to explain. And those of us who have never been in these people's shoes must try and listen to someone who has and speaks common sense.
We are here to make the right decisions. Do not let your emotions, saying it's human rights and all the rest of it. Sometimes people need to be taken by the hand to give them, show them love and guidance, and that's what we must do. Giving your sorries and all your apologies and everything doesn't change it, or the stolen generations, that's not about it. It's about making the right decisions that will give the future generations some hope for the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I rise too to speak on these amendments to the cashless debit card. Uh, and I have listened to the speeches over the last day or so and reflected on the lived experience and the passion that so many senators are bringing to this discussion. I did hear an interjection earlier uh, suggesting that in some way this was about extending the debate unnecessarily, and I reject that with all of my heart and soul. Because for those of us who live uh, in communities that are, are marginalised, who are disadvantaged, uh, and not just Aboriginal communities, uh, Noel Pearson, uh, who was one of the people who inspired me to get involved in politics, uh, I heard him speak at a, a press club function um, in about 2008. And he talked about these not being issues of race, but these being issues of poverty. And this is what was, was uh, enacted in rolling out the, the cashless debit card, was to try and assist people who needed, to, uh, needed additional protections. They needed additional support, not just for themselves. And We heard Senator Henderson talk about uh, women being bashed to get, their, to get access to, uh, to social security payments. I'm very concerned about some of the discussion where the minister has been proposing that they'll put a PIN number. On, uh, on social security cards. I mean, isn't that just the same problem as, as forcing people to hand over uh, the password, the, the PIN number, uh, to their card? Uh, I don't see that solving the problem at all. So, like Senator Canavan, I join him in his congratulations of the government for listening. They have taken so many poorly thought through, uh, paternalistic, uh, idealistic uh, statements to the last election, which they are one by one having to reverse. So, at the last lot of sittings, we saw them having to, to re establish the Northern Australia Committee. Day one of the new parliament, they abolished the, the Joint Standing Committee on Northern Australia, and by the end of that following week, we had re established the committee. This is another example of this, this thought bubble that is abolishing the cashless debit card would be the right thing to do. And I do congratulate uh, Labor on actually listening, on listening to the speeches, on listening to the examples that are being given, on listening to Noel Pearson and other leaders about why this is such an appalling decision, why they are actually uh, already, um, by overturning the, the alcohol restrictions in the Northern Territory, by removing the CDC card, they are actually driving families into terrible, terrible situations. And I know the stories that I hear in the North uh, of young people who are unable to study, who are having to get up early and stay up late at night looking after their younger siblings, getting them something to eat, helping them get dressed, get to school, and, it's, and at the price of their own education, where they end up dropping out of school, dropping out of higher education, and missing out on the opportunities that this great country has available to us all if we have the sort of supported childhood that most of us here were fortunate enough to have. So I embrace this embarrassing black backflip from Labor, where they suddenly work out what the reality of the world is. They get out of Sydney and Melbourne and whatever. Um, protected areas that they've been in, and they understand that in regional parts of Australia, and no doubt out-of-city places, that people need the support that the CDC extended because it was a superior welfare card. It had access to a million uh, different sites to spend your money in, as opposed to the basics card, which is exactly that. It is exactly that. It is a second-rate, poorly considered um, uh, uh, you know, alternative to what the CDC is, which is a, a much enhanced card that allows people to focus, uh, as Senator Canavan said, their hard-earned tax dollars of the Australian taxpayer. But when we provide assistance, we provide assistance for this, this safety net, for welfare, 
for, to be spent on housing, on food, uh, on supporting the children uh, to be educated. Uh, these are the important goals of social security, and it is not on alcohol, on grog, uh, on those other um, uh, other expenditure. And that's what the CDC was protecting. So I support uh, Labor's new amendments to extend the CDC um, uh, back to uh, allow the Cape York communities, the CDC trial sites, and those people in the Northern Territory who voluntarily, tra voluntarily transition from the Basics Card onto the CDC to remain on it. This is a very good starting point, and it is just the first admission that they have messed up with this ill-conceived election commitment. And the amendments put forward uh, by the government confirms that even they admit that abolishing the cashless debit card will have serious consequences for vulnerable com communities. I guess what we saw last night when Senator Ch Chisholm uh, attacked the cashless debit card rollout in Henkler was an example of the lack of informed debate and understanding uh, that has happened. And, uh, and so Senator Hen Henderson has already read into the record uh, the huge amount of consultation that happened in the electorate of Hinkler in Bundaberg and, ha Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. Between May 2011 and 2017, the Department of Social Services conducted over 188 meetings with federal government agencies, community members, local government representatives and service providers. Senator Henderson has, has laid all of this out, the huge amount of consultation. And so it is truly appalling to have a, a government senator somehow represent that there was no consultation for that community at all. It is not the case, and in actual fact there is overwhelming support. Uh, when ReachTel, an independent survey organisation, surveyed that community, overwhelming support for the CDC. Uh, and anecdotally, they're talking about participants having money left over at the end of the fortnight. Some now have savings. Children are going to school with lunch and they have had breakfast. Requests for emergency food hampers has plummeted. These are good outcomes. These are great outcomes that we want to see more of and to see all of the federally funded services uh, over 70 existing across the region, which includes drug and alcohol services, financial capability, employment and family and children's programs, just to name a few. So I too want to acknowledge the extraordinary work of the local member, Keith Pitt. He has been attacked by these kind of senseless, uh, ill-informed, ignorant accusations that were again labelled at him yesterday. Uh, when he has fought diligently for his community, for the disadvantaged in his community and for the voiceless in his community, particularly the children and the elderly who now were able to feed themselves, who were able to have more money left over and not be abused by family members uh, who were trying to access their cash. So I welcome uh, Labor's backflip and amendments to this CDC, but you now have to wonder what is the purpose of this legislation at all? What is the purpose for us being here if Labor is just going to slowly and very quietly re, uh, continue rolling out the advantages of the CDC card right across Australia, a card that the communities say work, a card that has seen more families in better situations and, more appropriately, spending the hard-earned taxpayers' uh, dollars uh, that we are using uh, when, we, when we fund social welfare. Uh, because we know that in communities right across Australia uh, there is poor outcomes. Uh, in northern Australia, um, juvenile crime levels are bordering on the ridiculous because one of the results of alcohol and drug-fuelled home environments is that children feel safer on the streets than they do with their parents. Cairns and Townsville will smash previous records for stolen vehicles. Uh, in Townsville, car thefts jumped 124 per cent in 2020-21 and a further increase of 20 per cent in 2021-22. It's a 140 per cent increase in two years in Townsville alone, while Toowoomba, the Gold Coast and Brisbane topped the state's car theft dishonour board. In Mount Isa, 
my much-loved Neely hometown, uh, TripAdvisor is advising against people going to that place. And I know why. Because when you're out in the evenings, the groups of young people roaming the streets, roaming the streets because it is not safe at home. There is no food at home. There is no protection and nurturing environment at home, and they are on the streets roaming around. They are stealing cars, they are creating mischief, and they are not ever going to achieve their potential. Uh, Father Mick Lowcock, who is uh, a, a great man in Mount Isa, he, he picks up young people as they come back from Cleveland uh, a Youth Detention Centre. He, he looks out for them. But he knows that there is only a small number of children that this applies to, but it is children who are not at home because they are not being provided for there. And I would welcome seeing uh, the sort of support that the cashless debit card provides uh, to those children being, uh, being rolled out to Mount Isa and other communities. People pick up these kids, they drop them at home, they watch them run through the house, down the back stairs and over the fence and onto the streets again. And they have nothing, uh, not enough resources uh, and places to take these kids to. So it is clear that steps must be taken to switch off the access to alcohol and drugs as a first step to addressing a multitude of issues. The cashless debit card does exactly that. We have strong evidence over the past five years to show improved outcomes for those who use it and for their loved ones, less alcohol and drug abuse, less violence and more incentives to find employment. And in effect, Labor's removal of the CDC is opening the door to more cases, more cases of children who are not being fed and nurtured at home, who cannot access the advantages of education because they're going to school hungry. They're going to school hungry without breakfast and no lunch and eventually drop out of school altogether. By banning the purpose of purchase of alcohol and gambling products via the card, we are quarantining more money to be spent on fresh food, on school excursions, sports gear, petrol for the car. The cashless debit card, as we have heard, has oper been operating in the Seduna, South Australia, since the 15th of March 2016, East Kimberley, Western Australia, since April 2016, the Goldfields, Western Australia, since March 2018, and Bundaberg and Harvey Bay in Queensland since January 2019. And with virtually no consultation, Labor has made it easier for those at risk to spend their taxpayer-funded payments on activities and substances that harm themselves, their families, their communities and society at large. I want to just finally touch on uh, the community of Kaunyama, oh, I'm sorry, of Dumaji, of Dumaji, where there is an extraordinary group of, of elder women, um, stronger women. They are the ones who are taking in kids um, in, in unofficial kind of loose fostering arrangements from their own children, making sure that these kids have got food, that they're being dressed and they're going to school. I had a discussion with a another senator from the north the other day, and we were, we were worried about who is going to do that job for these young people when those elders are gone? Who is going to have been uh, nurturing, who is going to nurture and feed and ensure these children get to school so that they can access the potential and possibility that they have within themselves? Who is going to do that? And that is why the role of the cashless debit card and other social security measures that protect our children, that protect our vulnerable, that ensure that money is being spent where we as taxpayers are assuming it's being spent. Because this is not about uh, individuals' rights to spend money wherever they want. This is about a protection, a social security safety net for communities that are disadvantaged by poverty by lack of education, by remoteness, by other disadvantage. Uh, and in the first independent evaluation of the CDC in late 2017, the card had, has been shown to deliver considerable positive impact in the initial trial sites, including 41 per cent of participants surveying who, who drank uh, alcohol less frequently, 
48 per cent of participants surveyed who used drugs uh, reported using them less frequently, and 48 per cent of those who were gambling before the trial reported gambling less often. I mean, there have been dozens of evaluations of the cashless debit card that have provided consistent evidence about welfare quarantining policies that show positive impacts on communities, on the, on the people who were previously victims of crime, but most importantly, on our children, on our vulnerable and their future. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Chandler. Mr Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment repeal of the cashless debit card and other measures, Bill 2022. And what an interesting journey uh, this bill has had, uh, particularly in this uh, Senate chamber. Uh, obviously initially introduced, uh, the uh, opposition was certainly not in agreement with uh, that bill as it was initially introduced. We've now seen a series of amendments. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, that, um, as my colleague Senator Macdonald was saying, uh, do seem to be quite uh, sensible in the circumstances, amendments which will allow some of the communities uh, currently utilising the CDC to remain on it. And I think that we in this place uh, should be seriously scrutinising and questioning uh, why we are now in a situation where these amendments are being made, because it is, in effect, the government uh, admitting to themselves that abolishing the CDC in its entirety would be having would have devastating effects on remote and vulnerable communities. And and why is this the case? What is the reason for this backflip? And I think we need to look very carefully at the origins of this bill, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, because this bill was simply or is simply uh, a political fix to try and justify the scare campaign that the now government ran during the federal election. A scare campaign which was repeatedly found to be false and misleading, but which Labor persisted with again and again to try and scare Australian pensioners around the country. This is a Labor Party that spent an election campaign talking about integrity, yet was happy to run a scare campaign about pensioners being forced onto the cashless debit card. And now, to try and justify all of that misinformation that they put out in an attempt to win votes, they are trying to abolish the CDC, causing major concerns for people in the communities where it is being used successfully, and now having apparently the moment of circumspection where they realise that perhaps that wasn't the most sensible tactic. Perhaps there are communities uh, in remote Australia that, that do benefit from having the CDC and uh, are, are sort of trying to uh, backward reason their position uh, because it was effectively coming from a, a place of bad intentions. If we look back at the way that Labor conducted themselves during the recent election campaign, as I said, uh, the answer to why this legislation has been brought forward is very evident. In the lead-up to and throughout the federal election, Labor MPs were continually repeating uh, false claims, utterly false claims, that the coalition government at the time was planning to put pensioners onto the cashless debit card. There was no credibility to this claim. It was rejected outright by the former coalition government on repeated occasions. But that didn't stop Labor MPs and Labor senators spreading this misinformation both online and through targeted media campaigns. And, Mr Acting Deputy President, this isn't just my view, and it's not just the view of the opposition. Uh, an AAP fact check that dated the 22nd of November 2021, months before the election, explored in detail Labor's claim that the former government, the former coalition government, planned to force all age pensioners onto cashless welfare cards. To quote the AAP fact check, our verdict, false. There is no evidence the government intends to put all age pensioners on cashless welfare cards, a measure not permitted under existing legislation. Multiple Labor politicians have claimed the Morrison government wants to put all age pensioners onto cashless welfare cards that would allow the government to control the way they spend their money. There is no evidence to support these claims. False. No evidence. But this didn't matter to the Labor Party. They seem to think that they can get away with not telling the truth to the Australian people during an election campaign or even before then. 
In a media release um, from October last year, the then Minister for Social Services, my good colleague Senator Rustin, said, let me make it crystal clear. The Morrison government will not force aged pensioners onto the cashless debit card. We were never going to, and we never will. Crystal clear, Senator Rustin said. You can't get much clearer than that. This clear rejection followed a number of other occasions in which the minister outright refuted Labor's false claim concerning the CDC, including in a letter the former minister wrote to the uh, Council of the Ageing, where the minister stated that the CDC wasn't aimed at retirees and never would be. That was on the 28th of October 2021. Again, the former coalition government's position couldn't be much clearer than that. But there was a reason that the Labor Party remained willfully ignorant to the truth surrounding the CDC. Blatant, misleading, electioneering. We've seen Labor employ these kind of tactics before, most notably in the 2019 campaign uh, and the 2016 campaign. Yes, we all remember Medi-Scare. Labor remembered it so well that they decided to redeploy the tactic in the lead-up to and during the 2022 election campaign. But now Labor and the new Labor government have backed themselves into a corner. While they promised to repeal the cashless debit card, they didn't think of the resulting consequences for the communities that rely on this card. Despite the very clear finding that this scare campaign was entirely fabricated by the Labor Party, and that's not me saying that, Mr Acting Deputy President, that is the AAP fact check, there was a very long list of Labor MPs and candidates, including the Deputy Prime Minister, who were more than happy to repeat those false claims, like they, inferring the coalition government at the time, have a plan to force 80 per cent of people's pensions onto a cashless debit card so they can control and limit how pensioners spend their money. Or this from the member for Jellybrand. 80 per cent of your pension payment would be put on the privatised cashless card. It's not like an ordinary bank debit card. It can only be used at shops that are approved by the government. They can limit and control where, when and how you spend your own money. Imagine not being able to pay cash to buy cheap food at the local market or a meal or a beer at the RSL. This was all totally and utterly false, and it was called out as false by the AAP fact check as far back as November 2021, six months before the 2022 federal election. But the Labor Party persisted with these falsehoods right up until election day. In Tasmania, the Labor member for Lyons posted, I'm proud to be leading the fight in Tasmania to scrap the Morrison Liberal Nationals government's plan to expand the cashless welfare card to all Australian pensioners. Unfortunately, we know from the facts that the Liberals and Nationals want to expand the cashless welfare card to include all pensioners. This means that 80 per cent of your pension will be put on a card and the government can control where you spend your own pension. The facts. That's an interesting use of words, given what the AAP fact check found. Similar messages were posted to websites and social media platforms of other Labor members. These claims were nothing but blatant and deliberate misinformation. And who is going to pay the price for Labor choosing to run an election campaign based on acknowledged falsehoods? The people and communities who have actually seen the positive difference that the card has made to their lives. We've heard these voices and these concerns throughout this debate, particularly from my colleagues, the fears of alcohol-induced violence against women and children. Yet the Labor government is determined to ignore these concerns from on the ground and push through this repeal based on a scare campaign they ran in electorates thousands of kilometres from anywhere the card was actually being used and supported. The bill shows little care of the consequences for the communities which rely on this card to tackle social harm, particularly associated with drug and alcohol addiction, except as relevant to the amendments which we are now having presented to us in this Senate chamber because Labor have apparently realised uh, that there was some error in their ways. To add an insult to injury, Labor have pushed for the abolishment of the cashless debit card with virtually zero consultation with key stakeholders. And again, I think that's why we're hearing these amendments now, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, as Labor senators are sitting here in this place and listening to the contribution uh, of, of opposition senators uh, who have been consulting with key stakeholders and who have been uh, providing that information to the Senate. These are stakeholders who should have been consulted from day one but were ignored by this government until the very last minute. 
As late as 30 August, the so-called CDC engagement team sent the goldfields a raft of draft engagement documents seeking feedback. These busy shires were given until 12 noon on 2 September to provide their feedback. Simply days. How is this meaningful consultation? How does this allow communities and key stakeholders the opportunity to have their say on legislation that will adversely impact their communities? A couple of days. How can that possibly be long enough? Stakeholders have made their disappointment very clear, highlighting the severe lack of consultation on this bill. The city of Kalgoorlie Boulder stated that the decision to abolish the CDC has been made without any consultation with the regional community, and the city of Kalgoorlie Boulder remains unconsulted on how the transition will impact CDC participants, social service providers, government agencies and the community. The mayor of the district council of Sejuna echoed these sentiments, stating that we've had no consultation about it at all. The first we heard of it was in the prime minister's election promises that he was going to do that. Prior to that, we had no representation from any Labor politicians. The Mindaroo Foundation further highlights Labor's lack of meaningful consultation on the bill, and I quote, we are concerned the decision to abolish the CDC is being rushed through the parliament without appropriate or meaningful community consultation. The removal of the CDC has the potential to exacerbate vulnerability, and this must be avoided at all costs. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, thank goodness that members of the government have been in this chamber and have clearly been listening very carefully to the contributions from opposition senators who have done the job and have been doing the work, consulting with these communities and understanding the impact that the uh, repeal of the CDC would have on them. I am very certain that that is why we are seeing the amendments that we will be debating here later on tonight. The cashless debit card was introduced into communities as an important financial management tool to help improve the lives of vulnerable people in these communities which were looking for solutions to entrenched alcohol and drug-induced violence. And instead of listening to the voices of those people, particularly women and children, who are safer and more secure because of this card, Labor chose to make the CDC a source of political gain through a scare campaign based on falsehoods, a scare campaign that I have outlined here in my contribution today. Labor have pushed for the abolition of the cashless debit card with virtually zero consultation with key stakeholders, stakeholders who should have been consulted from day one but were ignored by this government until the last minute. This bill must be seen for what it is, a political exercise by Labor to justify the falsehoods they used to scare the community for their own political gain. Thank you very much, Senator Chandler. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment repeal of the Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill of 2022. And it's terribly disappointing that I'm rising to speak on this bill, which would abolish the cashless welfare arrangements under the Cashless Debit Card Program, because the Cashless De Debit Card Program is such an important piece of technology. It was implemented by the former government specifically, specifically to assist vulnerable Australians and the communities in which they live. It was an innovative approach, and it built on income management programs that the former Labor government had operated. But most importantly, these programs deliver change, real change, meaningful change for communities. And I know that others around the chamber have said that over and over again today. But more importantly, I worry that the government's motives for this are dismissing the fact that when faced with Order, difficult Senator challenges, Hume, you will be in continuation when debate continues on this bill. And at being 1:30 p.m., we move to two-minute statements. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. The ABC strikes again. What we saw on Four Corners last night regarding Peter Dutton was nothing short of disgraceful. Another taxpayer-funded hit job for the lefty lovies. The board at the failing ABC, who championed this cavalier foe journalism, journalism, should be ashamed of themselves for using our once great national broadcaster to serve up a bucket of slop. Last night we had roughly six minutes of hearing positive insights from interviewees and over 17 minutes from other guests who spent their time trashing Peter Dutton and his reputation. This is rich given most of them had never even met Mr Dutton. Very balanced reporting from the ABC, as always. The lineup of irrelevant guests rolled out by Four Corners to trash Peter Dutton included 
the shameful Cheryl Kernow, the train wreck Terry O'Gorman, the failed Karen Phelps, some disgruntled public, former public servant, some Twitter bore nobody knows or cares about, a no-name human rights lawyer who, don't, who I don't think anyone has ever heard of, and for good reason, who had the gall to say they would not feel safe in a country where Peter Dutton is Prime Minister. This is Peter Dutton, a former police officer from Queensland. This is a diabolically terrible take, typical of the ABC's Cook universe. Peter Dutton has maintained a lifelong commitment to keeping all Australians safe, being a former police officer and a dad, so there's nothing radical or scary about his agenda to keep all Australians safe. The ABC continues to openly wage war on centre-right attitudes, values and beliefs, and indeed centre-right political parties. The ABC treats Australians who do not share their fanciful leftist ideology with disdain. Australians deserve better from our national broadcaster. Last night, Four Corners was a bucket of slop, and we deserve better. The taxpayers deserve better from the ABC. It's time to reform it. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Billick. I was disappointed, but sadly not surprised, to learn that one in four, one in four Tasmanians were shortchanged on their superannuation in the 2018-19 financial year. In that year alone, Tasmanian workers were ripped off to the tune of $76.6 million. The superannuation system was designed to ensure that people who have worked all their lives can enjoy a comfortable retirement, and the deliberate failure to pay workers their full legal super entitlement is theft. Employers who engage in this theft are not just stealing from the workers. They are also stealing from taxpayers by unnecessarily increasing Australians' reliance on the age pension. And by gaining an unfair competitive advantage, they are stealing from other employers who are doing the right thing and paying their workers super on time and in full. In some ways, superannuation theft can have an even greater impact on workers than wage theft. Because super is not paid directly to workers, the theft can take longer to detect. And it is, it is likely to be more costly in the long run. So a $1,000 underpayment to a worker aged 25 could end up costing that worker up to $6,000 at retirement. Right now, workers cannot pursue their claim to superannuation unless it is specifically included in their award, agreement or employment contract. It is instead left up to the Australian Tax Office to pursue. The Australian Labor government will legislate to include a right to superannuation in the national employment standards. This will enable the Fair Work Ombudsman and other parties to pursue claims when workers have not received their full super entitlement. Australian workers deserve greater financial security in retirement, and after nine years of inaction by the previous government, Labor is getting on with the job of tackling super theft, another area that the now opposition let slip. Thank you, Senator Billick. Senator Cox. L uh, recently, I travelled to the Tiwi Islands to support the traditional owners in their legal battle against Nopsema over their failure to identify eight different clan groups as relevant people to consult for the Barossa gas project. From the second I stepped foot on the island, it was clear that traditional owners did not want this as one of the dirtiest gas projects in the world on their country. Last week, we saw the incredible result that the traditional owners were in fact successful, and it was found that Santos didn't do their job properly and Nopsema approved this project regardless. I want to take this time to congratulate everyone that was involved in this case, their hard work that led to this landmark victory. This was also the result of a group of dedicated people who were sick and tired of seeing fossil fuel companies destroying their country. We know that they're not the only ones. Indeed, right across this country, from Beedaloo to Scarborough to Narrabri, traditional owners are crying out for their voices to be heard and their cultural heritage to, in fact, be respected. This case has put fossil fuel companies on notice and is set as an example of precedence for other projects. One of the traditional owners that I had the absolute privilege of meeting with on their trip to Canberra at the last sitting put it perfectly in her saying, we are the cultural giants, we are the original people from this land, and we need to be taken seriously. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to pay my respects to and remember the life of a fellow Western Australian, Nick Way. On Friday, Nick lost his brave two-year fight against motor neuron disease, and I'm proud to have known and to have worked with him. 
Nick was dedicated to fighting for what was right in every aspect of his life. There was a wonderful summary of Nick's life in the West Australian on Monday by Steve Butler, which I encourage everyone who knew him to read. But I'd like to refer to another aspect of his life that wasn't mentioned in the article, and that is Nick's tireless efforts on behalf of Bali bombing victims and also their families, and his coverage of the bombings and his passion uh, to fight for families and victims since that time. He was chairman of the Bali Peace Park Association, and in that role Nick was committed to delivering a peace park at the site of the former Sari Club at Kuta, which was destroyed in the 2002 Bali bombings, of which we're coming up to the 20th anniversary next month. He was utterly committed to this cause and he passionately believed in its importance for all Australians, particularly for those who lived and for the families of those who did not. Sadly, Nick was one of the more than 2,000 people in Australia every year who contract motor neuron disease. This is a truly evil disease, with no cure yet and a life expectancy of less than two and a half years from diagnosis. Nick fought this disease with absolutely everything he had, with every fibre of his being. And I offer my sincerest condolences to his beloved wife, Kate, Kat Karen, and his family. It was a life of many great contributions, but Nick, we have lost you too soon. Rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just want to take a moment today to recognise the fantastic announcement uh, from our Housing Minister this week that regional Australians can count on the Albanese Labor government support to buy their first home for the regional first home buyer guarantee. Labor made this selection commitment to regional Australia, and we are delivering on it three months earlier than promised. From October 1, 10,000 places will be available each financial year through the regional first home buyer guarantee to support regional first home buyers to purchase new or existing homes with a deposit of as little as 5 per cent. Labor took this commitment to the election because we know how hard it is to buy a house in regional Australia. On average, it takes over 11 years to save for a home in our regions. That's why we are wasting no time tackling this challenge. The Australian government will guarantee up to 15 per cent of the purchase price for eligible first home buyers, allowing them to avoid the cost of mortgage insurance. I know many regional employers are desperate for more skilled workers, and they view the prohibitive price of housing as a significant barrier in attracting these workers to regional Australia. The regional first home buyer guarantee will improve accessibility to regional housing markets and allow more workers to stay or to move to our regions. Of course, this is all part of the Albanese Labor government's broader vision for housing, including the establishment of a national housing supply and affordability council to increase housing supply and improve affordability. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Volunteer firefighters embody so much of what is great about Australia. We have around 200,000 nationally who put themselves in harm's way every bushfire season. All firefighters are more susceptible to certain types of health issues than the general population, and this is well documented. Across the country, we do not make volunteer fireys prove this. We presume that injuries, including certain cancers, developed as part of their job. That's the case everywhere except the ACT, due to a quirk in the ComCare legislation. This means volunteer firefighters in the ACT have to fight to prove any injuries were incurred on the job in order to access compensation or health care. The government can change this with a stroke of the pen, and it wouldn't cost a cent. The ACT government both supports this and would have to pay any compensation. I'd like to thank the team at ACT Volunteer Brigades Association for bringing this to my attention and the advocacy that they're doing on behalf of volunteer fireys in the ACT. I've written to the minister about this, 
and I look forward to working with him to ensure this is done before the ne next bushfire season. Thank you, Senator Potocock. Senator Antic. I rise to extend my congratulations to the proud nation of Italy for electing their first female Prime Minister. How wonderful to see a strong modern woman in power, and I'm sure that Giorgia Maloney's uh, victory will serve as an inspiration to women and girls everywhere. Yet, strangely, the corporate media doesn't seem too excited about Italy's progress, and rather than celebrating, they're voicing their concerns about Italy's drift to the far right. So what makes Italy's Prime Minister so far right? Well, as far as I can tell, it's that she's promising to defend the nuclear family, she's opposing woke ideology, and she's proposing to limit immigration in her country. How radical! Could it be that the sisterhood only advocates for women when they hold their leftist views? Surely not. Surely not. That seems unlikely. Surely it couldn't be that their rhetoric about equality and the patriarchy only applies when women hold their world view. It seems that when women hold traditional values, their success is not viewed, viewed as cause for celebration by the selective sisterhood. And I'm sure we'll hear more from the media about the dangers of the far right or the hard right, because Italy's election, as is clear uh, these days, all hard right actually means is normal people who care about their families. Of course, in 2022, defending the family and one's culture does make you a threat to the leftist agenda. The left only enjoys democracy when results mean that it doesn't get what, what, it, what it wants. Italy has elected Giorgia Maloney, showing that her policies are winning issues, and that, Madam Acting Deputy President, is how democracy works. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, my home state, the great and mighty state of South Australia, is well known for its firsts. Of course, we were the first state to grant women the right to vote, we were the first to legalise trade unions, and we were the first to elect a town council, perhaps a lesser known fact. But today I want to acknowledge another amazing first from South Australia in the appointment of Australia's first minister with responsibility for autism in Emily Burke. My good friend, the Honourable Emily Burke MLC, will be taking up this role, and she is already hard at work in South Australia, establishing the Autism Education Advisory Group and overseeing the appointment of autism lead teachers in public primary schools. Her appointment is a demonstration of the commitment by our state government to establish a whole-of-government vision to support neurodiverse Australians. Acting Deputy President, I have had families approach me since this announcement who finally feel seen and feel better supported. One parent wrote to me saying that after her child with autism had had a tough few weeks, the announcement had brought her and her partner to tears. This is a nation-leading change and yet another example of the power of reforming Labor governments, Labor governments which can rewrite history in a positive way and pave a fairer path for all, but especially for our children. I wish the new Assistant Minister, Emily Burke, every success in her new role, and I wholeheartedly congratulate our state Labor government for putting South Australians with autism at the heart of their ambitious policy agenda. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. 2022 is the 50th year since the magnificent Lake Pedda was flooded. And it's 50 years since legendary environmental activists Brenda Heen and Max Price took off from Cambridge Aerodrome near Hobart in Max's Tiger Moth plane. They planned to write Save Lake Pedder in the sky above Parliament House in Canberra. And they started their flight on the 8th of September 1972. But that Tiger Moth plane never arrived in Canberra. And Brenda and Max were never seen again. Their disappearance without trace remains one of Tasmania's greatest unsolved mysteries. As raised by Scott Millwood's film, Whatever Happened to Brenda Heen, in 2000, uh, the 2008 film, Whatever Happened to Brenda Heen, the police investigation was ultimately unsatisfactory, despite police discovering that the hangar storing the tiger moth had been broken into the night before the flight. But on September the 10th this year, the family of Brenda Heen completed the mission by flying a tiger moth from Cambridge near Hobart to Canberra. Congratulations to all involved in such a tremendous achievement and such a fitting tribute to Brenda and Max. 
16-year-old Charlotte Ditcham, Brenda's great-great-niece, was in the Tiger Moth and Brenda's great-great-nephew, Ollie Ditcham, piloted an accompanying Cessna. This is the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, and now is the time for the Commonwealth Government to nominate restoring Lake Pedda as Australia's flagship project in that UN decade of ecosystem restoration. Restoring Lake Pedda would set right a great wrong and it would restore the spiritual heart of Tasmania's magnificent wilderness. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much. I pay tribute today to a very special event and the exciting possibilities it holds for Perth and for Western Australia. The Special Olympics was founded in 1968 and is a global movement that uses sport to foster inclusion and recognition for people living with an intellectual disability. Its oath, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. It speaks to the empowerment and removal of bias the Special Olympics provides. The World Games, held every four years, has been described as the largest humanitarian event on earth. Around 8,000 athletes representing 170 countries and territories compete in 26 sports over 10 days. Past host cities have included Los Angeles, Dublin, Shanghai and Abu Dhabi. Berlin is next in 2023 and we want it to be in Perth in 2027. Perth was chosen as host city for the 2027 bid by the Special Olympics Australia in March of this year, with the ultimate selection panel expected later this year. I acknowledge at this point the incredibly hard work that continues to be done by those at Special Olympics Australia and the Special Olympics Committee in Western Australia. I'm proud to be advocating for them both. I've been hugely informative and it has been a great pleasure to meet with organisers recently in my Perth office, hearing from them firsthand about the real benefits that the Special Olympics can bring to Perth, Western Australia, the Southern Hemisphere and indeed the world. I encourage interested colleagues, particularly those from Western Australia, to do likewise and help bring the World Games to Australia and to Perth. The campaign for Perth 2027 says its best. Let's show the world we are inspired to become the most inclusive nation on the planet. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Payman. Thank you. It is estimated that one in five people aged 18 to 65 will experience a common mental health disorder in any one year. However, people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds are underrepresented in accessing mental health services. They tend to present late to these services and are therefore more unwell by the time they begin to receive help. This is saying that people from cowed backgrounds wait and wait and wait. They find coping mechanisms to deal with how they're feeling or they bottle it up and keep it to themselves until it's serious, until it's severe. There is a stigma in many cowed communities about seeking help for your mental health. Trust me, I know. It's sometimes even considered a taboo topic to remain unspoken or brushed under the rug, afraid of being judged or, being, or appearing weak. Young people in particular face this. There is often an intergenerational difference in perception of mental health. I know that there are many other barriers that people from cowed backgrounds face when accessing mental health services, like a limited understanding of support services that are available, high costs of private services, long wait lists of public services, language barriers, and the limited supply of providers who can deliver culturally responsive services. I acknowledge these barriers. I know how difficult it can be. I've experienced it myself. It takes work from all of us to change this perception of mental health. We need to prioritise our health both mentally and physically. It is okay to not be okay. It is okay to ask for help. It is okay to talk it out. It is okay to take medication to fight the blues. We need to be open with our friends and families because they're there and they love us. Thank you, Senator Payman. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I must speak on Australia's ongoing housing and rental crisis. This is primarily a problem of supply. We just don't have enough houses and rentals to meet high demand. 
In fact, we have the lowest number of dwellings per population in the developed world. Home building in Australia has not been kept up with population increase. The Labor government is only making things worse by increasing our permanent immigration intake. We desperately need to increase supply in Australia, and there's one measure guaranteed to work, ban all foreign ownership of Australian residential property, new and established. We need a regime which requires Australian citizenship or permanent residency be proven at before a dwelling is sold. This must be done at point of sale and stiff fines for agents or vendors who don't meet this requirement. We need current foreign home ownership properly policed. They are getting around the rule that they can only buy new housing. The Foreign Investment Review Board needs to crack down on this evasion, evasion of the law. We need to require all foreign owners to get out of the market, giving them a reasonable grace period to sell property. We must ensure international students here on a temporary basis are required to divest themselves of property when it's time to go back home. State stamp duty must be addressed. Actually, get rid of it completely would be a good start. New Zealand bans foreign home ownership. Canada has also put a ban in place. There's no reason why we can't do the same. This would put a big supply of housing on the market for Australian property investors and home owners at very reasonable prices. We need these tough decisions to be made when people are living in cars and caravans on the streets. We have a housing commission um, minister here in this place. I haven't heard a word from him how he intends to address the housing crisis in Australia. So I'd like to hear from the housing minister on the Labor side, who is government here, how they intend to address it. Here's a start with some of my suggestions. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Bragg. Well, thanks very much. Well, I rise to a place on the record my thanks to the Senate for uh, instituting an inquiry into the big tech platforms. I think it is uh, without question that these organisations have more power than any other set of corporations since the Gilded Age or perhaps ever. They have enormous control over our society and our economy, and we must form a stronger view on the policies which are going to be required to protect our interests, our interests as individuals, but also our interests as a country over these next few years. And my hope is that this inquiry can do a good deal of that work. Uh, it may well be able to shed some light on the sort of policies we should have had in place to better protect our interests uh, in light of the uh, massive data breach that Optus is currently having to uh, address. I think it can also have a good hard look at the use of algorithms and um, how are these used uh, on these major platforms, what sort of policing should there be of these organisations? Of course, as a capitalist, I'm always wary of government regulation, but I think there is no doubt that when an organisation becomes so large and has such a substantial impact on your economy or your society, you should be prepared uh, to consider regulation. So I very much look forward to the work uh, that we have to do over the next 12 months. And my view has been for some time as being a member of this uh, chamber, that the best work the Senate does is through its committees. I'm not so sure about question time being a uh, terrific um, uh, you know, project of uh, determining new information or developing new policies, but certainly the committees do a good job uh, in my experience. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Steeljohn. On the uh, 13th of September, Masa Ramini was visiting Iran's capital, Tehran. And from her hometown in, Western, in the Western Kurdish region. Little did she realise that this would be her last visit. Masa was arrested by Iran's morality police. Her crime? Wearing a hijab too loosely. Three days later, Masa was dead in police custody. Masa represented women around the world. She represents a defiance in the face of restraint, strength and, most of all, freedom. Her legacy will now always remind the world of the harsh realities of women's rights in Iran and, indeed, in many countries. More than 80 Iranian cities have bound together in protest, with women leading the way. A generation of young people, particularly young women, are filling the streets, and I want to offer uh, my full solidarity uh, to the protesters uh, and, in their demand, join them 
uh, in a call for women's rights and for the rights of every person to wear what they choose. These protesters are bold and they are strong. They hold in their hands the future of Iran, and I am honoured to amplify their calls in this place. The Iranian intelligence ministry has said that anyone that takes part in these protests will be doing so illegally. Iranian authorities are making every move to shut down the right of women to have a voice, uh, and they are not holding back in this effort. Over 1,200 people have been arrested, and over at least 57 have been killed to this point. The Australian government must work internationally to hold the regime to account and ensure that the forces responsible uh, face consequences. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Tyrrell. We tell people to get mental health support when they're not feeling great. We say it's okay to not be okay. Go and talk to someone about what's on your mind. So why are we making it so hard for people to get help? Medicare subsidy item 288 ended on January 1 this year. This item helped people in rural and regional areas to access subsidised psychiatrist appointments via telehealth. Mental health providers were only given two weeks' notice of this, over the Christmas period, no less. Merry Christmas. Around 8,000 Tasmanians accessed psychologist appointments under item 288 last financial year. Most of these people can't afford to pay the full fee of seeing a psychologist without the subsidy. One provider told me that 90 per cent of their patients stopped seeing their psychiatrist when the subsidy cut out. The provider told me that patients were in tears when they found out. Their patients are homeless, long-term unemployed, single parents and pensioners, all people who desperately need these services. One Tasmanian mama told me her teenage daughter had been seeing the psychiatrist via telehealth. Without the subsidy, she'd be $100 out of pocket. She couldn't afford that. This woman felt like she was failing her daughter because she couldn't pay for the help her daughter needed. But I bet that mama went without to make sure her daughter was able to have those appointments. There's nothing worse as a parent than not being able to give your child the help they need. During the election, Labor said they would bring back item 288, and I was really pleased to hear that because I know how much people have been struggling without it. But since the election, we've heard crickets. There haven't been any updates, no splashy announcements, nothing that says when this Medicare subsidy will come back into play for the people who desperately need it. I'm hoping that October's budget will bring back item 288. I know spending is being kept to a minimum, but people shouldn't be punished for living in a rural and regional area. Governments shouldn't be saying, hey, because you don't live in a city, Medicare won't help you. We can't put a price on people's mental health. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. We'll now move to question time and Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I did have a question for Senator Wong, but oh, oh okay. Sorry, um, Senator Green. Sorry, we'll that was <laughs> treated as a dress rehearsal. A Senator fantastic Green. opportunity to say how happy I am about the Albanese Labor government introducing the anti-discrimination and human rights legislation amendment Respect at work, work bill today. We know that this legislation is an important step forward in implementing the legislative recommendations of the Respect at Work report so they are finally implemented in full. We know that the previous government uh, left the Respect of Work report on the shelf for over 12 months and then failed to implement the full recommendations. Well, I want to congratulate the Attorney General, the Minister for Employment and particularly the Minister for Women, Katie Gallagher, in the Senate, who has been championing this legislation and will see sexual harassment as a positive duty of employers to take proactive action because we know that sexual harassment is preventable. Uh, thank you, um, Senator Green. We'll now move to question time, and I'll call Senator Patterson. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. Now that she's been tipped off. <laughs> Sorry, my that question... was not my intention. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> my question is for the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. On September 23, Optus CEO Kelly Bayout Rosemarin said to the public of the Optus data breach, "It is a sophisticated attack." On ABC 7.30 last night, when the Minister for Home Affairs was asked if she agreed it was a sophisticated attack, she replied, what is of concern for us is how what is quite a basic hack was undertaken on Optus. On ABC Radio this morning, Ms Bayer Rosemarin described the Minister's comments as misinformation. Minister, who is right here? Good question. Senator Wong. That was to me, wasn't it? Yes. That's a pity. <laughs> 
Speaker. I thank Senator Patterson for his question. Obviously, I've just um, come back from the um, General Assembly, uh, so I haven't been in Australia for uh, much of um, or for, for, the, for the events to which he refers. Uh, I think Senator Watt is probably more um, across what has occurred while I've been away, uh, and I think was uh, asked questions uh, yesterday uh, about this. Um, I, I, this is a, an occasion where it does appear, if I may say, that the lack of action by the previous government has come home to roost. Oh, right. yeah. uh, when you look at, um, for example, uh, Wong, when you look Senator at Wong, the privacy you, commissioner's Senator comments, Wong, could you resume your seat, please, Senator Patterson? Thank you, Madam President. On relevance, there were no questions about the policies of the former government, only questions about interviews that occurred this morning uh, and statements of the minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Patterson. And, uh, Senator Wong has just commenced her answer and she's heard your objection and I'll ask her to continue. Uh, you know, if only it were so easy that the failure to manage to govern properly could be simply dismissed in that way. The reality is you failed to act on so many issues, including on the Privacy Act, including on the Privacy Act. Uh, uh, <laughs> Order. <laughs> including on the Privacy Act uh, and in relation to cyber security more broadly. Uh, and as a, consequence, uh, as a consequence of the government's failures on this front, Australia is less prepared and less resilient uh, to cyber attacks than we should have been. And, and you would know that, Senator Patterson, because you are one of the people on that side who understands some of the issues in national security uh, and some of the complexity. And you will know uh, that uh, there was not uh, sufficient attention paid to this issue by the previous government. You will know, for example, uh, that there were recommendations made that the Privacy Commissioner has talked about to strengthen the regulatory framework to provide additional rights for Australians to protect their personal information. <laughs> Uh, and it does uh, not Senator appear Wong, that they were acted uh, upon. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, President, a uh, point of order on relevance. Uh, in response to Senator Patterson's point of order before, you indicated the minister was just beginning her response um, when he drew a point of order that the question uh, was related to uh, statements about this particular cyber attack uh, and which of those statements were correct. Uh, the minister went. Uh, talking about the former government. You indicated she was beginning her answer and gave some latitude, uh, but there are now 12 seconds less. I ask you to draw you. the minister to the question. I will uh, draw the minister to uh, the question by Senator Patterson. Thank you, Minister Birmingham. Thank you. Uh, I, as I understand it, and the, my brief is that uh, in, on the 21st of September, Optus reported a data breach to the Australian Cyber Security <coughs> Centre shortly I, uh, after identifying the compromise. Uh, they thank took you, action Senator to Wong. The Your incident. time has expired. Senator Patterson, first supplementary. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I note the minister did not say whether she supported the minister's version of events or Optus's version of events, but I'll try again. On ABC Radio this morning, the Optus CEO said that this data was encrypted and had multiple layers of protection. On ABC 7.30 last night, the Minister for Home Affairs accused Optus of having effectively left the window open for data of this nature to be stolen. Minister, who is right here? Senator Wong. Well, self-evidently, the data could be stolen. So I, I find it hard that you come, come into this place, with Senator Patterson, and, and are concerned about the minister saying that when it's self-evidently the fact that, that the data has been stolen. The data has been stolen, and the government has been working, including with, the private, including with Optus, uh, to try and resolve what has occurred uh, with this data breach. But I, I think it is an odd thing to do to come into this chamber and to try and play politics on the basis. Sorry, did you want to say something? Uh, order. It is disorderly to engage across the uh, Senate chamber, and I ask senators to remain quiet while Senator Wong concludes her answer. <laughs> Senator Wong. Well, I, I find it passing strange that you would come into this chamber being upset about a minister making a point that is demonstrated in fact. Uh, this the pro the, this data McGrath. has been breached. What the they, government sorry, is, and the minister. The minister is wrong that the data has been breached. Well, there you Order. Go. Senator McGrath. Yeah, well, I just think that's pretty extraordinary. We, we, know, we know that there has been a breach. Uh, I Senator think that Wong, is not, your time that is has not expired. Uh, before I call Senator Patterson, I would ask all senators and remind them 
that interjections are disorderly and that Senator Patterson has the right to ask his question in silence and Minister Wong has the right to respond to that question in silence. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam President. As part of the response to the cyber attack, will the government expedite passport applications and waive fees of Optus customers whose passport details may have been compromised in this data leak? Minister Wong. Uh, thank you. Look, that, that is uh, a, a, a good question, uh, and it is one that comes at a time where we are trying to deal with. Um, well, I should say that. The, you know, obviously, the situation is evolving, and we are, we are, the government is considering how we respond to identified risks, such as the one that you have outlined. And regrettably, this occurs at a time where we already have a lot of pressure in the passport system, and uh, as a consequence of the previous government's failure to plan for the it's massive spike, the massive spike. Uh, in passport applications, which occurred because people didn't renew whilst the borders were closed, and uh, we've already, you know, I've been, I think, uh, up front with the public, and Minister Watts has been up front with the public. Assistant Minister Watts has been up front with the public about how we are trying to resolve that issue, but uh, that that is an issue that uh, will take time, and we are still dealing with unprecedented demand, and this comes at, at a time where that's uh, where the Thank system you, is already Minister, under your pressure. Your time has expired, Senator Pratt. President. I have called you, Senator Pratt. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister detail the global economic headwinds that the Australian economy is facing? Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator yourself. Pratt for the question. Last night, the OECD revealed um, analysis outlining the significant downturn they are anticipating with downgrades to the growth outlook for almost all of the world's major economies and almost all of our major trading partners. The OECD analysis has wiped 0.6 percentage uh, points off the global growth projection for uh, 2023, is predicting no growth at all for the UK next year, negligible growth in the United States, slower growth in China than previously predicted. Um, and these factors are contributing to this are growing inflationary pressures, increasing energy security shocks, the continued illegal war advanced by Russia against Ukraine and extreme uncertainty over the future. This analysis from the OECD is, um, is you know, confronting reading, but I want to assure Australians that we are working all day and every day to put the Australian economy in the best position it can be placed in to tackle these global challenges head on. In a few weeks, the Treasurer, Dr Chalmers, will be going to Washington uh, for a short trip to meet with our international counterparts about some of the current challenges, to discuss some of these difficult um, issues that, and um, challenges that lie ahead, not just here in Australia but uh, globally. Uh, the reality is, um, certainly from my point of view, that the budget could have been in better and stronger position if it wasn't for the years of mismanagement from those opposite. Uh, and we are doing what we can uh, to put that budget back on track. But there's no doubt that there are some difficult days ahead, uh, which will require um, a lot of work and cooperation and collaboration with our international counterparts. But I can assure Australians that uh, the Treasurer and I and our colleagues are working day and night to make sure that the budget we put together in October assists with meeting some of these challenges. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Uh, Senator Pratt, first supplementary. Can the minister outline how the Australian economy is placed to deal with some of these global challenges? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Pratt for the supplementary. Here in Australia, we do have some advantages that will position the economy well to withstand the worst of these challenges. But as the OECD report identifies, some of these are intensifying and not disappearing, and the Australian economy will not be immune from these impacts. Uh, we are a government that, from day one, have been upfront with Australians about the situation now. And that, and that we forecast to be the challenges that we collectively face in the future. This is a stark difference to the kind of government we saw when those opposite were in office. As I said, this is not aided by the state of the books we inherited, which isn't um, you know, in good shape, and we are making some— we are, we, 
We are, well, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to debate that with you too, Senator Henderson, if you, if you want to bring that on. Um, but we enter this period of uncertainty after a wasted decade, the consequences of which can be seen in, um, in wages growth, flatlining you, productivity and a trillion dollars of debt. Senator Pratt, second supplementary. Can the minister outline why the Albanese Labor government is best placed to guide the Australian economy through these challenging times? Yeah. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Thank you, President. I can. Uh, it is critical for Australia's economy that we deal with some of the challenges, Order. like we have been doing with climate after 10 years of wasted, 10 wasted years on energy policy. 22 failed policies and not one of them landed. Uh, looking at policies which, like cheaper childcare, investing in TAFE, cleaner and cheaper energy, skills reform and a future made in Australia. We need to make sure that we are dealing with the waste and rorts that was defined the period of the previous government. But this is just the beginning, not the end of our work. Our work uh, will um, last beyond this budget and into the next. It will take multiple budgets to fix the mess we got left, and it will involve some hard choices. But despite everything that's been thrown at us, Australians have every reason to be optimistic about the long-term prospects of our economy and our country, uh, and certainly the budget that we are um, putting together right now. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Will the minister rule out tax increases or new taxes on Australians in the coming budget? Thank you, Senator. Um, minister. After, after Johnny. Order. 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 The minister is on her feet, waiting to answer the question, and there needs Not to be silence. Thank yeah. you, minister. Thank you, and I welcome the opportunity to talk about uh, the Albanese government's plan to fix the budget right. and to deliver on our promises. We have made it clear that, and we made it clear during the election campaign, that our focus would be on multinational tax reform. We outlined that in our plan for a better budget. We were clear about that in terms of uh, the revenue that it would return. We were also clear about the savings that we would seek to uh, put in place to fix the budget that you broke. Uh, that is clear in our, what would we call it, better budget, better economy, Labor's plan for a better future. This is the plan that oh, got endorsed. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Thank Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, thank you. On the point of order, I'd ask that, uh, that the minister direct her comments through the chair. Thank you. I, well, uh, there was so much disorder then. I think the minister was, apart from one interjection. But I will remind senators once again that interjections are disorderly and that comments need to be directed to the chair. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. I was just getting started. Thank you, uh, President. But we will not be lectured. We will, we will not be lectured by when in government, when you lot were in government, you were the highest taxing, highest spending Order. government in history. And here you go, trying to lecture us about it. We've been clear about what our plan is. Our focus is on multinational tax reform. Our, you could also support our approach to reduce uh, taxes Minister, on electric vehicles. Minister, we actually want to lower taxes. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, a point of order on relevance. Uh, Senator Cash's question was very clear, asking about tax increases or new taxes on Australians. It wasn't about multinationals. It was about on uh, Australians. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I would ask our senators, when they call points of order, to please be brief. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I am order. I'll call the minister. I do believe she's being relevant. Um, please continue, minister. Uh, thank you. And the point I was making, and I, I have made, is that our focus will be on multinational tax reform. Our focus in the budget will be implementing the commitments we took that formed part of Labor's plan for a better future. Uh, we won't be lectured by those about about taxes. Well, how about you support? How Order. about you support Order. our proposal to lower taxes? How about that? We thought you liked lower taxes. Order. Lower taxes on electric vehicles. How about that? How about you support that? We're trying to lower taxes. Order. That's a priority. Minister. And you guys won't have a bar it. You want to keep them high. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. 
Oh, um, I regret to have to raise this point of order again. Just a reminder to, to direct uh, her comments through the chair, please. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Senator Henderson. I will remind those, particularly on my left, that interjections are disorderly. There are a lot of interjections coming uh, from the left. So I remind uh, all senators that those are disorderly, and I'll remind the minister that uh, her comments need to be directed to the chair. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, President. And um, of course, I will follow that ruling. Uh, we won't be lectured uh, by those opposite about um, taxing when their record on taxing was the highest taxing government. We are doing the responsible thing. We will be implementing the commitments we took to the election. Thank you, Minister. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister guarantee to the Senate? that there will be no changes to franking credits in the upcoming budget, as Labor promised at the last election. Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Uh, this budget uh, will be our opportunity to implement the commitments we took to the election, uh, Order. which we took to the election. As I've been clear, we are implementing the policies that we took. Uh, remember those? Define We've policy, got them. Jane. We've got the policies. We will be implement the October budget is is partly to implement our election commitments, and the other part of the October budget, um, sorry, through you, President, is to deal with the waste and rorts that you guys buried in the budget uh, as a payoff uh, to Minister, colleagues when you were your using. Seat. Please resume your seat. Uh, sorry, Senator Cash. I'm waiting for silence. Senator President, Cash. a point of order in relation to relevance. The question actually was incredibly specific. It referred to ruling out changes to franking credits. I would ask you that you direct the minister to be relevant to the question. Thank you, uh, Senator Cash. Uh, it also included the word budget. Uh, but the I can't direct the minister to answer your question. I can. Order. Order. I can direct the minister where she's not being relevant to be relevant. I'll ask her to continue. Please continue, Minister. I think I've answered the question. The, the, the budget, which I was asked about, you are right, um, President, I was asked about what will be in the budget. It will be a combination of policies we took to the election and the other, the first stage of the waste and rorts work that I've been doing, cleaning up the mess, the billions right. of dollars in the budget that you buried for political convenience. That's yeah. what this budget will be about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Senator Cash, second supplementary. President, can the minister advise whether Australian families will receive the promised $275 energy bill relief in the upcoming budget? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Uh, well, then, honestly, the audacious... <laughs> You, you, you continue to surprise me, Senator Cash. Honestly, after 10 years, 22 failed energy policies, a 20 per cent increase Order. in electricity prices on your watch that you buried before the election, that you would stand up uh, and ask Minister, us about energy Minister, prices. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Wong. Order. Order! 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 Senator McGrath and Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order. I have a senator on her feet seeking to make a point of order, and it was so disorderly that Senator Cash had to sit down again. I would ask senators to listen quietly. Senator Cash. Thank you, uh, President. A point of order in relation to relevance. The question was actually about the government, not the opposition, and whether or not Australian families will receive the promised $275. You, Cash, and I, I would ask you to direct you, the Senator minister Cash, to the question. Thank you, I will direct the minister to uh, your question. Minister. Thank you. It's just the audaciousness of it is, is stunning. Is, is, it, it's it's, it's just staggering. It's absolutely staggering. As though you're these as those are all these passive players Our in minister, the decade of energy failure. Honestly. Minister Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Cash, order. 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 
Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Minister, please continue. Minister, have you concluded your answer? You had you did have five seconds. Okay, thank you. Senator Cox. Uh, thank you, Senator Stirl. Senator Cox. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Minister Wong. Uh, given last week's announcement regarding the landmark case against the Australian government lodged uh, to the uh, UN uh, Human Rights Committee uh, by the people of the Torres Strait Islands in May 2021, I clearly stated the federal government breached their fundamental rights to culture and life. What will the new Labor government do to ensure they uphold Indigenous rights as part of their climate policy and planning, in particular Article 27, the right to culture, and Article 17, the right to be free from arbitrary interference with privacy, family and home? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister. Uh, thank you to Senator Cox for the question. Uh, and she's correct that the UN Human Rights Committee found on Friday, the 23rd of Australia, uh, sorry, I apologise, 23rd of September, that Australia had violated the rights of a group of Torres Strait Islanders by failing to, to adequately protect them from the impacts of climate change. Uh, and the finding was made in response to a 2019 complaint filed by eight Torres Strait Islanders from small, low-lying islands uh, in the Strait. Um, uh, this is a reminder, if I may say, before I try to respond to the second part of the question, of what the um, Labor Party has been saying for years, which is that uh, climate change was an existing threat. Uh, to uh, island nations and island homes, uh, both in the Pacific Island Pacific region, but also in the Torres Strait. And uh, I can recall going to, I think it was to Saibai Island uh, when I was climate minister, uh, and seeing firsthand, and this is in 2008 or 9, um, what was already occurring uh, as a result of uh, increased um, storm surge and how that was eroding coastline and eroding infrastructure. And, it is a reminder yet again of the irresponsibility of those opposite who for nine years refused to do anything about this. Uh, in relation to um, the broader issue, which is how you, how you try to give effect to and give faith, keep faith with First Nations peoples, um, we, we have a long way to go on this, Senator. I acknowledge that. And, and part of what we are trying to do with um, a First Nations um, uh, ambassador and uh, First Nations foreign policy initiatives is to work through how it is that you bring uh, the, the perspective of uh, First Nations peoples into the work we do in the world, including on climate. And I was very grateful to have Senator Dodson accompany me to the UN General Assembly for that reason. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Uh, Australia can no longer hide behind the fact that, um, or the myth, in fact, that Scope 3 emissions are not the res their responsibility and they are free of legal obligation after this landmark case. What are the decisive steps this government are taking to drastically cut uh, emissions and invest in adaptation measures in the Torres Strait Islands and other First Nations communities vulnerable to climate change? Minister. Thank you. In relation to the first part, we're not hiding behind anything. That is the framework the United Nations has agreed. Senator, so let, let's be clear about that. That is that we, we are adhering to a framework that the world community has agreed. And we will take decisive steps as we are taking for the first time in a decade to reduce emissions. Uh, and under our policy, uh, the majority, uh, in excess of 80 per cent of Australia's energy, despite the fact we, you know, we have vast uh, fossil fuel resources, the, vast, the overwhelming majority of our energy under our plan, this decade will be renewable. And they are, that is a substantial step. Uh, in relation, to, uh, and because I'm tired, I forgot the second part of your <laughs> question. <Okay. laughs> um, but in relation to um, the broader issue of adaptation, I would would make the point um, we, we we are clear about the need to try and help and work with uh, Torres Strait Island Thank communities. Thank you, Senator Wong. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Cox, second supplementary. Minister, when will this government start listening to the voices of First Nations people in Australia, led by our Torres Strait Islander brothers, sisters and their children, who echo their neighbouring Indigenous nations of the Asia-Pacific and globally to say no to new coal and gas projects on their ancestral lands that breach their human rights, fast-tracking the destruction of our culture, climate and risking their livelihoods? 
Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister. Well, first, in relation to the voice of, of First Nations communities, uh, uh, you know, Australia's um, regime. Uh, Regime, environmental assessment regime, and should ensure that those voices are heard. And I think you have seen from uh, senators in this place on this side, uh, and I would hope for some from the other side, a re recognition that you know, that is an important part of ensuring approvals meet the the, the community test, the social licence test. Uh, in relation to who we are listening to, I would make the point to you, Senator, that the Torres Strait has seen the Prime Minister. The Minister for Indigenous Affairs and the Climate Minister all visiting uh, in the first months of government to hear firsthand from First Nations people in the Torres Strait about their experience, what they need and how we can help. We intend to engage in good faith uh, with them uh, and with the views of the Human Rights Committee. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Watt. The cyber attack on Optus and the theft of personally identifiable con customer data is of great concern. Can the minister please update the Senate on the breach and the possible impact on Australians? Thank you, Senator. Uh, minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Ciccone. You're right, this is a matter of great concern to all Australians. Australians expect when they hand over their personal data that every effort will be made to keep it safe from harm. We know that billions of Australians have been impacted by the Optus data breach. This data breach, let's be clear, should not have happened. It involved the release of Australian citizens' names, date of birth, phone numbers, email addresses, residential addresses and, for some customers, passport and driver's licence numbers being for sale on the dark web. Completely unacceptable. We are incredibly concerned, as a government this morning, about further reports that personal information from the Optus data breach also includes Medicare numbers. Medicare numbers were never advised to have formed part of compromised information from this data breach. Optus has a clear obligation to notify affected individuals and the Australian Information Commissioner when a data breach involving personal information is likely to result in serious harm. Consumers also have a right to know exactly what individual personal information has been compromised in Optus's communications to them. Yesterday, the Minister for Home Affairs called on Optus to provide more support to impacted customers, and I was pleased that Optus made a commitment to provide free credit monitoring to impacted consumers. This will help protect consumers against identity theft as a result of this breach, and I know all of my uh, government colleagues are of the same view. Uh, the government expects Optus to continue to work with customers to help them understand the impact on them and what Optus can do to help. Optus owes the Australian public a full explanation and nothing less. Thank you, Minister. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for that response, Minister. Uh, can you please outline the steps that the Australian government is taking in response to the data breach? Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Giacconi. As the Minister for Home Affairs said yesterday, and I repeated in this chamber yesterday, very substantial support has been provided by the Australian government since this data breach was revealed, and I want to credit the work of the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Australian Federal Police for their support. The Attorney-General has also announced today that the Federal Bureau of Investigation is also assisting the AFP with this investigation, which shows the reach of this data breach. The Privacy Commissioner is currently working with Optus to obtain further information to determine whether she will conduct a formal investigation. While we will, of course, not go into the technical assistance and cyber security advice that is being provided to Optus, we want to reassure Australians that the full weight of cyber security capabilities across government, including the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Australian Federal Police, are working around the clock, along with ministers, to respond to this breach. Thank you, Minister. Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. And I thank again the minister for that answer. Uh, could the minister please outline how this government's approach to cyber security contrasts with the previous administration? Senator Watt. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. And uh, This is a very important point that I know Senator Wong was going to in her answer to Senator Patterson's questions as well. I've here outlined the approach that this government has taken in the short time that we've been in office in response to cyber security in general and in response to this particular data breach. And the contrast with the inaction and sloth that we saw from the then government for 10 years could not be greater. 
Just to give you one example, in March 2019, over three years ago, the then Attorney General, Mr Porter, uh, said, stated that existing protections and penalties for misuse of Australians' personal information fall short of community expectations three years ago. He followed it up by finally introducing legislation in June 2019, uh, saying again that penalties needed to be increased for data privacy breaches. That legislation then sat around doing nothing for three years. Further legislation was introduced just before the election, and nothing happened. Now, I noticed Mr Tan this morning saying this government was asleep, the former government was asleep at the wheel. Thank Here you, is Senator yet another White, example of doing so. Your time has expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. ACOS has today launched a new report, How Job Seeker and Other Income Support Payments Have Fallen Behind the Cost of Living. We already know Australians are suffering the worst cost of living crisis in generations. The report reveals just how bad this is. 62 per cent of low-income earners are eating less or skipping meals. 71 per cent are cutting back on meat, fresh fruit and vegetables. Almost half of low-income earners spend half their income on rent. 71 per cent of low-income earners have been cutting back on heating over winter. When will the government raise the rate above $48 per day and lift millions of Australians out of poverty? Thank you, Senator. Um, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And I thank uh, Senator Pocock uh, for that uh, very important uh, question. Um, the, um, the issue is one that the uh, current government uh, uh, takes, uh, takes very seriously and uh, appreciates the um, sentiment in which you have raised this uh, and the sincerity with, uh, with which you have uh, raised, uh, raised the issue. I will make a couple of uh, observations. Um, uh, about the process, um, of course, uh, there uh, there will be uh, an indexation uh, process in the uh, in the October uh, budget, um, and we know from uh, statements uh, already made by the, uh, the Prime Minister uh, that uh, he is obviously concerned about the issue, concerned about the people um, <coughs> who. Uh, find themselves in this uh, situation, uh, and uh, he has undertaken to um, look closely at the issue and to see what can be done uh, in what is a very um, difficult budget um, circumstances. We were left with a uh, trillion dollars worth of uh, debt, um, as has been <coughs> as has been said already. Uh, the highest uh, taxing uh, and highest spending government uh, in history, the previous uh, government. That's left us with an extremely difficult set of financial uh, circumstances uh, to deal with. Uh, but um, the Prime Minister uh, understands, under, understands the issues um, uh, that people in these circumstances find themselves, and he has uh, undertaken that. Uh, he will, uh, he, he will look at uh, the issue and Thank look you, at Minister, uh, the issue. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Sorry. Senator Pocock, uh, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Outside of indexation, will the rate be raised in the September budget? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Um, Minister. Thank you, um, Senator Pocock. And again, thank you for, uh, for uh, your, your question. And, uh, uh, your concern uh, in this uh, in this space. Um, uh, <coughs> I'd make this observation that um, it's not uh, customary for um, ministers, particularly ministers uh, like myself, to uh, reveal what uh, may or may not be in the uh, in the budget. That's uh, for uh, the uh, the treasurer to uh, deal with and. Um, uh, he will deal with that uh, in, uh, in due course, and we don't have uh, very um, <coughs> long to wait uh, to find out what uh, will be in what will be the, uh, the first Albanese, uh, Albanese budget. Um, however, um, I, I, can say, I can say this: that um, um, five million uh, people. Um, uh, on Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, President. Uh, we hear much.
from the government about tough uh, challenges and tough choices that the government face. This is about choices. What do you say to mm -hmm. Canberrans like Sam and Leilani, who are here today, about whether they should choose between housing or heating? What do you say to them when you're subsidising a fossil fuel industry that's making record profits to the tune of billions of dollars of taxpayer money? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Well, I say uh, welcome to uh, the Senate uh, to them. Uh, if they'd like to identify themselves, I'll give them a little wave. Um, there we are. There they are. Um, look, Order. Look, Order. I've, I've answered all of the questions as honestly as I can. Um, I, wish, I, wish, I wish with a wave of a wand we could solve every uh, difficult financial issue uh, Order. that we— <coughs> I wish, with the wave of a, of a wand, we could solve every uh, difficult financial issue that we were left by this uh, incompetent uh, coalition uh, government over the last nine years. But we're not going to be able to do that. But we understand the issues, and I, I can only repeat what the Prime Minister has uh, already said: uh, that uh, it's his intention to look at this issue. Uh, from now on in respect of Thank every budget. Thank you, Minister. Budget. Your time has expired. <laughs> Senator Cadell. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Minister, on 29 July, the Minister for Health said, it's never been harder or more expensive to see a doctor in Australia, and just yesterday described the GP shortage as terrifying and something he is deeply concerned by. Given the Health Minister clearly recognises the pressures of the health system is under, can the minister guarantee the government will not cut the $27.5 million in regional development funding for the Coffs Harbour Health Services precinct delivered in the 2022 federal budget? Thank you, Senator Cadell. Minister. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And, um, I, can't, I won't stand here and um, foreshadow decisions uh, that have been considered through the budget process. We are, I have been clear with the Chamber and I think publicly that we are reviewing measures from uh, the, 22, the March 22-23 budget. Um, Sorry, what March. Did you say about Medicare, the, the March election, the budget before the election. We are reviewing that. There was a lot of spending in that. Order. But if that spending Senator is warranted, Rustin, if it's Watt. needed, if it meets that test, um, then we will make decisions based on that. Like, seriously, we need to go through an incoming government to have a look at where this money was placed. And we've seen reports in the paper today about some of the decisions uh, made under some of these programs where proponents weren't aware of it, uh, where applications weren't made for it, when disproportionate amounts went to particular parts of the country. So there is a legitimate issue here that we are taking our time to work through. On the issue of health, uh, and making sure that the health system is adequately resourced. We have already injected, I think, over uh, $1.4 billion into the health system through various payments and COVID-related things. Um, I'll check that figure if I've got it wrong, but we have made those investments. These were money that wasn't uh, provisioned for by the previous government. We have made additional investments into health. On the issue of the GP shortage, that it is a crisis. Primary care is in crisis, and nine years of cuts to Medicare and pushing back and not, not ensuring that there was a good supply of doctors coming in and being trained into general practice is a problem that we inherited from those opposite that we are trying to fix. And people can be guaranteed that the Labor government will always be better on hospitals and always better on Medicare. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Order. Senator Cadell, uh, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister also uh, guarantee the government will not be cutting the $19.5 million in regional development funding for the Shepparton Rural Clinic Health School delivered in the 2022 federal budget? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Uh, thank you. Well, as I said, my answer is the same. Uh, we are going through all of the measures. If they stack up, if they, if they actually uh, meet that quality test of yes, they're needed, yes, they can be delivered, yes, they've been properly um, uh, costed, 
um, we will proceed with many of the measures where they meet that test. If they don't meet that test, then we are looking at other opportunities to reprioritise, to return money to the budget. Can I just remind people, the budget we inherited uh, had deficits in the order of over $200 billion. $200 order. billion dollars across the Ford estimates, a trillion dollars in debt. We far. have debt cost of servicing debt are going to exceed many government programs in the next few years. Just the increase in interest is going to hit the budget Senator to $125 McKenzie. billion. Dollars. This is the budget that we're trying to manage, and we will prioritise Thank you, Minister. accordingly. Your time has expired. Senator Cadell, second supplementary. Uh, can the minister guarantee the government will not cut the $8.3 million regional development funding for a national post-traumatic stress disorder centre at the University of the Sunshine Coast delivered in the 2022 federal budget. Thank you, Senator. Minister. Well, we're working through all of that. Uh, as I've said, my answer is the same to the two previous questions. But I would also say that we are no, this is serious. We are also working through all of the health programs that are ongoing programs, like adult dental, for example, that just falls off a cliff next year. Yeah. They're the problems that we've inherited. What about the My Health Record Why Card? Also, we'll just get Order. rid of that, shall we, in the next two years? We have so many terminating programs in health. Over 200 terminating programs that we are dealing with that you hid. So you tried to make your presentation of your budget look better by cutting services Senator and not funding McKenzie. them properly, by not funding them in an ongoing. So is adult dental going to need to be funded after next year? Yeah, I reckon there's a pretty high chance it needs Senator to be. McKenzie. But yet those opposite didn't make provision for it in the budget, and this Senator is what we are fixing. Uh, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister for Finance, Minister Gallagher. Order. Um, Senator Lambie, please resume your seat. Uh, we've moved on now to Senator Lambie's question. She has the right to ask it in silence without the constant interjections across the chamber. They are disorderly. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister for Finance, Minister Gallagher. The MOPSAC review is due to be completed by the end of this week. Will the government immediately release the review when it is provided to the Prime Minister? If it doesn't intend to release it there and then, how long will it take until you will release that review? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Sorry, I just didn't catch the um, end of your question, but if it, and I thank Senator Lambie for the uh, question. Um, I think it was around release of the MOPSA review. I think the intention is to release that review uh, after people have, uh, after it's been provided and people have had opportunity to be briefed on it, the intention is to release that review publicly. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, standard convention is that opposition staffing is set as, set as a proportion of the staffing allocation afforded to the sitting government. What's the convention for the crossbench? Minister. My understanding is that uh, the allocation of uh, personal staff to uh, officers of, um, well, across ministerial officers, opposition officers, and crossbench is at the uh, complete discretion of the Prime Minister. Um, that that is uh, a decision that falls entirely within his portfolio, and he's made those decisions uh, based on information and advice he's had. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Since the Prime Minister has never been the never been uh, come from a crossbench, why should the leader of a political party have the power to set the resources available to his political opponents? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. This is the arrangement that has existed for some time, is my understanding, um, that uh, staffing levels in this building and how many advisers uh, that people are entitled to have is at the discretion of the Prime Minister. I think, uh, certainly from the discussions that I've had with him, um, that uh, he felt that additional staff over and above EO staff should be provided to uh, members of the crossbench where they had additional responsibilities, uh, and that's what he's done. So everyone gets the four electorate office staff and where there's additional responsibilities, and I think in the Senate um, people have been provided with uh, two additional staff. Uh, on top of that, that means as personal staff, uh, crossbench have six um, 
sick staff available to them and that we use electorate office staff, as, as members in this place uh, do all the time. In fact, I'm using EO staff in my office when required as well to Thank support you, parliamentary Your responsibilities. Time has expired. Senator Stirl. Thanks, uh, President. My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. The tourism and travel industry have had a few challenging years. Given today is World Tourism Day, can the minister please provide an update on how the industry is faring? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank uh, Senator Stirl for his um, um, excellent question on uh, World uh, Tourism Day. Um, <coughs> And it is, in fact, uh, World Tourism Day today, and I'd uh, like to uh, say thank you to the dedicated people who work in our tourism and travel industry. Without you, we wouldn't have such a robust and vibrant tourism industry. The survival of tourism businesses and the growth that we've seen in the domestic tourism market is a testament to the hard work and dedication of those people who work in this industry. It has been a, a very tough few years for many uh, travel and tourism businesses. Managing through uh, the pandemic was no small feat. But Australians are back out enjoying some of our iconic uh, regions, ticking things off uh, their bucket list and supporting local travel and tourism businesses. Tourism Research Australia's data shows that domestic tourism is actually booming. Many regions have surpassed where they were uh, pre-pandemic <coughs> and others are close to pre-pandemic levels. The previous government had all of the wrong priorities. They had to be dragged kicking and screaming to introducing uh, JobKeeper and then they moved it uh, from tourist, uh, tourism businesses far too early, knowing that many were still struggling immensely. The growth seen in our domestic uh, industry is a testament uh, to the hard uh, work of those who uh, work in the, uh, the visitor economy and their determination uh, to keep the doors open and the tours operating. And again, I say uh, thank you to uh, every single person who works in our tourism and travel sector. Thank you, Minister. Senator Stirl, first supplementary. Yes, thank you, President. Um, Minister, what is the Albanese government doing to support tourism and travel industry to recover post-pandemic? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, once again uh, Senator uh, Stirl for his uh, very important uh, question. Uh, this government, uh, unlike the previous government, understands the importance of the uh, travel and uh, tourism industry, <coughs> and uh, that's why uh, we've decided that uh, in the upcoming uh, budget we're going to invest in the recovery of, uh, of this uh, sector. Uh, Pre-COVID, the uh, visitor uh, economy uh, was worth about $166 billion uh, annually, and it was growing faster than GDP, and uh, supported uh, one in uh, 12 Australians uh, in work. Our $48 million tourism package aims to attract and train workers upgrade caravan and camping infrastructure, increase the focus on business events. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Stirl, second supplementary. Yes, President. Thank you. So what are some of the outcomes, uh, Minister, are you hoping to come from the tourism minister's meeting? Thank you, Senator. Minister. Thank you, President. And uh, that's an excellent question, uh, Senator uh, Stirl. Uh, Pre-pandemic, uh, tourism employed almost uh, one million Australians across every state and uh, territory. And it's a truly national industry in which every jurisdiction has an interest in maintaining and, uh, and growing, which is why I'm looking forward to meeting uh, with my fellow tourism ministers at the upcoming ministerial meeting in Adelaide next week. Uh, we'll be discussing ways that uh, all governments can work together to support our tourism industry in all of the regions. There will be a focus on addressing uh, the workforce and uh, skill shortages, as well as issues uh, facing uh, aviation in our country. These are some of the largest problems facing the, uh, the sector, and uh, unfortunately no region has been immune. Uh, they are not new issues, just ones that the last government Thank simply— Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. 
Thank you, Senator Farrell, for that. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The ACCC states that because of the temporary cut in the fuel excise in the period 29 March to 10 May 2022, the largest decrease seen in average daily regular unleaded petrol prices was more than 39 cents per litre in all five largest cities being Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, and between 25 and 48 cents per litre in Canberra, Hobart and Darwin. Does the minister agree? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Sorry, what do I agree with? The, the, what, the facts that you just put about the ACCC. Sorry, I'm genuinely, I'm seeking clarification. Yeah. Uh, reread, if you'd like to reread the question. My question Senator is to the minister Smith. representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The ACCC states that because of the temporary cut in the fuel excise, in the period 29 March to 10 May 2022, okay. the largest decrease seen in average daily regular unleaded petrol prices was more than 39 cents per litre in all five largest cities, being Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, and between 25 and 48 cents per litre in Canberra, Hobart and Darwin. Does the minister agree? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Oh, thank you. Well, I've got no reason to disagree with the ACCC. Um, I, as, yeah. Well, uh, order. Um, I have no reason to. Um, the information I have before me uh, aligns largely with that, um, which is, um, I think, taken from a different data source. But um, yes, in the larger markets, uh, falls in the order of um, anywhere from 26 per cent in Sydney to, I think, the biggest in Perth and Darwin, uh, which were higher than that. Uh, so yes, I have no reason to, to disagree that um, because of the fuel excise um, temporary measure uh, that we did see a fall from the peaks that were experienced in, in March. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the Minister advise the Senate on the average monthly benefit to motorists living in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth of the decision to provide temporary fuel excise relief. Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have Senator, that information. I'll see if I can and make it available, but it's and it would vary, obviously, across households um, considerably, depending on the number of cars, the distance that you travel for work, uh, people obviously living in the suburbs. Um, and commuting to the city versus those that were in the city. I mean, it's a whole range of different factors there. But I don't think any of us, any of us, are disputing the fact um, that the excise, which cost 2.9 billion dollars for six months, uh, reduced the price of petrol at the Bowser. That was the intention of that policy. It's an. In, it, it was when yeah, petrol prices were considerably higher than they are right now. Uh, your, your party, when in government, um, set the timetable for that uh, to come off at the end of September. Uh, we are we, our decision is aligned with the timetable that you, when you were in government, set. Uh, it was at, um, set as a temporary measure, and as um, people would know, well, I'll have Minister, the opportunity to talk further. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. The Treasurer, Mr. Chalmers, Senator has. Searle. The Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, has said industry estimates that there will be more than 700 million litres of lower excise fuel in the system when the fuel excise is reintroduced. And so the ACCC and the government expect that the price of petrol shouldn't shoot up at the Bowser on Wednesday night by the full 23 cents if the normal market pressures are in operation." End quote. Given the Treasurer's comments, can the minister confirm the date? On which Thank Australian you, motorists Smith, can expect expired. to be paid. Well, it'll be the date when those 700. Uh, sorry, that <laughs> I can't remember the exact figure. It was the exact figure that you quoted, 700 million litres, um, when that expires. I mean, that's the point we're trying to make: that we would not expect, and we will look uh, very uh, firmly down on any um, petrol station that has supplies purchased under the previous arrangement that sees the need to overnight jack the price up 23 cents a litre. We want to make sure that people get the right deal 
uh, to the maximum possible benefit from the fuel that was purchased under the arrangements where the temporary measure was in place. I think that's entirely reasonable. I hope you would agree with that. that um, you know, and I think petrol stations will do the right thing, and we want to make sure the Australian people knew about that, which is why we made those comments last week, uh, and it's why the ACCC will be watching this um, as the um, temporary measure comes off. But we would like to see people do the right thing. It's a generous uh, measure that's been put in Thank place, you, Minister, but it's only temporary. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired, Senator Green. The minister, sorry, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Wong. Can the Minister report to the Senate on her visit to the United Nations General Assembly and on her message to other countries on the need to protect and promote the international rules-based order? Thank you, Senator Minister. Uh, can I thank Senator Green for her question and for her interest in uh, international affairs? And uh, thank you for, on indulgence. Uh, also thank my colleagues, particularly Se Senators Farrell and Gallagher, for um, covering me in my absence yesterday. Uh, President, um, Australia helped create the United Nations after World War II, and we did that because it was in our interest to have a world in which countries operate by agreed rules and norms and where outcomes are not determined by power and size alone. In fact, if you look at what is occurring in Ukraine, it is a reminder of how much all of us have to lose if we fail to protect the United Nations Charter. Australia and every other country in the world cannot accept a situation where large countries simply can determine the fate of smaller countries. We don't want to see any one country dominating or any country being dominated. So for this reason, Russia's attack on Ukraine is a, an attack on all smaller countries. And this was a message in meetings around the UN General Assembly week and uh, in the national statement uh, that I articulated on behalf of Australia. Uh, it is a position uh, which aligns us with nations around the world, particularly those smaller and small and medium-sized nations. I had the privilege of delivering a national statement uh, to the General Assembly on behalf of Australia. In that, I made the point that we are more than just supporting players in a drama of global geopolitics. We can't leave it to big powers to work it out, and we can't be passive when big powers flout the rules. That is Australia's historical legacy at the United Nations. It is a legacy uh, that the Albanese government seeks to renew. We all want a world that is stable, that is peaceful, that is prosperous, and that is respectful of sovereignty. Uh, and it is up to all of us to create that world. And in Australia's own region, we have to ensure also that competition does not escalate into conflict, and it is up to all of us uh, to consider how it is thank we you, can Minister, avert your time has such expired. catastrophic conflict. Green, first supplementary. Oh, thank you, President. Can the minister outline how she used her time in New York to advance the national interest? Thank you, Senator. Minister Wong. Thank, thank you, um, uh, Senator Green. Uh, I had the opportunity in New York to uh, attend around 60 engagements, which included bilateral and trilateral meetings, pull asides and larger meetings where I could represent Australia's views. Bilateral meetings obviously reflected our key national priorities. Uh, it was an opportunity to meet with counterparts from countries that I've not had a chance to visit, as well as to re-engage re with uh, those nations, uh, representative from nations which I have uh, had the opportunity to visit. Those direct meetings included Indonesia, India, Timor-Leste, Ukraine, Solomon Islands, Kiribati, China, Jordan, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and others, and were often focused on the threats to the rules-based order and what we could collectively do to protect it. There was also a major focus of a meeting with Quad foreign ministers. I chaired a meeting of the Friends of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, uh, which uh, convened by the Prime Minister of Japan. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. And of particular interest to my part of the world, Minister, how did the Albanese Labor government use participation at the General Assembly to promote the concerns of our Pacific family? Minister. Uh, at the United Nations, uh, we, we worked uh, to ensure that uh, we engaged deeply with Pacific partners and responded to their needs. This includes working with Pacific Island Forum members to launch the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific, which I had the pri privilege of uh, 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 hosting, well, P P P Prime Minister Bainimarama hosted at the Australian uh, mission, and we were very privileged to support that. 
Uh, in addition, I, I joined the United Nations General Assembly Ocean Panel leaders on ensuring the health and resilience of our oceans, which we know is vital to our Pacific family. Uh, Unlike those opposite, we know we are stronger in the world when we work together to defend our interests and we seek to treat our friends and partners with respect and listen to what they say. And instead of disrespecting our Pacific family's climate concerns, we are seeking to work with them to deliver real action on climate uh, and to build a stronger Pacific family. And I thank them for their engagement. Thank you, Minister. And with that, President, I'd seek, I ask that further questions be placed on thank notice. You. Uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I just have a matter relating to question time yesterday. Yep. Uh, in question time on the 26th of September, I, uh, asked, I took questions from Senator McKenzie in my capacity as the Minister representing the Treasury relating to the full fuel tax credit scheme. I have written to Senator McKenzie to provide additional information. And I table the letter for the information of Senators. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to move that general business notice of motion number 43 be called on immediately and have precedence over all other business until determined. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Ricky. Uh, thank you, President. Like many migrants and people of colour in this country, I've been told to go back to where I come from hundreds of times. Senator Pauline Hanson did it a few days ago, telling me in a tweet to piss off back to Pakistan. It was a racist slur against me and for her supporters, a deliberate and effective attempt to whip up a frenzy and mobilize a pylon. And right on cue, her tweet triggered an avalanche of and days of abusive calls, emails, tweets, and comments directed at me, saying things like, people will piss on your grave, I will cheer when you die. Your lot are good for target practice. What a dirty, vulgar creature you are. You are lower than pond life. Senator and predictably, Canavan. this is exactly what I'm talking about, President. This is the sort of behavior. Senator this Fruki. is the sort of Senator behavior, Fruki. President. Senator Fruki, please. Order. Order. This is a particularly serious matter. Senator Canavan, I've called the Senate to order. And I am asking senators on this occasion to listen respectfully. And if you wish to make a point, stand and make that point respectively. respectfully. Do not call out across the chamber. It is disrespectful and it is disorderly. I expect Senator Faruqi and any other senator who participates in this debate, whether you agree with their opinion or not, to be heard in silence. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. Predictably, dozens of versions of shut the F up and leave were also there. While I bore the brunt of it, my uh, family— Senator Faruqi, please resume your seat. Senator Watt. I don't, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt the debate, but Senator Canavan is obviously ignoring your request. This is a sensitive matter. Discussions have occurred to keep this debate respectful, and I'd ask that all senators, regardless of their opinions, follow that so that we can have a debate on a sensitive matter in a respectful manner. That uh, applies you. across the chamber. Thank you, Senator Watt. I do not expect order. I do not expect repeated points of order to be called during this debate. I expect senators to be respectful and that is to remain silent. You are free to stand and seek the call and make a point. I would ask you to respond in that way. Please continue, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, President. While I bore the brunt of it, my family and staff were also subjected to unacceptable vitriol. Someone even called my husband's workplace and told him to go back to where he came from because people are effing sick of us. Many migrants let me know how triggered they felt after reading Senator Hansen's attack tweet. It never gets easier to deal with racist attacks. It hurts every time. It does shake your sense of worth and your belonging to a place which has been home to me for 30 years. It is insulting and it is humiliating. But then that's exactly what it is intending to do. 
Racism takes an immense toll on our mental and physical health. It is an experience that is hard to explain of being despised, not just for what I look like and where I came from, but also for having the audacity to participate in public debate. It is even more painful because so often we are told to just get on with it. We are gaslighted by those who have never experienced racism into downplaying our own trauma. We are also gaslighted by those who think engaging in racist attacks constitutes fair debate, even though the line between genuine, robust debate and racism and discrimination should actually be clear to everyone. Senator Hansen crossed that line, as she has done so many other times. While others take for granted the right to voice their opinion, for migrants of color, our Australianness will always be conditional. It is conditional on us keeping our heads down and our mouths shut. It is conditional on us being grateful for being let in. It is conditional on us giving up our identity and assimilating. It is conditional on us agreeing to those in power, even if it means ignoring our own trauma. Well, to hell with that. Let me say this loudly and clearly to Senator Hansen and to each and every person who joined in the pylon, including Senator Lambie. I and everyone like me, us black and brown people, have every right to participate in public debate, just like white people. Yet you hate us for having the temerity to raise our heads above the parapet, to join the public debate on what you see as controversial topics. I'm here, in here, you try to silence people who hold racism to account instead of the perpetrators of racism. Targets of racism risk being labeled unparliamentary for pointing out blatant racism when it happens, while the racists sit back and relax, protected from the repercussions of outdated, unfit for purpose conventions and rules. Well, you will not silence us. I will not be silenced, especially on the topic of the British monarch and monarchy, the head of an empire which ruthlessly colonized, plundered, looted, and divided the land of my ancestors. Truth about the empire must be told. I will not toe the line and participate in a willful delusion about the monarchy, which exists to maintain white supremacy and to make all the beneficiaries of colonialism feel comfortable at the expense of its targets. Over centuries of rule, over most of the Indian subcontinent, where I came from, first through the violent and rapacious East India Company, and then through the crown itself, the British monarchy decimated the economy and caused the deaths of millions. They destroyed thriving local industries like textiles and shipbuilding through violence, through taxes, through import tariffs. They taxed locals at exorbitant, unprecedented rates and through torture and cruelty stole vast wealth which they shipped off to England. Reparations have never been paid by the empire for its barbarism and much of the loot is still shamelessly held including in the form of diamonds in the Queen's crowns or treasures in British museums. And of course, this nation has experienced and continues to experience British colonialism in its bloodiest form. My solidarity with the First Nations people who never ceded their sovereignty of these lands and who continue to bravely speak the truth of empire, often at much personal cost. I have the right to talk about this history without being racially vilified. Yeah. Senator Hansen's catalogue of racist filth over the past decades is widely known and truly despicable. And yet, she has really been held to account, if at all. She has never been held to account for all the harm that she has caused. She has never been suspended, fined, stripped of her privileges, or even just made to apologize. She faced no real consequences in 1996 when she said this country was in danger of being swamped by Asians. And then again in 2016, when she claimed that we were now in danger of being swamped by Muslims. 
She faced no real accountability in 2006 when she claimed Africans coming to Australia had AIDS and were of no benefit to this country. She faced no real sanction in 2017 when she called Islam a disease against which we need to vaccinate ourselves. She faced no real sanction in 2017 when she mockingly wore a burqa into this chamber. But you know what? It's never too late. We can start today. I do urge senators to hold your colleagues accountable for unacceptable behavior and the racial vilification of one of your peers. If you don't, then all your commitments to setting the standard in this place will be nothing but empty rhetoric. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept, and thus far, our parliament has accepted this hateful racism of the worst standard. It is no surprise, therefore, that the Jenkins Review found workers in parliament felt that they wouldn't be taken seriously in raising issues of racism. It's no surprise that First Nations people and people of color don't see parliament as a safe workplace for them. It is so important that we recognize that no decent workplace would tolerate the dangerous, unhinged racism that Senator Hansen has displayed against me and others. Thankfully, we have reached a crossroads in defining the kind of workplace we want to be. Whether we get there is another story. The recommendations of the Jenkins report are being implemented by the Parliamentary Leadership Task Force and the Joint Select Committee on Parliamentary Standards is developing new codes of conduct for Parliament, parliamentarians and parliamentary staff. It is vital that we use these opportunities, which may not come again, to make Parliament more safe, respectful and diverse. Our codes of conduct must firmly prohibit racism in our workplaces. Anti-racism training must be mandatory for everyone who works here. Racism must be identified and called out every time, every single time that it happens in here or out there by anyone who works in this place. And people who spew such hate must face serious consequences. Now, I do understand that Labour has an amendment to my motion. And my motion probably is unlikely to get through. And I do have to call this out. I mean, the vague statement about respectful debate, which is all well and good, doesn't actually call a spade a spade. We heard two days in the parliamentary committee that is developing the codes, evidence from people who mentioned to us the best practice code of conducts, which call out which call out behavior like this and hold parliamentarians accountable. But we can't do that without agreeing to this motion that is in front of you. Labor's amendment really lets Senator, Han Senator Hansen off scot-free and gives her a free pass to do this again and again as she has done in the past. This is not the standard we want to set in here or out there, we have to name and shame racism and the perpetrators of racism. Censuring Senator Hansen today is really the absolute bare minimum. It is a symbolic but important step that everyone in this place can take to make clear that we condemn racism in all its forms, shapes and sizes. It is, necess it is a necessary step that we must take to show the many people of color in this country that Parliament is a workplace that will not tolerate racism and that is simply not okay for anyone, but particularly people you work with to racially vilify you. So I'll say, to, say it again, racism must be identified and called out every single time and people who spew such hate must face serious consequences. And this must start today. It can start today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, not next year. Today. This place needs to get set the highest standard today for all others to follow. Thank you, Senator Baruki. Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, well, first, 
uh, I would like to move the amendment circulated in the chamber by myself and Senator Birmingham, and I acknowledge his willingness to co-sponsor, which, is, uh, as people who might recall, is my uh, preferred response on issues of race in this place and was the way in which we sought to deal with the comments that Senator Anning, former Senator Anning made. And I would make the point uh, it's been circulated, there are a few changes, but I would make the point that it also calls on the of senators to refrain from inflammatory and divisive comments both inside and outside the chamber. Um, I'll, I'll make some comments in relation to the amendment of the primary motion generally. Uh, we are seeking to amend for two main reasons. First, uh, we don't agree that the offending sentence should be repeated in this place. We don't think it should be repeated at all, much less in the Senate. Uh, second, we don't think that a censure can be our default response in such a situation, particularly in reference to you know, uh, social media uh, and other comments. But I do want to stay, say to start with that I condemn Senator Hanson's comments without reservation. I think they're appalling. Um, and they're comments that have been levelled at me countless times since I arrived in this country. I remember getting them when I was a kid in the schoolyard. Uh, and I've got them since. So they're not just the pathetic hecklings of a schoolyard bully. They are, as Senator Faruqi rightly said, something you say to delegitimise someone's right to speak. Um, and I, I you know, don't know what drives it. Perhaps it's the fear of anything different, different races, different ethnicities, different opinions. But can I say to Senator Faruqi, you know, we on this side do understand your grievance of this comment and we understand why you are calling out such behaviour. And I pick up something that Senator Faruqi said in her contribution about how triggering this is. It's true, it is. It is triggering each time you hear it. I'm the Senate leader. <laughs> I still get triggered. Uh, and I wonder how it is for kids in the schoolyard who get the same thing. And I join the assurance that is in the motion that all migrants to Australia are valued and welcome members of society. I was reflecting when I saw the <clears throat> sort of media, media sort of focus on this about my first speech because I actually talked about this experience and I said, you know, I, I, that I'd, I asked the question in the speech, how long do you have to be here and how much do you have to love this country before you're accepted? How long? Well, I think the good news is I do actually believe the overwhelming majority of Australians are accepting. I think the overwhelming majority of Australians are accepting and respectful. And I would say also, regardless of our differences of views, I think the overwhelming majority of this chamber are accepting of peoples of different ethnic backgrounds. Um, in relation to the workplace issue, the parliament has been through a long and comprehensive review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces led by Kate Jenkins, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner. And she rightly described us as having an opportunity to transform this place into what it should be. Workplaces where expected as a standards of behaviour are modelled, championed and enforced, where, and in which any Australian, no matter their gender, race, sexual orientation, disability, status or age, feel safe and welcome to contribute. And she went on to say this aim is an important one because it is only by reflecting the whole of Australian society and living up to community expectations that Parliament can perform its function in a representative democracy. President, I think each of us in this place needs to take responsibility for, the word, for our words and the impact of our words. And sometimes we say the wrong thing. Sometimes we do say the wrong thing. Um, but we do have an individual and collective responsibility to act in a way that Australians would expect of us and that we would expect of our fellow Australians. Um, and it is why when confronted with such behaviour as we uh, describing or words as we're describing, I think it's far preferable that the response is bipartisan. It's the approach, as I said, I talk uh, and with Senator Cormann when Senator Anning made his most, most egregious remarks several years ago. If I may repeat what I said on that occasion, um, 
I thought we there in, in that debate and in that motion made clear that we abhor racism and religious intolerance, that we acknowledge and celebrate diversity and the harmony of the Australian people. We stated our respect for people from all faiths, cultures, ethnicities and nationalities, a respect that has made our country one of the world's most successful migrant nations and multicultural societies. And we reaffirmed our commitment as Australians to peace over violence, innocent over evil, understanding over extremism, liberty over fear and love over hate. President, for our democracy to function well, we must treat each other as equals. It is true that freedom of speech is a feature of democracy. Uh, but speech which is directed at people's um, heritage uh, or, or race or religion, it is an attack on democracy because fundamentally what it is saying is you are not equal and we must treat each other as equals no matter the differences in our views. And such an approach, uh, when we fail to do that, is not only diminishing of the other, it is actually diminishing of us all. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, um, this has just been hypocrisy. Pure, spectacular hypocrisy is the most fitting description for this ridiculous motion. Yeah. It is the most fitting description for the conduct of the Australian Greens. They embody hypocrisy. They single it as a virtue. They claim they want Parliament to be a safe and respectful workplace. What they really mean is that no one must be allowed to disagree with or criticise them in any way while they are free to say anything they please. This is because they see themselves as the epitome of virtue who can say or do nothing wrong. Their sense of entitlement and privilege is stunning. I wonder if they read the Sydney Morning Herald this morning. There's a very interesting story in that newspaper detailing the conduct of one Green senator in this very building that is anything but respectful. It reports the co-chair of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, Auntie Geraldine Atkinson, aged in her 70s, was left shaking and ill to the point of requiring medical attention after being verbally abused by the Green Senator, Lydia Thorpe, in a meeting in this building last year. It reports Senator Thorpe's former Chief of Staff was actually scared and appalled at his senator's conduct, which he described as by far one of the most unprofessional displays I have ever seen that made him want the earth to swallow him whole. Miss Atkinson herself described Senator Thorpe's conduct as vicious and personal and abusive, saying she accused Miss Atkinson of being involved in corrupt Aboriginal organisations. And listening to the stunning entitlement and privilege in this, when Ms Atkinson attempted to respond to this abuse, Senator Thorpe spoke over her in a highly aggressive tone, repeatedly saying, I am an Australian senator. You are in my meeting. This came from the same Green who, in estimates, committee hearing, told a minister she was offended by being referred to as an Australian. The despicable behaviour on the streets of Melbourne just recently, with showing even blood on her hands and the crown's foot on your throat. You may have accused me of a lot of things in this place, what you, what you referred to, but I have never acted in the behaviour that one of your Green Senator has behaved. And you talk about my behaviour and what I've said. You may call me a racist, Senator Hanson, but you to make up may I remind you to address to the chair with your remarks, please? Thank you, Madam President. The whole thing is that to be called racist is very easily thrown about and bandied around in our country these days. People must understand what the word racist means. It means that you believe your race to be superior to another. I have never, ever, ever stated myself to be superior to another, yeah. ever. Criticism is not racism. Yeah. 
Yeah. To question anything is not racism. Yeah. Uh, Senator Hanson, this please resume your seat. I did ask. Resume your seat. I did request that senators be heard in silence, and I would reiterate that request once again. Thank you. Please continue, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. This is coming from the same Green senator, and I spoke about Senator Thorpe. She's not missing. Order. She's not here. Senator Thorpe's not here today. I wonder why. Maybe the, newspa maybe the newspaper Senator article. Hansen, so Senator anyway, Hanson. I question Senator why she's Hansen, not here. Please resume your seat. Senator McKim, I'm not entertaining a point of order. I've asked all senators to listen in respectful silence. I'm not, I'm not entertaining a point of order. I said that before. I've asked you, and I'm directing you, to listen in respectful silence. You may not agree with what's being said, but you were heard in silence, and I expect silence from the chamber. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. I'm not Senator Wish Wilson. Please resume your seat. I'm going, Senator Wish Wilson. I am directing you to resume your seat. This is a very difficult matter, and it is not assisted by cheering, by clapping, by comments across the chamber from any senator. I'm going to ask Senator Hanson to continue, and I, respect, and I expect Senator Hanson to be heard in silence. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. As I said, Senator Thorpe said she was offended by being referred to as an Australian. This is coming from the same Green who happily collects a $211,000 a year salary for sitting in a parliament she has called illegitimate. Senator Hanson, I remind you it is not appropriate to reflect on other senators. I would ask you to withdraw that. Senator Hanson, I'm asking you, in the spirit of this debate, to withdraw that comment. Um, the fact is, she said she's, I'm she not doesn't asking to you. I, I, just don't, I just don't know. I made a, I made a couple Senator of sentences Hanson, there. So which one would you Senator like to Hanson, refer? Senator Hanson, I am asking you not to reflect on a senator in any way, and I'm simply asking you to withdraw. I shall withdraw. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Please continue. Thank you. Isn't it funny? The Greens hate the Crown, but they love accepting the currency the Queen's image is printed on. And then, of course, there is her fellow Green Senator, um, Brookie. This Green implies a tweet I posted in response to her disrespecting the late Queen Elizabeth II was racist and disrespectful and called for Parliament to be made a safe and respectful, respectful workplace. Let me, let me read out what her comments were. Consolences to those who knew the Queen. I cannot mourn the leader of a racist empire built on stolen lives, land and wealth of colonised peoples. We are reminded of the urgency of treaty with First Nations people, justice and reparations for British colonies and becoming a republic. But only a matter of a couple of months earlier, to stand in this place and swear allegiance to the Queen and the heirs. And yet this turns around and says, from a racist and a coloniser, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. So we, here we have the same, and this is the same, Greens senator who posted a tweet telling the former Prime Minister of Australia to just F off. Now, <laughs> this is directed at all Greens. You disgust the majority of the Australian people. The Greens are hated, loathed and despised by most Australians, not only for their outrageous, destructive policies, but also because the Greens always insult Australians as racists and destroyers of the environment. They wear this hypocrisy as a badge of honour to display their, to their sycophants and young Australians being misled during their reformative year, school years by left-leaning ideologists. I'm so grateful to the Greens for this idiotic stunt. It's time we had a real discussion about what constitutes racism. I didn't refer to Senator Faruqi's race or imply she had inferior characteristics due to her race or country of origin. I only suggested that because she is so obviously unhappy in her adopted country with her privileged position, she should go back to Pakistan. I remind the Senate that Senator Thorpe yelled at me in this very chamber to go back where I came from. 
As far as the Greens, I would hear her reply to, to comment to a couple of um, members in this chamber, male members, oh, you're just white privileged. As far as the Greens are concerned, it's okay for them to say this, but it's not acceptable for me to say it. To them, only white people, including their own parliamentary leaders, can be racist and must not be allowed to say this. This is blatant, reversed racism, and I'm calling it out. I'm not remotely intimidated by Green's threats and their stunning hypocrisy. With their threats, you're not just trying to silence me, you're also trying to silence the many thousands of Australians who feel frightened or intimidated by the likes of your lot to have an opinion, let alone open their mouth. Your intimidation, calling someone a racist to shut them up, is not only pathetic to say the least, it is a misuse of the true meaning of the word. Criticism is not racism. I am fed up, and so are millions of other Australians, with people who use their skin colour to play the victim. From the day I was first elected, I have always fought for equality for all Australians, regardless of race. At the last election, who stood second on the ticket to me in Queensland? A gentleman from India. My candidates have come from all different walks of background, all different races. But you're not Order. interested in that. If I was a racist, I wouldn't have people from different cultural backgrounds. Uh, I do apologise for, for Senator talk Hansen. Senator Hanson Young, I said I wasn't entertaining points of order. This is a very difficult debate. I am listening very carefully and I will ask senators to withdraw when I think they are out of order. Uh, Senator Hanson has not been doing that. She has been at uh, order. This is not a debating point. Senator Hanson, that is not appropriate. I've asked no. I don't, it's don't debate me. I've asked all senators to treat each other with respect, to have a respectful debate, one that's in silence. Please continue. I remind the Greens that in exchange for the tremendous privilege of serving the Australian people in this chamber, they swore allegiance to the Queen and her successors. I remind them that it doesn't matter whether you think Australia should be a republic or that Australia only belongs to Indigenous people. Australia is a constitutional monarchy and belongs to every Australian, Indigenous or not. I reflect on um, Senator Wong's words about the, the racism that she feels she's been um, happened to her over the period of time and, and comments. I remember growing up in this country, um, the Italians used to say, oh, they call us a wog. I used to go to fish markets and the guys down there say, yep, yeah, but you know what? We wore it as a badge of honour to be called a wog. That was the Australian way. But you know what? Those people got out and worked. They felt part of the country. If you ask a lot of these people now, and I see the comments on, on the, my Facebook page from people with regards to this matter, actually, People said, we're proud. We came to this, this country to be Australians. They love this nation, they've worked hard, and they see themselves as Australians. And that's all I've ever spoken about in a lot of my speeches that I've ever said. When I mentioned them in my maiden speech about swamped by Asians, it was a comment about questioning the immigration that we had coming to Australia. I'll put this on the record again. I've spoken about it many times is that we had high numbers coming from Asia. And I wanted to address this to say that we've got to look at this, otherwise we would have an imbalance in our population time to come. And it's the same thing as what Japan, they're very um, parochial on how, who they allow into the country. Why shouldn't I have the right to say who should come to the country? Even we've had four We've had former leaders of this nation say, we have the right to say who comes to our country. But when Senator Hanson says it in such a way, my God, it's racist. We have to have this debate on who comes to the country and why they should come here. I've never you know, stated that Senator Faruqi shouldn't um, be here, but I was appalled and so were many other thousands, if not 
millions of people appalled by her comments in regards to the Queen less than a day after her death. I won't stand by and let that be said. And I had my tweet, and it's about time that, yes, Senator Faruqi made comments that people like myself should be pulled up. Well, even when people like her make her comments, I will still have my say and I will pull them up as well. This is a place, the heart of our democracy in this nation, and we are here to, to represent the Australian people. And it's when we acknowledge and accept that we all have an opinion and a right to say things, that's when we come to the right decisions for the people of this nation. They are looking at us as the leaders of this nation. My comments were not made in the chamber. They were said on a tweet in retaliation to her comments. Everyone has a right to have a say, but as I see the way this country is going with a lot of other Australians, I see too much reverse racism. I see activists that are using their race and their colour to, to uh, divide us as a nation, and I'll fight against that and I'll speak out against that every step of the way as I possibly can. So it, it is very important to me, and I'm privileged to be here. But I've, uh, I refuse to acknowledge the fact that I have been made these racist comments um, constantly, and I say to people, you, you really, and uh, as I said to you, understand what the word racist means. You're raced to be superior to another. You tell me anything since 1996 or before that I have said that is actually racist. Right? Not criticism, of, not criticism of, of policy, not criticism of immigration, nothing at all. Understand the meaning, what the word racist, because you are putting out a message to many Australians there. If they disagree with you, then call them a racist. Our skin colour may be different, but we are all human beings in this place and we have a right to a decent way of life and decent standard of living. We have all worked hard and should enjoy this wonderful country that we have without the hatred that goes on. It's about working together who we are as a nation. So until that changes what we have in this country, and if your threats are trying to silence me, it's not going to damn well happen. So until that changes, you're here to do a job. Do your job and represent all Australians with the dignity and respect they deserve. In closing, as I have explained myself, I will not, not retract what I've told Senator Fruki or any other Australian that's come here for a new way of life to disrespect what is Australian to me and she can do and go where I've, what I've said. I make the offer also to take her to the airport. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Uh, ex Senator Steelejohn, you may have missed what I said before. If you are in the chamber, you will listen in silence. You will not make points across the chamber. I'm going to call Senator Birmingham now and I remind all senators once again, you are to listen in respectful silence. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. Thank you, President. And I thank the government at the outset for their cooperation in the joint proposal of the amendments to this motion. At a time in which and we see right around the globe uh, enormous fracturing uh, of politics, uh, of the way in which politics is conducted, uh, and indeed uh, of media uh, and media sources uh, that provide for often ever more extreme, uh, ever more conspiratorial uh, or uh, ever more uh, offensive uh, to other individuals' remarks being perpetuated, it is important on occasions like this that the parties uh, of government in a country like Australia speak with one voice when it comes to central and important values for our nation. And I make clear, as the motion uh, as amended or proposed to be amended by Senator Wong and myself makes clear, 
that racism and discrimination have no place in any place, anywhere, at any time against anyone in our nation or elsewhere. There is certainly no place in this parliament for racism or discrimination. My personal experiences will self-evidently be vastly different to that of senators of other backgrounds who have confronted racism or discrimination leading to hurt, to injustice, to stereotyping or to prejudice. I say to all Australians, be they others in this place or elsewhere, be they Indigenous Australians or migrants to our nation throughout the generations, that you are all valued, that you are all important, that you are all and should all enjoy the rights and responsibilities accorded to all Australians, rights and responsibilities in equal measure to all regardless of their background. We all in this great country do have enormous rights accorded to us, enormous opportunities that are not available everywhere else around the world. But we carry some responsibilities too, and particularly the responsibilities to show respect, respect to those rights, respect to the opportunities accorded to us, respect to the systems that have provided for those opportunities, and there ought be with that clear respect for one another. In this place, in this parliament, we enjoy certain privileged rights, enhanced rights, but also very clearly enhanced responsibilities for our conduct. And this parliament should, as per Sex Discrimination Commissioner's report, uh, Sex Discrimination Commissioner Kate Jenkins's report last year, and its title should set the standard. Now that report focused uh, on a range of different conduct issues, but frankly it should apply in all manner in relation to the way our nation engages. This place should set the standard in all of our conduct and on any of the issues and approaches that we undertake. Members and senators are of course free to seek change, but they should in seeking change, respect the rights, the institutions, the practices that give them in this country the opportunity to seek those changes. Members and senators will disagree, but they should show respect for one another. President, my advice to senators of all stripes, stay out of the gutter, rise above the Twitterverse. Play the ball, not the person. Even in the conduct of this debate, the interjections, the swipes, the insinuations, they have hindered, not helped, in the conduct of being able to make a clear statement in relation to the condemnation of racism, in relation to the assurance of all Australians, especially migrants, that they are valued and welcome, in relation to the importance of this parliament being a safe place to work and in relation to making sure that it is clear for all senators to engage in debates respectfully. Please look to the bigger picture, be the bigger people that Australians of all views and values overwhelmingly want us to be. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the question be put. Thank you. So uh, I remind senators there was an amendment um, in the names of Senators Wong and Birmingham, um, so which uh, I believe was circulated. So that is what we'll vote on first. So we'll go to the question of that amendment. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, oh, beg your pardon. Um, yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question is that the debate uh, the, qu the question is the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher to uh, put the question be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Against? 
I believe the ayes have it. I will now go to the amendment as circulated in the names of Senator Wong and Birmingham. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now go to the amended motion uh, standing in the names of um, Senator Faruqi and Waters. Um, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Thank you, Senators. Uh, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I'd like to take a point of order, if I might. On what matter, Senator? Uh, on, so, do I have the call to take a point of order? Well, if it's on the matter we've just concluded, uh, no. Well, President, can I just suggest that 197.2 appears of the standing orders does allow me to make a point of order. And it and it's also up to me whether I entertain a point of order. Well, you haven't heard it yet, President. Uh, That's I'm not point. entertaining points of order about the debate we've just had, at Senator McKim. That does not add any value at all. I'll be, I'll be writing to you on this Thank matter, you. President. Thank you. I'm happy to uh, seek the advice of the clerk. Um, I think we're at taking note. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to uh, call the. Senator Cameron, uh, A question from Senator Cash to Senator Gallagher. Uh, the Deputy President, um, we saw today uh, and a remarkable uh, example of a broken promise uh, from we know we know a broken promise uh, from uh, the newly elected government. They've already broken a promise, and and then flagging or at least not ruling out more broken promises on potentially on potential tax increases in the future. We already know, as I said, we already know that the promise that the Labor Party made to the Australian people of reducing their electricity bills by $275 a year that's been broken. That has been broken. The, the, the now Prime Minister uh, mentioned to the Australian people, told the Australian people on multiple occasions that he would, if he was Prime Minister, he would lower your electricity bill by $275 a year. There was no, no conditions, there was no fine print, uh, there was no little asterisk next to it. He promised people that their electricity bills would come down by $275. He said he'd done the modelling, it's all going to happen. Then, within weeks of winning that election, of winning the trust of the Australian people, uh, he turned around and walked away from that promise, and we've never heard the words 275 out of the Prime Minister's mouth again. Uh, now we get vague commitments to put downward pressure on electricity prices, but there's no commitment to do what the Labor Party actually said just a few months ago. So today, once again, there was an example of that. Senator Cash asked uh, Senator Gallagher, will you commit, will you deliver on, the, on your promise, not our promise, on your promise of $275? Nope, 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 no commitment at all. They've already broken a core promise. It is an absolute world record for a new, newly elected government to break a promise that they made just months ago. And that's going to be confirmed in the budget in a few weeks' time. But not only that, not only that, we can see now there's, a, there's going to be a laundry list of broken promises from this government. You can just see it. And, and there is now another one on the list uh, that's been confirmed at question time today. When asked whether, whether the, the minister could rule out any new, new, new or changes sorry, to franking credits, they, couldn't, they wouldn't rule it out. Yep. Now, we all remember, we all remember uh, it wasn't just during the election, it was years before the election, the Labor Party said no, they wouldn't touch pensioners' franking credits. They'd learnt from their mistakes, remember, from the 2019 election. They were going to make sure. Uh, that pensions this country could receive the full return on their investments that come through dividends, in particular frank dividends, which mean you don't pay taxes twice. So the company that you've invested in, when it pays taxes, it makes sure you get a credit effectively for those taxes, and so you don't get doubly taxed. But the Labor Party now, now with, with failing to rule this out today, are putting on the table another prospective broken promise to double tax Australian pensioners to put two taxes on Australian pensioners. They'll tax the companies that they invest in, and we all that, that happens, that, that's appropriate, uh, and, then, and then they'll tax their income that pensioners have uh, just to try uh, to survive. It's very hard at the moment. It is very hard uh, with living costs going up for almost everything. Food prices are going up. Uh, electricity prices are obviously on the way up. 
Uh, and it's hard for those on fixed incomes, for those uh, that, that rely on, a, on investments, that have very little ability to supplement their income with other work or other means, very hard for them. And the Labor Party here are failing to rule out a potential tax on them. On them. And this is very concerning, not just because of the broken promise, because if anyone is following what's going on around the world, it is very, very concerning what's happening in global markets. The British pound has crashed uh, uh, over the weekend and remains under pressure. Government yields are up on all, for all countries, but especially those uh, in Europe. And, and as the Treasurer has said, he has said rightly that we will not be immune uh, from uh, these changes. But what we don't definitely do not need in this country is more taxes or even the prospect of more taxes, because that will kill confidence. That will, uh, that will pres presage or uh, uh, bring forward uh, any potential economic downturn because investors and others will be concerned about whether the Labor Party is going to break another promise and increase their taxes uh, and therefore spend less today, invest potentially less, and we, and we may get uh, the, virus that, the economic virus that is circulating right now, primarily in Europe, also a little bit in America. It may come here to this country. So we will see in a few weeks' time what the Labor Party does do when, when we're back here uh, in late October for their budget. But it doesn't look good. The, the, the entrails are not, are not looking good here for their budget. They've got form now of breaking one promise. They're possibly about to make, break more, and we will be watching and making sure the Australian people understand that the Labor Party, I don't think, has, has, uh, has, has left its addiction to new taxes uh, with the previous Rudd Gillard government. They are on form, they're going back to form, and they're breaking promises and increasing your taxes. Senator Pratt. Those opposite broke the budget. What Minister Gallagher outlined to the Senate in question time today is a plan to fix it. A plan to fix the budget and deliver on our promises. The promises we made before the last election, not the election before that or the election before that. We've made it clear that we have an agenda on multinational tax reform. We've outlined a plan for a better budget. A plan to ensure that revenue would return to our national coffers so we can keep the country running, but also to be clear about savings we need to make in order to fix the budget. To fix the budget that those opposite broke. This is the plan that saw Labor get elected. When those opposite were last in government just recently. They were the highest taxing, highest spending in history. So it's all very well for those opposite to ask questions about ruling out tax increases or new taxes on Australians in the coming budget when we take seriously the responsibility of balancing our budget, of balancing our nation's need for services, for good quality public services, not the waste and the rorts that those opposite put forward, but also the need to make sure that multinationals pay their fair share of tax, that the big end of town that you let off the hook so often is there when Australians spend their good hard-earned dollars with big companies. We don't want to see jobs and profits all going offshore. We want to see companies that have derived great benefit here on our shores paying their fair share of tax. So let's talk about lower taxes. Why won't those opposite come on and support lower taxes on electric vehicles. That would be a great idea. We have now, as a Labor government, an opportunity to implement what we took to the election. How about those opposite critique the policies that we took to the election, not have the arguments that you would like to have because they suit you? The simple truth is that those opposite can't put a finger on it. They can't get even close because they know 
what a bad job they did. They know the mess that they left this nation in. So what are we left with? Made up, catastrophising. They're not here to critique Labor's plan for this nation. They're here to run their own scare campaign. But seriously, this October we will have a budget ready to implement our election commitments. Also, a budget that has to deal with the waste and rip-offs. Waste and rip-offs that you buried in the budget. That you buried in the budget that was highlighted, frankly, in other parts of answers to questions this afternoon, uh, when those opposite tried to ask questions about Medicare and the, and, and the need uh, and how expensive Medicare is, only to know here from Senator Gallagher that, in fact, there's no sustainability in the health budget that those opposite left us, when serious things like dent, adult dental care were just expiring pieces of expenditure, such fundamental pieces of health care. So I take pride in what our Labor government is doing. There's no depth to the questions asked by those opposite today. We saw 22 failed energy policies, a 20 per cent increase in electricity prices. and policies that you buried before the election that saw absolutely no outcome for Australians in their energy prices. Energy increases that Australians you, have Pratt. suffered through because you, you were Senator missing Pratt. in action on thank policy. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. It's a uh, real pleasure to be able to make some comments on this matter of uh, coming out of question time, and of course, question time is, I think, generally, in my view, the greatest, or one of the greatest wastes of public funds, uh, because it is a, it's a theatre. It is a pretty contrived process, and all these additional questions and whatnot are, um, it's pretty low rent stuff, isn't it? But uh, it is important that we, in this chamber, do our best to hold the government to account. And it is a pretty weak government. It is a pretty weak government. It has very few policies, and it's already wanting to crab walk away from its promises on the economy. Now, um, there's a pretty important philosophical difference of views between the major parties, and that is, on this side, that we do believe that the government has no money of its own. The money that it is able to spend, it levies from the people, and from the organisations like corporations, which are required to pay tax under the tax laws. Now, the lower the taxes, the greater the chance is that you have private investment. Now, private investment is what is required to create, create opportunities to create employment in this country. And what we're now seeing is a spectre of higher taxes being flagged, being dripped out through the financial press in the lead up to this budget. And we've already seen the Treasurer uh, giving very lukewarm support to stage three tax cuts, which is very interesting, very illuminating, you'd have to say. Um, and, but perhaps not surprising, because I'm, I'm sure that the government actually doesn't believe in the stage three tax cuts, because uh, they've never really been committed to aspiration. Uh, and the point of the stage three tax cuts is really to do two things. Firstly, it is to reward middle income earners to ensure that middle income earners are not pushed into high tax brackets. Now, it might suit the government of the day's budgetary and fiscal strategy to have a higher tax collection because of bracket creep, but the idea of cutting taxes for middle income earners by removing these tax brackets and thereby delivering the removal effectively of bracket creep is that people can keep more money that they've actually earned. So if you do another shift or you do some more hours or you do something else in relation to paid employment, you keep the money, not Canberra. Now, I would have thought that's a pretty reasonable proposition. And for middle income earners, 
60, 70, 80 grand a year, um, that is what they would be facing. They'd be facing higher taxes in the form of uh, new tax thresholds, which we've abolished. We've abolished uh, tax thresholds because of the stage three tax cuts. And the other point is, and I know it's not fashionable, is that we actually do want to be a competitive economy. We actually do want to attract high wage income earners into this country uh, because we have massive skill shortages. And you want to have a song and dance and have a skill summit here and talk about uh, how you want to improve our economic capacity, every single person who runs a company in this country will tell you that some of the skills in the short term can't be delivered from the domestic stock. So we need to bring people in and we have a very uncompetitive tax system. We have a very, very low level of income where the highest possible tax threshold kicks in. Uh, it is very uncompetitive when compared to Singapore and Japan and countries that we are competing with right now in our time zone or close to our time zone. So um, if you want to reward middle income earners and you want to be a competitive dynamic economy, uh, then you need to retain the stage three tax cuts. Of course, the other aspect we're now looking at is the return of the dreaded franking credits tax, where, as Senator Canavan has said out quite eloquently, uh, people would be facing double taxation. They've already paid taxation, uh, the companies have paid taxation, and now they'd be looking at the return of a new tax uh, in retirement, which had not been taken to any election. So it, it is very important that, although I'm not a huge fan of question time, that we do use question time to ensure that uh, we don't, we don't uh, force new taxes on the Australian people. Uh, we don't want to see new income taxes or higher income taxes, and we certainly don't want to see new retirement taxes or savings taxes. Senator White. Senator Gallagher gave a very comprehensive set of answers to the questions she was asked about tax. She also detailed an amazingly important set of priorities and the way in which the, this government is going to go about looking at the one trillion dollars of debt that we have, have that has been inherited and the deficits that are, that are around of uh, 200 billion across the forward es estimates per year she detailed extensively in those answers the sort of tests that are, that uh, the government is going through looking at the various measures seeing if they stack up see if they meet the quality tests are being needed can they be delivered it was comprehensive uh, and studied and measured. And she talked about priorities and how we are going to have to return money to the budget because of that $1 trillion in debt and that cost of servicing that debt. The, the analysis that she gave uh, in question time uh, gave her also an opportunity to talk about the Albanese uh, government's plan to fix the budget and deliver on our promises. Promises that won us the uh, government. We won the election. Uh, and what she detailed and what we detail is that we've been very clear about our position on tax, and that has not changed. Our priority when it comes to tax reform is ensuring multinationals pay their fair share of tax here in Australia. What is wrong with that? Nothing is wrong with that. It is a clear policy. It was outlined during the election. We won the election. And what Senator Gallagher said is, is we are going to do that. The last government uh, uh, was one of the second highest taxing governments in the last 30 years behind the Howard government. It's pretty rich sitting here listening to uh, questions about tax cuts when we are uh, uh, listening from people who were in the second uh, highest taxing government in the last 30 years. What Senator Gallagher did speak about and what uh, we're very proud of on this side of the chamber is the government's electric car discount, which will help make electric cars cheaper and more affordable to families by reducing tariffs and fringe benefit tax liabilities. 
But the coalition is opposing this tax cut for families and small businesses. So we get questions about tax cuts, and here we have a policy that we have been to the election with, which is quite clear, which has been spelt out time and time again, and yet the coalition, who says that they are for tax cuts and uh, they don't want new taxes, will not support this tax cut for families and small businesses in relation to the electric car discount. Let's look at that. That, that electric car discount has two components. It will remove 5 per cent tariffs for eligible cars, with a customs value falling below the luxury car tax threshold for fuel-efficient vehicles. So that's, uh, in, in 2023, that's $84,916 the cost of cars and it will also exempt from fringe benefits tax for uh, it will also provide an exemption from fringe benefits tax for eligible cars below the luxury car tax threshold for fuel efficient vehicles two things in one it's good for the environment and it's great for families and for small businesses. Uh, that is what we're going to deliver. What we're also going to deliver is, in a responsible way, look line by line through the budget uh, and see what uh, fits the bill, what can be afforded. And, and as uh, the senator outlined, look, finding all the things that have been hidden by this the former government, which are, which are there sneakily and which were unfunded. This is what a responsible government does, and that is what was outlined in the answer to this question. And, uh, and rightly, it, it takes time, and time is being taken. Uh, and it, certainly looking at the questions that, that were asked, the uh, senator made absolutely fantastic points, was clear and absolutely stood by the policies that, were, that won this government uh, the election. Senator Napa Chimper Price. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I find it, um, I find it uh, a little bit, uh, well, it would be amusing if it, um, if it wasn't so serious. Um, listening to this Labor government uh, with its supposed comprehensive answers. I don't think we have um, heard anything comprehensive in terms of um, answers or the lack of answers that are being provided to us here at uh, question time. Um, but what I do hear is uh, there's an ongoing theme going on here. You know, if you say the same thing over and over again, if you repeat uh, mistruths, um, I think Labor is just hoping that they will, uh, people, the, the general public will accept them um, as truth. Uh, and, and I would certainly hope that uh, this Labor government uh, would, be, would be absolutely mis you know, in the most unfortunate situation if they were to end up being confronted with another global uh, pandemic, because as we, as they keep uh, telling us, uh, it was the former coalition government that um, has left them in such a, has left this budget in a dire situation, uh, despite the fact that they've got uh, 50 billion uh, in their back pocket. And I would remind them uh, of, of, of what it was that the former coalition government achieved in those dire times in providing $314 billion in economic support during the pandemic, uh, helping Australians get to the other side of the greatest economic shock since the Great Depression. And this included the JobKeeper pro program, the single biggest economic support program in Australia's history. The Reserve Bank of Australia saying that the JobKeeper saved at least 700,000 jobs. And Treasury said it prevented the unemployment rate from reaching 15 per cent. But what we hear is, from across here, we hear that there are plans and plans and plans and lots more plans. But 
They cannot detail those plans. They cannot provide answers when we question uh, those plans uh, going forward. And you know, it's very simple. It was very simple. The questions that were uh, put to Minister Gallagher, and they, the answers were not comprehensive. We heard a bit of fluff about multinational tax reform, and as we've heard just now, um, this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful lowering of tax on electric vehicles. Wow, that is really going to help the everyday mum and dad out in the regions. That's really going to help the everyday mum and dads, the middle income earners, the lower income earners. It's going to help them incredibly, uh, much better than um, the promised $275 um, decrease to uh, everyday Australians' bills, uh, the promise that has not been kept at all uh, by this government. And I would remind them, you know, perhaps use a bit of common sense. Use a bit of common sense. Take a leaf out of our book and underst in understanding that it is the private sector that drives opportunity and prosperity, uh, not government, uh, and that resilient small businesses are the backbone and the strength of our economy, not bureaucrats, and that families know what is best for them. And I can tell you now that there are probably only a handful of families in this nation who would even be able to benefit from this wonderful uh, lowering tax of electric vehicles. Certainly nobody, uh, the families that I'm concerned with in the Northern Territory. Um, perhaps uh, your mates in, in, in big business uh, who can um, who will certainly be able to benefit from um, the lowering of those, of those taxes. But please, put everyday Australians uh, first in this next budget. I hope that's what this, uh, this government is going to do, Thank but you. I won't hold my breath. Thank you, Senator. I'll put the question to the motion as moved by Senator Canavan. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. I rose to take note of the answers given by Minister, um, Minister Wong. Um, Please proceed. proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, sorry, Deputy President. Um, the blame game uh, cannot continue, and what we've heard today in question time is that the current government keep referring to the blame game of what the previous government did over the last decade. And what is absolutely crystal clear in that is that the human rights of all Australians matter, but most importantly, First Nations Australians. And unfortunately, that's not up for debate. Greens firmly believe that this has been bandied around for too long, um, particularly when we talk about the rights of First Nations people, disabled people, trans people. It's used as a bit of a political football in this place, and it's absolutely unacceptable. And what I would like to say in response to the question, the answer that I received in question time was, we cannot keep going to the UN, to the Pacific, to other places, talking about accountability and what we're going to do when we get into government and then not do it, because we're leaving the grassroots people behind in that conversation. We need action. We don't need any more empty words. And unfortunately, you can't stand up in this place and the other place and say that these matters are serious when you're doing nothing about them. So when are we going to have that immediate action on the impact that we can already see that's happening in communities? We are seeing the impacts of climate change right now, the echoing of the conversations and the voice, the voices of the people from the Torres Strait Islands who are saying to us that they have water lapping at their doorstep, and we are still not hearing their voices. Now, do we believe that it's serious enough that it's an emergency um, when we have examples of this particular case from the Torres Strait Islands, the landmark case, where one of the 
residents of the Torres Strait Islands had to go and continue to look for bones from an ancestor, a grave that's possibly washed away. I mean, that's not happening anywhere else in Australia. And no one cares. No one's going, oh my God, this is an immediate issue. We need to get onto this. But once again, we're seeing governments, and now we're seeing Labor governments saying they're committed to giving First Nations people a voice, but they're actually not then getting into action. What I heard from Minister Wong is she knew about this issue when she was a climate minister in 2008, 2009. Why is it that now, many, many years later, we're going to put in place a First Nations ambassador for foreign affairs to give us the answer after First Nations people, Torres Strait Islander people, have been already giving you the answer and telling you what needs to be done, urging you, when you are in power in government, to take the action that is required. And that's what I'm asking for. You don't need a referendum to start respecting First Nations people's rights, culture and sovereignty in this country. But what we now see is a continuation of statements. So the, the massive statement, the voices from the deep that Torres Strait Islander people gave to the Prime Minister, to the Climate Minister, to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, handed it to them, was about self-determination and regional autonomy by 2037. And we are still not listening, but we as First Nations people in this country are standing up and we are sick of being silenced. Our voice is being silenced and we're sick of this government not respecting our rights. And we've seen that happen in the Tiwi Islands and now we're seeing it happen in the Torres Strait. First Nations people shouldn't have to resort to court cases. They shouldn't have to resort to the Human Rights Commission um, and, and committees overseas for the government to do their job properly. We shouldn't have to bend our ways of life, our knowledges, to the legal system in this country to be taken seriously. If you want to listen to our voice, listen now. We are the original scientists. We, are the clim we can tell you what the climate impacts are just by looking at our country. We know what that looks like. And this government's failure to take um, action on climate at the rate that it's needed is eroding our culture. It's impacting on our cultural heritage. It's impacting on our land, our water, our sea country and our sky country. And the government is continuing to violate those human rights. This is actually not up for debate anymore. Compensation is an absolute bare minimum and that's what we need. They need this government to take action on climate uh, crisis seriously, not be captured by their mates in the fossil fuel industry. We continue to raise our voices in relation to climate action now. I'll put the question as moved by Senator Cox. Those of the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall now proceed to the. Oh, there is one. Senator Waters, have you got a motion? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Uh, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Uh, is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Nope. And um, I remind. Oh, call the clerk. A postponement notification has been lodged in relation to business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing the name of Senator Bragg, from today until 25 October. No extension notifications have been lodged. Thank you. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Um, I should now proceed to the discovery of formal business and we'll start with um, government business standing in the name of Senator Gallagher for today. Two to four. Oh, Senator Chisholm. Uh, I ask that government business notice of mo motion numbers two to four proposing references to the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Public Works be taken together as formal. Is there any objection to that matter being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motions and table statements relating to the works. 
So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 37, standing in the name of Senator Patterson. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Patterson, I ask that general business notice of motion number 37 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Patterson, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to uh, general business notice of motion number 38, standing in the name of Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 38 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator mm. Rustin. A crucial element of the delivery uh, of water, as defined in the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, is the ability to ensure its delivery is in conjunction with constraints management. The key constraint on the Murray River system is the Barmer Choke. The natural capacity to deliver water through the choke has declined over time. Without addressing this bottleneck or enabling overblank throw flows through agreements with landholders, the delivery of additional water will not result in any better environmental outcomes. These issues and associated options to address them need to be investigated. That is why the coalition government commissioned this study. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 41, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. I'll, I will come back to um, Senator Orman Payne. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I ask that general business notices of motions numbers 41 and 42 be taken together as formal motions. Is there any objection to those motions being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motions. So the question is that general business notice of motions number 41 and 42, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business notice of motion number 45, standing in the name of Senator Hughes. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hughes, I ask that general business notice of motion number 45 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 45, standing in the name of Senator Hughes, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now go back to general business notice of motion number 40, standing in the name of Senator Orman Payne. I ask that general business notion, notice of motion number 40 proposing the introduction of a bill be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Orman Payne. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to establish the National Energy Transition Authority and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Orman Payne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Orman Payne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish the National Energy Transition Authority and for related purposes. Senator Orman Payne. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Thank you. And we now move to general business notice of motion number 44, standing in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I ask that general business notice of motion number 44 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call uh, Senator Askew. I move the motion. Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Chisholm. 
The government has been upfront with Australians that, with the budget heaving, with a trillion dollars of debt, we can't afford to extend this very expensive temporary measure. The Treasurer has written to the Chair of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, Ms Cass Gottlieb, instructing the Commission to step up its surveillance of fuel markets ahead of and following the reintroduction of the full excise rate from 29 September 2022. As the independent regulator enforcing Australia's competition and consumer laws, the ACCC will investigate concerns arising out of misrepresentations regarding petrol prices and false and misleading conduct or anti-competitive conduct in fuel markets and take appropriate action. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the motion uh, in the name of Senator Dean Smith, uh, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. So that concludes uh, general business. We'll now move to the urgency motion. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 31 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Reynolds proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, President. I've moved this uh, urgency motion today as it is very clear to those on this side of the chamber that the dead hand of the train union movement is alive and well not just in the Prime Minister's office, not just uh, in this chamber, on the government benches, in building work sites across this nation, but also in the pockets, in the wallets of Australian superannuation holders. Uh, this is shocking but hardly surprising that the Albanese Labor government has reversed the requirement that we introduced for super funds to disclose. So they have reversed the require requirement for disclosure on how super funds spend, the, spend their super members' funds on sponsorships and payments. No line items, no transparency and no accountability. Absolutely no integrity whatsoever. Service payments are clearly political and they're designed to buy political inter interference and influence. How could they not be? These payments some at least 85 million over the past five years alone from superannuation funds are for things like million dollar footy sponsorships, corporate boxes, union kickbacks and lobbying. This is the money of Australian workers' superannuation funds. It is their money. It is the money that they have earned that they have put into their superannuation fund. Australians deserve to know how their retirement income is being spent. The Labor government's amendments, uh, with the encouragement and the persuasion—probably not too hard a persuasion—of the trade union movement, goes against recommendations from both the Productivity Commission and APRA. Well, of course, they, of course it opposes uh, what they wanted, because it is against the best interests of all Australian superannuation holders who unknowingly are having their superannuation funds used for such things. Now, if those officers were actually serious, a modicum of seriousness about transparency, their very first move in government would not have been to support winding back these transparency measures for every Australian worker. The measures that we introduced were designed to let sunlight into the three trillion dollar industry. This is an industry that impacts on the retirement of all Australians. What absolute hypocrisy. On the one hand, you've got Labor government parliamentarians and crossbenchers who ran their campaigns on integrity and trust. And what is the first thing they do? They come into this chamber and move a motion to, to get rid of the regulations that we introduced that provided transparency. They now seek to pass regulations that would hide the disclosure of payments that superannuation fund make. 
It was their first thing Labor Party did in government. They talk about integrity, but on their first test they failed dismally. In this chamber and on the government benches, we have to always strive for the best when it comes to Australians' hard-earned money. Australians who work hard to make their income, putting money aside for their retirement, doing the right thing. The key word here is they do it compulsorily. Australians, by law, if they are working, have to put some money aside for the future. And compulsory savings by ordinary Australians that has seen the growth of the super industry now to over $3.4 trillion. On the face of it, a fantastic result. Because after all, the initial intent and still the intent of superannuation was to take the financial pressure off government or taxpayers by ensuring that Australians can pay or partially pay their way through retirement with their own money. Remember this, it is their own money. On this side of the House, when we were in government, we wanted to make sure that members actually saw they had transparency on where uh, their money was going, and we will continue to support that. In stark contrast to the union puppet opposite, there are three key principles that the coalition MPs will continue to adhere to in relation to superannuation. Firstly, we know it is members' money. We are always committed to fund performance and we are always committed to transparency and integrity for every single superannuation member. These principles are the bedrock of what we know delivers the best superannuation system. The coalition uh, government's Your Future, Your Super reforms, which were so ably championed by my colleague uh, Senator Jane Hume here in the chamber, were the most significant reforms to superannuation since the introduction of compulsory super in 1992. The name says it all, and it says what we are all about on this side, your future, your super. These reforms ensure that superannuation works in the best financial interest of all Australians and not in the interests of superannuation board members and trade unionists who had corporate tickets at the cost of uh, superannuation members, and they never even knew about it. We did so also supporting superannuation members by removing unnecessary waste, by in increasing accountability and transparency, and providing more flexibility for families and individuals, in particular lower paid Australian women. So, critically, when in government, we were all about doing three things in relation to super. Strengthening obligations to ensure trustees only act in the best financial interests of members. Strengthening obligations to ensure that trustees only act in the best financial interests of members. Are these service fees? Are paying for corporate boxes? Are paying money to the trade union movement and to the Labor Party in the best financial interests of Australian superannuation holders? Of course they're not. And that's what we wanted to do to make sure that Australians understood where their superannuation money was going. We also ensured that, union, uh, that uh, superannuation funds provided better information regarding how they manage and spend members' money in advance of annual members' meetings. And thirdly, we provide, looked after their interests through enhanced portfolio holdings disclosure. Again, all aimed to support the transparency and the management of an individual's funds. Now we learn, as I said, the first thing this Labor government is doing is putting these reforms under attack. Of course, with the dead hand of the trade union movement coming in persistently behind them. Now, of course, this is not something that anyone opposite, and it was not in the Labor Party policy before the last election, that they were going to go ahead and dismantle this transparency. Of course it was not. Now, for a Prime Minister and for crossbench members who campaigned on accountability and integrity, this was the first act of those opposite in government to extinguish transparency on how unions and the ALP access millions and millions and millions of dollars every year of trade union funds. So the first action was to do this. It wasn't to take measures straight away to deal with cost of living pressures on Australian workers, and it was not to take action to actually address workforce challenges or anything else. 
It was to do the trade union's bidding uh, to hide where superannuation members' funds are going. Staggeringly, there are elements of the superannuation industry who support this watering down of transparency. How can this possibly be? How can this possibly be in the best interests of uh, superannuants to have this expenditure, this self-interested expenditure for labour and the unions hidden? And most of all, on this side of the chamber, when we have a look at this issue, we wonder how can this possibly be, not be, I should say, a matter of integrity? Of course it is a matter of integrity. The fact is that you are hiding millions of dollars of expenditure which flows through to trade unions and to the Labor Party, and now they want to do it without disclosure. So people cannot see the benefits that Labor and the trade unions are getting from superannuation funds. And you've got to ask why. And again, it is very clear. It is very, very clear. But I think earlier this month, Michael Rodden in the Financial Review really let the cat out of the bag when he noted that Senator Nick McKim is working alongside the Treasurer to help him hide the disclosure of payments. Yet he tweeted on September the 16th, the Green wants meaningful transparency that tracks the flow of members' money, including for political purposes and profit. What bunkum. It is utter hypocrisy. And if you go on and read that article further, it will see exactly why it was the case. The Hain Royal Commission's Exhibit 5-368, the KPMG audit into payments made to CBUS sponsoring organisations, is illuminating. And if any superintendent wants to know where their money is going, look further into this, because shortly Labor will be hiding all of these payments from you. Oh, sorry. Uh Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the urgency motion as moved by Senator Reynolds. Uh, and I can assure the Chamber that our government is committed to delivering accountability, transparency and good governance in every part of our financial system. And so we welcome this motion today. Uh, but you've really got to ask yourself what is going on with those opposite? Uh, it has only been a matter of months since Australians banished them to the opposition benches and ended their decade of wasted opportunities and messed up priorities. Uh, and they still apparently haven't learnt a thing. They've got nothing to offer Australians. They themselves admitted that we're the opposition, we have no policies. Uh, and instead, they're throwing random bits of mud and trying to see what will stick. Uh, today they're here in this chamber trying to talk about transparency and accountability. Of all things, those opposite talking about transparency and accountability. Of all things, we welcome this motion. We welcome the conversation today because it's pretty rich for those opposite to suddenly claim that transparency and accountability are matters of urgency for you, matters of urgency for those on the opposition benches considering your decade of rot after rot after rot, scandal after scandal, cover-up after cover-up. This motion has come from the people with the former Prime Minister, who was the Minister for Health, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, the Minister for Home Affairs and the Treasurer, all at the same time. I probably miss them, all kept secret from his own ministry and the Australian public as well. So let's talk about transparency and accountability. We welcome it. We welcome it. This is the former government that want to come to this chamber and talk about transparency and accountability. Really, really. So let's be absolutely clear that those opposite have no interest in transparency, no interest in accountability. And they had 10 long, long years to demonstrate that. And this motion uh, has absolutely nothing to do with either anyway. This is just another ploy in the war that those opposite are waging against our proud Labor legacy of superannuation in this country. 
And what Australians are asking themselves right now is why do the Liberals hate super so much? Is it because it was thought up by the union movement, Senator Hume? Is it because it was made universal by a Labor government, order, order, Senator Reynolds? Order, order, order. S excuse me, excuse me, Senator Walsh. Now, I'm pretty lenient here, Senator Reynolds, but I am going to ask you to withdraw that. I withdraw my apologies. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Maybe they hate super. Uh, so much because this is a legacy of the union movement, this is a legacy of the Australian Labor Party, or is it just the industry funds, the industry super funds, that you hate on the opposition benches? Uh, and why would that be? Is it, be? is it because the industry super funds consistently outperform the rest of the sector? Is it because you can't stand the idea that workers in a union would have an interest in ensuring their retirement savings are working for them and choose to invest them in an industry super fund? Or is it because industry super funds have dared to invest in nation-building projects and infrastructure in this country, projects that will deliver good, secure jobs for the very workers whose retirement savings are invested? Nation-building projects like Star of the South, Australia's first offshore wind farm. Nation-building projects uh, like the construction of social and affordable housing, which will also create thousands of jobs as well as drive down the cost of housing and rentals. Those opposite can't see to see these projects funded and they can't, see the they can't uh, stand to see the returns that those projects will deliver for members as well. They just can't stand to see the superannuation industry step up and deliver the very things that your government refused to deliver. That's why their former treasurer tried to insert himself into the boardrooms of the super funds. Uh, and that's why they're back here continuing their ideological war on super. This motion has absolutely nothing to do with transparency and accountability. It has absolutely nothing to do with protecting the interests of super fund members because those opposite do not care about super fund members, do not care about Australian workers and their retirement. They definitely don't care about workers' hard-earned retirement savings because for the last decade on the watch of those opposite, Australian workers have lost $5 billion per year in unpaid superannuation, $5 billion per year missing from the retirement savings of Australian workers, because those opposite sat back and allowed the ATO to take a light-touch approach to dodgy employers, a light-touch approach which has done nothing to stop employers stealing super from their workers. I think the Taxation Commissioner has admitted it himself, Senator Hume. A light-touch approach that's resulted in less than 15 per cent of unpaid super being recovered by the tax office and has shifted the responsibility for chasing unpaid super onto workers themselves. So if forcing workers to do the job of their government agencies wasn't enough, those opposite made that job almost impossible. We know those opposite just sat, sat by when workers tried to get their stolen super back. We know they sat by while workers who reported unpaid super by the ATO were consistently given no information about the progress of their claims. We know they sat by while the ATO kept workers completely in the dark about any deals they made with employers about their hard-earned super. Where was the sense of urgency then? Where was the sense of urgency about transparency and accountability from those opposite then? when it came to unpaid super? Where were the Liberal senators coming to the defence of Australian workers or super fund uh, members then? Why did those opposites sit back while five billion per year was missing from workers' super accounts? Well, we know why, because those opposite are only moving motions like this one as part of their ideological war on super. But going after the funds isn't enough for those opposite. In their war against super, the Liberal Party are going straight after workers' retirement savings themselves. They want to force workers to raid their retirement savings to buy a house, despite the consequences it will have on driving up house prices. And I will take, I will take your interjection, Senator Scar, about choice, uh, because during COVID, you did force Australian workers to raid their retirement savings to get through the global pandemic. 
You said order. this in the chamber yesterday. You're saying it again today. You're saying that it's a question of giving people a choice. A choice. I am not sure whether you actually understand what Senator a choice is. Left. Because when you champion low wages growth as a deliberate design feature of your economic plan, when you do nothing to drive down housing prices to make them more affordable, when you deny Australian workers access to pandemic support based on the industry they work in, when you leave casual workers, workers in the arts, university workers, off pandemic support because you hate those sectors, when you leave workers with absolutely no support in the middle of a global pandemic, you are not giving them a choice. You are not giving them a choice. You are not helping them to make a choice. What you are doing is forcing them to raid their hard-earned retirement savings because you can't be bothered coming up with policies to actually help them yourself. Almost half a million Australians have their super funds closed or almost completely cleaned out of a as a result of what you are calling a choice. What you are calling a choice. $37 billion was taken out of accounts from people who really needed those funds the most leaving them at absolute ground zero when it comes to retirement security. But those opposite, they don't want to stop there. It's not enough to have workers drain what's already in their accounts. Now coalition senators have even more policy ideas to go after workers' retirement savings. So apparently you do have some policy ideas, uh, Senator Hume, on the back bench. They're suggesting that the government increase taxes on super. They've said the government should not proceed with the legislated increase to the super uh, guarantee. They've called the requirement for employers to pay super. Uh, they've called on that to be removed altogether, and most shamefully, they've called for super to not be paid to low-income earners at all. If they cared about transparency and accountability, they would own up. Order. They would own up to Order. their hatred of super. Senator, Senator Walsh, Senator Walsh, if you just take your seat for a second. And I'm trying to listen intently, and I understand these conversations can get quite boisterous. But when there's four, three of you who haven't got the softest voices in the Senate, it's starting to hurt my ear. So I would just ask if Senator Walsh, for the remaining 29 cent seconds, can be heard in silence. Thank you. Senator Walsh. If you cared about transparency and accountability, you would own up to the fact that you hate super. You hate Labor's proud super legacy and you hate the industry super funds the well, most. Well, you would be honest with seconds. Australians that you just want to tear the whole system down and that's what this is about. Our world-class superannuation system is a Labor legacy. We will always stand with workers to strengthen it and protect it. We have no interest in being drawn into a war with you on Senator super. Walsh. Your time has expired, and I'm sorry the 10 seconds of silence was quite enjoyable there for a while. Senator McKim. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Senate's being asked to, uh, this afternoon to reaffirm the importance of transparency and accountability in Australia's superannuation sector and to support measures that ensure that superannuation funds provide better information regarding how they manage and spend members' money. Well, the Greens could not agree more with those sentiments. We could not agree more uh, with those sentiments. Now, just after the election, the new uh, Financial Services Minister, Mr Jones, gave uh, what I uh, dare to suggest is a pretty optimistic take on how this new parliament was going to deal uh, broadly with the issue of superannuation. Mr Jones is quoted in the Australian Financial Review as saying this, the spear carriers have left parliament so, now, uh, so there is now an opportunity to sign a treaty to end the super wars. Well, we here in the Greens very much appreciate that sentiment, but I'm sorry to say uh, to Mr Jones that the end to the super wars is very clearly nowhere in sight, because the opposition has a deep reserve of spear carriers, and they are committed to fighting the super wars. And that, colleagues, is exactly how we find ourselves having this debate today. So this debate, even though it's cloaked in very respectable language and, in fact, language for which the Greens totally support and we will support, the question being put, the need for transparency and accountability in superannuation and 
for measures to ensure that super funds provide better information regarding how they manage and spend members' money. We look forward to supporting that. But this is, of course, in the context of the government's new regulations that establish a set of rules for what information is provided by super funds in their annual member meeting notices. Now, the opposition has put forward this debate today precisely because Senator David Pocock has postponed his motion to disallow these regulations. Now, uh, the fact that it's Senator Pocock's disallowance and not the LNP's disallowance is an incisive insight into the mercenary nature of the spear carriers inside the LNP. Because if the spear carriers inside the LNP were so confident of their case that the new government's regulations should be disallowed and the old regulations should stand, why then are they relying on Senator Pocock's good name and reputation to lead the argument for them? Why doesn't the LNP put up its own disallowance? Why doesn't the LNP put up its own disallowance? Now I'm going to answer the question I've just put to the chamber. The reason that the LNP, the opposition, is so keen for Senator Pocock to, to lead the charge in this battle is because the transparency and accountability regime that they put in place, that the LNP put in place when they were the government, was designed to target the unions. It was designed to target industry super funds while going soft on retail for profit super funds. And that's because the LNP is full of spear carriers that want to fight the super wars, and they are also full of spear carriers for whom the very idea that organisations that represent a collective of workers would have access to large amounts of capital is actually hell on earth for the LNP. The idea that working people can have a say on how large amounts of capital are distributed in our society is complete anathema to the LNP. The opposition's idea of transparency and accountability is an itemised account, line by line, of payments by super funds to unions, but nothing whatsoever—and this is the critical part—nothing whatsoever on the payments of dividends or other proceeds for profit by retail super funds to their parent companies. So you want to make the, the super funds declare payments to unions, that's the industry funds, but you, won't, uh, you don't want the retail super funds, the for-profit super funds, to declare uh, their uh, payments, their dividends to their parent company. company. If you want to talk about hypocrisy, go and take a good look in the mirror. That's all I've got to say to the LNP. The previous government's regulations provide lopsided transparency because, and this is the critical part, they were designed to provide ammunition for those on the side of profit in the super wars. Those regulations were drafted under the Morrison government, a government that was the absolute living embodiment of crony capitalism. And that crony capitalist government spent every day of its existence fighting organised labour as hard as you could and defending the rent seekers as hard as you could. And that is what you are doing when you saddle up Senator Pocock to take the lead in this battle. Well, the Greens are not interested in playing along with the spear carriers in their war on industry super. What we are interested in and what we are working to deliver is meaningful transparency. We want to see an annual super transparency report published by the regulator, APRA, that tables all of the relevant expenditure, including for political purposes and including for profit. And we want that all together in one space. So cross comparisons can be made by members. Members would get a better understanding of how their super fund rates relative to other funds, and it would enable institutional scrutiny from the media, from NGOs and from parliamentarians on expenditure by super funds and on profit making by super funds. And that is far more likely to bring about meaningful change than either of the regulations that the LNP want us to choose from. <coughs> so we are in 
a discussion with the government and we hope that we can land in that place which will provide a far more meaningful transparency regime than either the LNP's old regulations or the Labor Party's new Thank ones. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this urgency motion that calls on this chamber to reaffirm the importance of accountability and transparency in Australia's superannuation system. Yeah. It is so disappointing that we have to have a debate like this, on a motion like this, in this very chamber. This chamber, whose primary role is scrutiny, whose primary role is to shine a light in dark corners. You would have thought, indeed the Australian people would expect, that this chamber, no matter which party you are from, would support accountability and transparency in Australia's superannuation system, but no, clearly no. But after all, Australia's superannuation system and the trustees that operate within it, they're the custodian of $3.4 trillion of Australia's retirement savings. Now, let me put that into context for you. $3.4 trillion is twice the size of the ASX. It's one and a half times the size of Australia's GDP. It is an enormous money, and yet we allow these enormous companies, these huge, huge organisations, to operate in the dark. Unfortunately, this is not a view that's shared by everyone in the chamber. We in the coalition have always supported transparency and accountability in the superannuation sector because we know that it will deliver choice and better outcomes for Australians if we do. And that's why when we were in government, we implemented a series of reforms that modernised the superannuation system, addressing the two key drivers of poorer outcomes for superannuation members, opacity and underperformance. Our reforms through the, your, the Protecting Your Super legislation and through uh, choice legislation, through to Your Future, Your Super legislation were designed specifically to improve transparency, to allow for better informed choices and greater retirement outcomes for Australians. And it is working. It is working. The Your Future, Your Super reforms were the most significant since the introduction of compulsory super back in 1992 and consolidating 3.5 million accounts, unintended multiple accounts, that were an intentional design feature of the system so that you paid twice as much fees, so that you paid twice as much on administration. It was an intentional design feature. Well, they have diminished dramatically. 3.5 million unintended multiple accounts have now exited the system, making you more money. We banned exit fees, we capped fees on small balances, and we ensured that younger people do not have to pay for insurances that they do not need. That they do not need. We also provided Australian workers with a genuine choice, a real choice. You didn't have to be told by your employer which fund you had to go into. You didn't have to be told by your union. You got to choose which superannuation fund best suited you and your family and your lifestyle for the first time. These measures stopped superannuation balances being eroded by unnecessarily and overly high fees, which over time will save particularly young people now. They will save people that have combined their accounts today tens of thousands of dollars, which will be compounded into the hundreds of thousands in their retirement. Following this, the Your Future, Your Super reforms will save all workers around $17.9 billion dollars over the next 10 years by putting increasing downward pressure on fees, removing unnecessary waste and, most importantly, increasing accountability and transparency of all super funds. Now, unfortunately, the Labor Party and the Greens and the Greens fought us every step of the way on all of this legislation. They were desperate to keep their mates in the industry and particularly in the unions happy at all costs and at the cost of Superfund members, at the cost of you. One key element of our reforms was to ensure that Superfunds had to act in the best financial interest of members. Not the best interest, that morphed. All of a sudden it was in the best interest of members to drive across great bridges, or the best interest of members to invest in uh, uh, housing developments in London. No, the best financial interests of members. Is what it should be the primary purpose of superannuation funds. That, that, uh, un unfortunately, next, those opposite are prioritised mates instead of ensuring accountability and transparency for all Australian superannuants. That's why it wasn't surprising, although it was extraordinarily galling, it was extraordinarily brazen, 
that Stephen Jones, the assistant treasurer in the other place, the first thing he did on coming to government, the very first thing, the number one priority in the Treasury portfolio of a brand new government is to wind back transparency and accountability in superannuation. You would have thought, nine years in opposition, you would have had a little bit more to do once you hit the Treasury benches. But no, that's what Labor have prioritised. That was their first order of business. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's brazen. And after all the good work was done, because I will agree, I will agree with Senator Walsh. Yes, superannuation was certainly the invention of a Labor government, but by God, it took a coalition government to make it work for members rather than make it work for the funds and for fund managers. He's quickly followed up, the Assistant Treasurer, with a review of the Your Future, Your Super laws, the laws that improved member outcomes, that improved performance, that improved transparency, that got rid of the underperforming funds. Now there's a review going on, a secret review, I hear. A secret review. We don't even know who's on this secret review, but I reckon that we can guess. Under the former government's accountability and transparency reform, super funds were required to disclose line by line their expenditure on things like political donations, like marketing, whether they sponsor, super, whether they sponsor football stadiums or football teams. If they, were required to, to, they were required to disclose payments to industry bodies, including unions, and they were required to disclose inter-related party transactions, this mysterious, amorphous blob. They were required to disclose exactly what that meant, and that's what the Assistant Treasurer has decided to unwind. Now, why is this outrageous? Because superannuation funds are trusts. Every single dollar that a superannuation fund has belongs to a member. It doesn't belong to a big corporate entity. It's not as if they can borrow it. It's your money. It's your money. And they won't tell you how they're spending it. Because for every dollar that they spend, that's one dollar that's gone from your retirement savings. Don't you think that you deserve to know where every dollar of your retirement savings is being spent? That's all we ask. That's all we ask. And yet the first order of business for the Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones, is to unwind these reforms. Now, I am very disappointed in the Greens because it appears that the self-appointed arbiters of transparency in this place, the Australian Greens, are backing the Labor Party. Senator McKim has actually said out loud in this place that the Greens want meaningful transparency that tracks the flow of members' money. Well, the fastest way to do this, Senator McKim, is to commit to supporting the disallowance of the government's watered-down regulations. But he refuses to do that. Senator McKim talks about working with the government to improve accountability while maintaining, at the same time, that the Australian Greens will not commit this week to supporting a motion on the notice paper to disallow a repeal of these watered-down measures. Senator McKim thinks that the government, that's already put its flag well in the sand on this issue and moved to repeal these transparency measures, Senator McKim thinks that the government will suddenly change its tune when the only mechanism in parliament is to, that it has to stop it evaporates. Well, I wish that I had Senator McKim's op, uh, optimism. In fact, I think that's probably the wrong word. I thought perhaps it was naivety, but I think when we heard from Senator McKim before, we realise he's just as captured as those opposite. What a terrible shame for a party that tri prides itself on its ethical behaviour, on its accountability, on its transparency, on its mission for integrity. What a shame, Senator McKim. I do suspect that, this, that the Greens will support this motion. I suspect that they will claim that they do support accountability, that they do support transparency in super in order to deliver those better outcomes. But the proof is always going to be in the pudding. Put your money where your mouth is, Senator McKim. The proof will be how they vote when they get a chance to actually ensure transparency rather than just talk about it. Ensure transparency in super is maintained or removed. 
So I call on the Australian Greens right now to walk this talk. First, support the motion, but then, but then commit to supporting the disallowance motion on the notice paper, and not only that, commit to supporting it today. Commit to supporting it this week. Your reputations depend on it. Senator Stirl. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Now, I'm very happy to speak to the urgency motion moved by the opposition today. And I agree, like most of us on this, or all of us on this side, and you know that side, well, they'll speak for themselves. We agree on transparency and accountability in Australia's superannuation sector is extremely important. But those measures must reflect real-world behaviour and be built for the majority of Australians, Australians, not just the chosen few. The motion also goes to the level of information given by super funds to their members and how they spend their members' money. Now, of course, relevant disclosures should be made when required and reporting dates met. Members deserve to know where their fees are going and how their money is being managed. That's why we have regulators such as APRA and ASIC that are tasked with overseeing the health of super funds and ensuring governance and accountability. I could also add that we've also had a Financial Services Royal Commission too, that some people have seemed to have forgot about, which was heavily opposed, Madam Acting Deputy President, by the other side until they were dragged kicking and screaming into it. They don't talk about that at all, do they? Now let's be clear. It wasn't the industry super funds with both worker and employer representatives making decisions in the best interests of members that got touched up by the Banking Royal Commission. No, it wasn't them funds. It was the other side's mates in the big banks and the profit to shareholder super funds that were found to be up to no good. Remember that? We don't hear that coming from that side. But none of us on this side will ever forget that. We've heard a bit in recent weeks from the opposition on this topic of transparency and accountability around super. But let's be clear. This is really just another opportunity to bash super, to bash unions and the huge outcomes delivered for everyday Australian workers. And how do I know? Because I'm a member of a fund. And I was signed up in 1987 for, through the Transport Workers Union when I remember saying, what am I going to do with $1.87 when I was 27 years old? Thank God for the Transport Workers Union. And thank God for all the unions that have pushed these super funds and done in the best interest for their members that their mates through the banks and all that side, that crony side, <laughs> I'd love to hear their record of what they've done for their members. We saw it last year with the former government's Your Future Super package of changes to super laws, where while there were some changes supported by Labor, yes there were, there was also some ridiculous changes that only increased the admin burden on super funds and did nothing to help the best financial interests of super fund members. The Your Future, Your Super package, which we've heard some squealing about today, was met with a chorus of concern from all sides, including investment managers, actuaries, business groups and, of course, the unions. But the former government would not listen, and the legislation and regulations were flawed. And so it has fallen to this Labor government to fix their mistakes, as in so many other areas. I recall the rushed Senate inquiry last year, where dozens of submissions outlined the concerns with the real-world impacts of the new legislation, and we didn't even get to see the associated regulations until the 11th hour. This was a deliberate attempt by the former government to avoid scrutiny. And despite concerns being raised by bodies such as CPA Australia, Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand, and the Law Council of Australia, along with almost the entire industry. I'll repeat that, almost the entire industry. So whether deliberate or accidental, certain regulations introduced by the former government as part of their Your Future, Your Super package, have acted as a ridiculous admin burden, especially, especially for smaller funds, and proved to be a waste of members' money which required change, which was ultimately led by the industry itself. Not that side, the industry. In particular, the former government's regulations about annual members' meetings didn't adhere to existing accounting standards and did nothing to improve real-world disclosure for super fund members. 
in order to improve productivity and the quality of service being provided to the superannuation holders, the superannuation sector, especially the profit to members industry sector of the industry, with a strong track record of actually delivering better returns for members, have supported changes to the annual member meetings regulations, which the minister issued on the 9th of September. But it wasn't just flawed on disclosure regimes that were the former government got it wrong. As senators know, and I've said it before, I come from the transport industry. I am a truckie. Being a transport worker is the most dangerous job an Australian worker can have. And for many workers, the only insurance coverage that we and our families have is through the insurance attached to our super. That's one of the reasons why it's so important that we have industry and worker voices represented in the government's arrangements for super funds, alongside terrible regulations that did nothing to actually provide better real-world disclosure to members, was the former government's aim to override default provisions in agreements with the introduction of stapling. The ability of transport workers to exercise collective choice through collective enterprise agreements has been a key avenue for those workers to ensure superannuation and associated product options that are tailored to their collective needs and maintain vigilance that their interests are protected against practices and fund offerings that testimony before the Financial Services Royal Commission demonstrated might otherwise leave them worse off in the short and long term. Those default provisions once provided a measure of security to both employers and workers, for that those workers joining transport employers can be confident they will have superannuation coverage and services that reflect their occupation and industry, even where they neglect to make an active choice. I've heard directly from industry that those changes are leaving people without the coverage they need, all for an ideological bent by the former government. But do we hear anything from them about what those workers in industries such as transport and construction and agriculture need? I say no. That is why I'm pleased to reiterate that Labor is committed to delivering accountability, transparency and good governance in every part of our financial system, including in superannuation. That is why we have committed to recommendations of the Hain Royal Commission. They expand accountability on banks, superannuation funds and other financial service providers. The Albanese government believes Australians deserve a dignified retirement supported by a strong superannuation system. Our 3.4 million, oh, I'm sorry, 3.4 trillion superannuation system is world class. It's the fourth largest in the world, though our economy is the 13th largest. How proud should we be of this? This is an Australian success story against which those opposite have been waging a tireless ideological battle for many, many years, and some continue to do so now. The Albanese government, by contrast, is committed to strengthening the system in the interests of working families. Never forget, this is the same party who, in the final hours of the election campaign, introduced the policy that would allow first home buyers the ability to borrow 50000 from their superannuation to get into the property market, a policy which was widely condemned for a range of reasons. Furthermore, the regulations the previous government introduced regarding the notice of annual member meetings was clunky and ideologically motivated. Burying super members under mountains of paper riddled with double counting serves no useful purpose. The level of detail previously mandated was excessive and far greater than required by public companies to their shareholders. It is important to have consistency in disclosures wherever possible and to have a level playing field. Furthermore, there was no clear alignment with the Australian Accounting Standards Board or APRA reporting, both of which funds currently report under now. This adds unnecessary costs and reduces the efficiency of the system as well as compatibility across public disclosures. It's also created confusion due to a lack of consistency across disclosures 
made by funds. The aim is to assist members to better understand fund expenditure by the provision of adequate information, not confuse them by using different definitions in different public disclosures. Adequate information is designed as information that informs, not overwhelms, and provides useful insights into fund expenditure but does not put funds at a commercial disadvantage by disclosing granular contractual information. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make my contribution to uh, this matter of urgency. The Greens uh, indeed agree that su the superannuation sector needs more transparency, and you've heard from uh, Senator McKim exactly that. Australians should know how their super is being invested. In particular, it should be easily accessible for an individual to find out if their super is being invested in, say, fossil fuels, gambling, tobacco, alcohol, logging offshore detention and, and many other industries. And we've seen the rise of companies ramping up their policies and commitments regarding environmental and social governance, and it's great to see increasingly more companies starting to own this responsibility and take it seriously, but also acknowledging that they have a lot of power and a huge role to play in relation to uh, what environmental social responsibility looks like. Um, it's also great to see investors taking these factors more seriously too and being more conscious of the industries and companies that they're actually investing in. Um, we all vote with our money. Every single day we do this, we might not put much thought into that, but with every single dollar we spend, it sends a message to a company that we like them. Um, the products and services that they have to offer, what they stand for and overall. I mean, if we didn't, then why would we spend our hard-earned money there? However, whilst we are seeing this increase on one hand of transparency and accountability, um, we are also seeing some take advantage of that. And they are advertising themselves as being environmentally friendly, taking care of their workers and also having so social licence to operate, particularly in those communities um, that, that they do operate in, and having good, diverse accountability and leadership when, in fact, they absolutely don't. And they're greenwashing and misleading the public and their investors on lots of occasions. Some businesses are taking advantage of investors who are wanting them to do the right thing and making great claims that, without actually embodying them. And this is why we need stronger regulations relating to environmental social governance and, and, and its regulations. It's commonly known as ESG. And the EU has a comprehensive framework that govern ESG, which is formed part of the European Green Deal, in fact. The UK and New Zealand have also taken measures to help regulate ESG, and the primary focus on environmental considerations, which we here at the Greens obviously see this as a priority. Australia, once again, is about five or ten years behind the rest of the world, and, and we can start to elevate this through this process, particularly with the transparency of um, investment uh, and transparency with super funds. And we know there are some frameworks in here in Australia that people refer to as sustainability that are already in place, but in fact are not strong enough if we are seeing companies continue to, to do this and not talk the talk without walking the walk, in fact, and without it being pro properly, properly regulated and having the power to do that. What we know is fossil fuel companies in Australia um, know that the Australian public wants a climate action and they know they want renewable energy. So what are they doing? They're placing wind turbines and solar panels in their ads. That's what they're doing. It's still continuing to extract coal and gas and cooking our planet. And this is absolutely a marketer's dream, greenwashing, that they are doing. And these ads are obviously curated for that sneaky, uh, convenient purpose to convince the public that this is not actually the issue. And they are not providing that transparency in relation to what super funds are doing. And in the past, we've seen that super uh, funds um, need to make sure uh, the ones that are doing this are already performing better than others who are not, making sure that their governance is che in check, making sure that there is transparency already for investors who are investing in fossil fuels, gambling and weapons. So it's been found that these, uh, this criteria actually helps investors avoid some of the controversy that can be uh, impacting on their stock prices, their investment returns, um, such as you know, one example is BHP's catastrophic 
oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. So we absolutely need to hold these uh, companies to account and make sure there is transparency in their ESG policies and will not address the climate crisis with companies just simply uh, adjusting their market strategy. We want to make sure that if companies want to uh, do good by the planet and people, then we actually need to create that transparency through a regulated framework. Many of us have seen uh, super invested by these giant companies, and we need to make sure that, it, that when they are making those investments, it's aligned with their priorities, their values, and it's not aiding uh, the burying Thank of the you, truth Senator in relation Cox. to these. Senator Bragg. Thanks very much, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, it's uh, regrettable but uh, necessary to make some comments on this uh, matter of urgency. And um, I mean, I guess effectively this is about the compulsory superannuation scheme, which is compulsory um, and sees about $30 billion a year going out in fees quite a lot of fees and um, on a comparative basis would be one of the least efficient and least productive retirement schemes anywhere in the world. Uh, effectively what you have here is a very reasonable transparency measure whereby at least $15 million in this year is being spent by super funds going into the union coffers and that not being disclosed to members. Now, that figure will balloon to $30 million by the end of the decade. So that's $30 million of retirement savings that is being shoveled to unions that members can't see. And the nub of this issue, and there's been lots of contributions on this issue, is that as a result of these changes in regulations, there's now more transparency on the fund expenditure by visiting the AEC website where the unions are captured and have to disclose their sources of income, then there is available to the members of the super funds. So if I'm a member of a super fund and I go to the super fund website, I get less information than I would as a punter going to the AEC website and searching up associated entities and finding the income the unions get from the super funds. I mean, that's, that's how ridiculous this is. So, um, effectively, the Labor Party was against these reforms. Uh, the now Minister Stephen Jones wrote 90 letters to the members of the then government urging us not to proceed with our own reforms and pass the Your Future, Your Super changes. Uh, and that's because the vested interests that Mr Jones and the Labor Party are closest to don't want to see these changes because they don't want to see the transparency. They don't want people to see the amount of money that is being distributed from the super funds into the unions. And there's no question that there's been too much politics in super, uh, but I think it's hard to avoid when you've got a system that's been created by the laws of this country and you have allowed such a poorly run structure to operate for 30 years where there is huge leakage. And there's no question that the banks have done a bad job in super. I mean, they have charged ridiculously high fees, they have plundered the retirement savings of their members, yeah. and the unions have been able to do the same. And they are proceeding with this uh, agenda of taking tens of millions of dollars a year out of the funds and taking it into the unions. Now, one of the funds, which is called First Super, which is a very small fund, is taking three and a half million dollars a year in director's fees, which is more than a you know ASX. 20 company would be doing on a tiny little super fund. Uh, and of course, some of the first disclosures we've seen under this new regime, including from Australian Super, uh, are now able to conceal more than $100 million in related party transactions uh, and a further million dollars in payments to unions. So we're now not allowed to see any of these payments. These are now a secret uh, brought to you by the party that apparently is arguing in favour of transparency. And I think it is very regrettable. And if the Labor Party is obsessed with the legacies of Paul Keating and all these people from the 1980s, surely if they were genuinely concerned about the longevity uh, and the credibility of the superannuation scheme, they would be embracing the idea of transparency. Because the people that are forced to put their money into this scheme 
are forced to put their money into this scheme. They have no choice. So the least you can do is show them where the money is going. And if you have concerns about the money going to related parties in other parts of the industry, then make that transparent as well. And I think the issues that the Greens have raised uh, may well be legitimate issues. I mean, maybe there is scope for more transparency. But the bottom line here in this, this debate is that the regulations that were made by the last government that require transparency on payments from super funds to unions or any other related party are credible and should not be removed. And the disallowance that's been proposed by Senator Pocock should be supported by anyone that is wanting to campaign in future on transparency and integrity. Certainly they won't be able to make these arguments if they are not going to support this motion. Thank Goodbye. you. Senator David Pocock. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Clearly, we're hearing from all sides of this chamber that people want more transparency. Australians have voted for more transparency, and when it comes to superannuation, we should be pushing for more transparency, not less. According to APRA, we pay some $9.1 billion per annum in fees, but the Grattan Institute points out that many super funds don't report the fees that they pay to companies who help manage their members, number, their members money. So when you add that, it's more like $30 billion, which is an eye-watering amount of, <laughs> of money, some big, big numbers. Super consumers have come out saying that they want more transparency. They don't like these changes to the regulations. And to make it clear, that the old regulations apply to both industry and retail funds. Despite claims of high administrative burdens from Minister Jones, Prime Super and Commonwealth Super Corporation both disclosed under the old regs. It didn't seem like a problem for them. And I'd like to address Senator McKim's point earlier, uh, casting aspersions on my <laughs> disallowance motion. I'm not carrying anybody's spear here. This is something I've heard a lot about from people in the ACT. They want to know where their money is going in superannuation. And I think if we put aside the, the partisan nature of this debate, we should be for transparency, regardless of, of where it is. We should be supporting it. And that's why I have a problem with rolling back transparency in superannuation. I haven't been in here for long, just a few months. One of the things I've noticed is that not everyone votes consistently for good policies, and, and often there are votes for politics, which uh, you can understand. And I sort of point to a, a few weeks ago when myself and the rest of the crossbench supported one of Senator Roberts' motions on the climate bill, when all three parties voted against it because I think politically to support FON um, was not convenient. So I'll certainly be continuing to push for more transparency in super. It's something the people I want to, want rep that I represent want and it's certainly something that I want to see. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Uh, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Reynolds be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. Uh, I move to take note of documents three and four on page four and seek to seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. 
Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Um, can I just seek clarification? Is this for item 13 and 14? Uh, no. Just 13 at just this 13. point. Thank you. Yep. Then I move uh, that the Senate take note of document number one, which is the 65th Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Conference Halifax report, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Senator Steelejohn. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to seek leave to table a non-conforming petition um, of over 26,000 signatures relating to the withdrawal of Australia from the AUKUS agreement and the stopping of development of nuclear submarines. Okay, Senator, St Senator Steele, John is seeking leave to table a non-conforming petition. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Steele, John. Were there any other senators that wanted to uh, take note of any other documents? If not, uh, I'll proceed to committee reports. Senator Pratt. On behalf of the Chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee, Senator Stirl, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the definitions of meat and other animal products. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator, Mac oh, now, Senator Macdonald, are you wishing to speak on that um, rural and regional affairs report? Uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy Ch uh, President. I rise to speak to the uh, meat definitions inquiry uh, because the definitions of meat and other animal products report is a timely examination of the food labelling regulatory framework intended to benefit and protect consumers. Definitions matter. We use them every day. We couldn't function as human beings or a society without them. The amount of information contained in just a simple definition is extraordinary, and it's particularly important for people making decisions about what to put into their mouths. Food categories have become increasingly blurred, and claims on plant-based proteins have not been clearly regulated. Organics, free-range and other raising claim categories are overseen by the Australian Consumer Law, while nutritional and compositional labelling are overseen by the Department of Health. However, the Department of Health does not have matching, policing or investigative powers. The growth of new protein categories, such as plant-based, cultured and blended animal and plant-based proteins, are recognised as providing consumers with new sources of protein. An increasing world population and pressure on arable farming land by encroaching urban zoning are competing needs that are in part addressed by manufactured proteins. The perception of competition between the traditional category of meat protein and manufactured plant-based protein was not borne out in consumer or co consumption trends. It appears that the two categories are growing in size in line with the growing hungry world, and it is in Australia's interests to be a part of the growth of both sectors, utilising our reputation as a producer of high-quality produce, both animal and plant, and high food standards. What is missing is the clarity for the consumer. While industry sectors will argue the relative benefits of one over another by nutrition, sustainability and environmental standards, the consumer is not benefited if the labelling does not clearly define which category the product belongs to. Consumers are increasingly well informed and educated as to ingredient and nutrition labelling, but the use of animal terms and imagery on plant-based products is not adding to the ease of use of busy consumers. While it appears most plant-based protein product manufacturers do use clear labelling and terms, such as plant-based burger, there are no labelling standards to ensure that animal terms or images are not used on plant-based protein product packaging. Anecdotally, since this inquiry began, awareness of this issue has grown, has grown considerably following the associated consultation and media interest. This may explain why groups such as the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and the Food and Grocery Council stated that they had little or no feedback, yet media reports and consumer surveys had thousands of responses. However, the committee heard that since Food Standards Australia New Zealand for ZANS made changes to section 1.1.1 to 13 
the Food Code in 2016, labelling and claims on plant-based proteins have not been clearly regulated. The agricultural industry spoke of their frustration of a consultation process on the proposed change in 2016, which focused solely on dairy products, meaning other affected industries, including the meat industry, were not consulted on the changes or even made aware until the proposed changes were signalled by a media release. The result is that the definitions for dairy were altered to allow manufactured products to use animal terms and appropriate implied claims of equivalency. This pathway has subsequently been used by manufactured plant-based proteins. As the new protein category in Australia expands from plant-based to cultured, trialling in Japan and others, and blended animal and plant proteins, Australia has an opportunity to identify the best regulator, health, consumer or other, and mandatory labelling requirements. Domestic labelling guidelines are important to protect the existing and significant export market, which has clear definitions of meat, and to protect the new protein market. Categories such as organic and free range may also be seeking greater clarity on labelling claims, and it is important that there is a national standard that aligns with mandatory export standards found in existing legislation. The alignment between domestic and international standards will provide all stakeholders with clear guidance and enforcement by the ACCC, which has the powers and resources to address improper labelling and marketing practices. People are more diet conscious now than ever before, whether it be to avoid allergic reactions, to watch their waistline or to show care for how or from where their food is sourced. And this is why we have labels on foods, and this is why we have long-established definitions for foods. Wrong definitions could literally be the difference between life and death for some people. The Senate inquiry into meat definitions is important. It's why the coalition is, in, is interested in it. The rise of plant-based proteins has been exponential. Therefore, the need to clearly define what a food is has grown in importance. Organic food consumers want certainty and definitions. Vegans would be mortified to find out their vegetable lasagna contained meat, and likewise those wanting animal proteins would be bitterly disappointed to know that instead of a simple piece of beef, they had bought a highly processed plant alternative. The inquiry didn't seek to influence food choices. It aimed to make these choices easier and clearer. And during the hearings, we saw some extraordinary and, at times, dishonest lengths to which some plant protein makers go to market their products. Terms normally associated with animals were displayed on packaging in big letters and barely visible are the words plant-based or meat-free. The packaging also features the animals that are not used in the food. If you're a person who has English as a second language, is dyslexic, has poor eyesight, has a disability, word association and imagery are important tools to use when choosing food. You may not recognise the word fillet, but you would see the word beef and a cow in the package and be fairly confident that the food is beef. However, if the word beef is in large letters and the word plant-based are in small letters and there's a picture of a cow on the pack, you can see how these compromised consumers would be misled into choosing a fillet of plant-based protein. The same applies to people who are simply time poor, very common in today's world. world. You see the word chicken on a box, picture of a chicken, grab it and race home, only to find you'd grabbed a vegetarian product. Now, critics of this inquiry have scoffed that people should learn to read or they should choose a plant-based product, then they just have to be more careful. But people choose what they eat for a range of very good reasons. The term buy beware would appear to hold some weight, but I would argue that it shouldn't apply to people wanting simple truth in labelling. Other criticisms of the inquiry included that we should also change the name of baby oil, peanut butter <coughs> and hot dogs, because those products didn't contain babies, butter or dogs. I laughed at first, but then I realised these people were serious. And the argument fails because these products aren't trying to market themselves as containing babies, butter or dogs, whereas many vegetable products were trying to pass themselves off as containing meat from animals. The best example of, uh, in common usage today of substituted terms is margarine, a product undoubtedly sold as a butter substitute 
but which has its own unmistakable and clearly visible name. An issue for consumers is the fact that plant-based proteins are processed, contains chemicals you've possibly never heard of, uh, and are not uh, nutritionally equivalent. This isn't an issue of consumers, uh, if consumers know what they're eating, but the committee did have a concern that plant-based proteins are marketed as being more healthy than animal protein when plant proteins uh, do contain uh, chemicals and additives compared to animal products. It's not just consumers who deserve to know what they're eating. The animal industry deserves free air to market its products. Since 1997, about $5 billion has been collected from red meat producers in the form of levies which are used to fund research, development and marketing of red meat as safe, healthy and nutritious. But this work is undermined uh, if the industry is not allowed to protect its own descriptions and names. Last year, Impossible Foods CEO Pat Brown was quoted as saying he wants to end all animal farming by 2035. And this goal adds a sinister element to the sector deliberately trying to equate its products with animal products. The committee acknowledges the submissions and testimony uh, from all who took the time to give evidence. I'd like to thank the witnesses who gave testimony and the many interested parties who made written submissions. And it is only by having robust discussions that we can achieve harmony and clarity. Uh, I also want to thank the committee members, including uh, the co-chair, Glenn Stirl, Senator Wish Wilson, for their diligence and interest, and I commend this report. Uh, Senator MacDonald, just before you resume your seat, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks or are you moving to, to take note of the report? I'm moving to take note of the thank report. You. Thank you. Did anybody else wish to speak on this actual report? Uh, I saw Senator Wish Wilson first on this particular report. Senator Roberts, so I'll come to you. Um, Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, th thanks, Chair. Um, I also participated in this inquiry, and, um, and I, mean, I mean this genuinely, and I, I really wish I didn't have to say it, but in the 10 years I've been in uh, this Senate, um, this was the biggest waste of time and taxpayers' money uh, that I have seen, this inquiry. And I, I want to note, firstly, Senator MacDonald, um, that very unusually, this inquiry didn't come as a reference inquiry, which it should have, so that the Senate would have voted on it, including Senator MacDonald's colleagues. This came uh, as a reference inquiry dressed up as a legislation committee inquiry. So uh, Senator MacDonald herself put this through the legislation committee with no discussion or democratic process with other senators, and then she chaired it herself. Um, and I don't I've, and I've said to the, uh, the Labor Party only a month or so ago, I do not think it's good process in the Senate for governments to put up their own uh, references, inquiries and write their own reports. Uh, and I participated as much as I could and it was a conga line of farmers that, and I felt bad for the farmers because I think some of them generally thought there was an opportunity to actually get regulatory change here from this inquiry. It was an opportunity for Senator Macdonald and the National Party to call on some of their uh, you know, rusted on uh, constituency and come to present evidence on how um, plant-based foods are somehow a threat to their existence and to their livelihoods. And I, I, gen I, I, I admit today that I could tell there was some genuine anger and frustration from some of these uh, stakeholders. Um, but I felt very sad that they were drawn into some kind of culture war uh, that was never going to deliver an outcome for them, because there was no substantive evidence presented at all that the labelling on plant-based food is somehow undermining uh, the red meat industry or uh, animal, uh, animal agriculture. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, details were laid out by a number of uh, witnesses, um, including the CSIRO and others, credible witnesses, uh, that said that the plant-based sector, yes, has a very bright future, and I think that's something we should all be celebrating, no matter our political colour, because it's jobs for farmers, uh, and it's uh, Australian exports, and it's gross national product, and a whole bunch of other things, as well as providing choice and alternatives for people. Um, but we also heard that the red meat industry, for example, has also got massive growth projections 
uh, in the years and decades to come. And this was nothing but a thinly disguised attack on the plant-based food industry. And it made me very sad to see the Senate and taxpayers' money being used for this. Um, it's fine if we actually felt like somehow we were going to get some regulatory change around labelling. I actually do think we need change around labelling, by the way. I think we need to have good seafood labelling because we see imports of seafood. We don't know where the fish has come from, how it was caught, what gear was used, where it was landed, um, whether slave labour was attached to it. Um, and our Australian fishing industries are competing with these products where we actually know very little about them. There are some very urgent labelling uh, uh, challenges if we want to look at that and look at changes to regulations and legislation, not to mention much better um, chain of custody labelling around Australian made food as well. Uh, we've seen through and I've been on two inquiries before that's looked at labelling changes uh, and we've got some changes to our labels that show what's an Australian product and what's not, but they don't go anywhere near far enough. But here we have an inquiry uh, that actually is designed, in my opinion, to be set up to attack the plant-based food industry. Um, and there are enormous opportunities for Australian farmers in plant-based food. Most farmers are diversified. They have, yes, they might be running cattle or, or sheep, but they also potentially grow chickpeas uh, or soybeans or a whole range of other products. And it's ironic that uh, the example that was used by Senator Macdonald that uh, a vegan would be horrified if they were f to find mints uh, in, their, you know, in their lasagna that they bought, and yes, they would be, um, and that therefore you know, someone who goes to buy a steak would be horrified that somehow they're eating a fake steak. Well, that's a very poor comparison because it's pretty obvious that plant-based foods are put in the forms of burgers. There are no alternatives to, for example, a steak, which is the example that was constantly raised throughout the Senate inquiry. And burgers, you're probably likely to find almost as much vegetable protein and other matter uh, and a whole range of other additives in meat burgers as you are in a vegetable burger. They are full of vegetables, uh, as are a number of other meat products. Of course, when we got into that in the inquiry, no one wanted to talk about it. It's no wonder that plant-based burgers, for example, are doing very well on the markets with the flexitarian uh, uh, consumers, people who want to reduce their consumption of meat but aren't vegan or vegetarian, because they actually taste like meat. Uh, they've got the same protein as meat. They've been designed uh, very carefully uh, to appeal to people who, who like meat, and they provide choice. Um, and they come in the form of a burger and some other very clearly labelled uh, packets. There's no way you could mistake uh, a, a chicken fillet for a fake or alternative uh, uh, plant-based product. Um, I agree that um, there potentially should be some changes around the use of uh, animal logos on some of these products, but we still heard anecdotal evidence. And sometimes it was the farmers themselves who were saying that they, they want to see massive changes to labelling uh, or they don't want to see alternative meat products or plant-based meat products sold in the same aisles as meat products because they accidentally picked up a, you know, um, a, a, a vegan chicken vindaloo when they wanted to get a normal one. We never got any real evidence that this is a significant problem. So. Um, I'm not sure where it's going to go from here. The Greens have put in a very detailed dissenting report uh, that uh, talks about um, the definition of meat and other animal products, uh, the consumer understanding of the animal products, the regulatory framework, including Australian consumer law, uh, and what uh, would need to be done from here, um, and what would need to be done to actually help promote um, the uh, opportunities for the protein sector across the board. Uh, and this is something I think that uh, Australians would be very interested in because they are increasingly uh, eating plant-based products. And if we are going to feed the planet this century, we know we have a lot of challenges uh, and that we know plant-based foods will help provide the protein that we need, uh, including in many uh, third world countries. Uh, it's been named up by CSIRO and other people as one of the biggest investment opportunities 
for, for farmers and for investment companies uh, wanting to uh, get into exciting areas where there are opportunities from tackling environmental problems. And of course, uh, the uh, Meat and Livestock Australia and other groups recognise that they have to decarbonise. They recognise that consumers out there uh, have concerns about the carbon footprint of their products, and they are also, I hope, looking at what they can do to actually uh, reduce their carbon footprints and reduce emissions from their sectors. Because um, consumers or customers are voting with their feet. They are voting with their feet, uh, and they are seeking out alternative products. So um, I would recommend senators, uh, if they are interested in this, uh, don't just read um, the government's own report into its own inquiry, which went through uh, the Legislation Committee without any scrutiny from the Senate. Uh, please also read the Greens' dissenting report, uh, which I think provides a much more balanced uh, assessment of this, uh, this topic. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek to take note of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee additional information, don't mince words, definitions of meat and other animal products report. And I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Reynolds, are you on this report or a different, different report? Okay, so. Thank you. Just one moment, Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is leave granted as requested by Senator Roberts? Um, there being no objections, leave is granted. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate uh, take note of document number five, Senator Interests Standing Committee Register of Senators' Interests, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Um, I I believe that concludes documents and committee reports, and I understand that there are no ministerial statements and no committee memberships, uh, and so we're moving to messages from the House. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence, Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022 and Jobs and Skills Australia National Skills Commissioner Repeal Bill 2022. I call the Minister. Thank you. I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. Uh, the, the question is that the bills be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Jobs and Skills Australia Bill 2022, Jobs and Skills Australia National Skills Commissioner Repeal Bill 2022. The Minister. Thank you. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bills and move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. I move that the question is that the debate be now adjourned. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I move that the resumption of the debate be in order of the day for a later hour. Uh, the question is as moved uh, by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The, the ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the Social Security and Other Legislation Amendment, Self-Employment Programs and Other Measures Bill 2022 without amendment. I call the clerk. Uh, government Business Order for Day Number 1, Social Security Administration Amendment, Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. Resumption of debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Senator Hume. Acting Deputy President, uh, I finished my contribution by saying that I was very worried that the government's motives for this legislation are dismissing the fact that when faced with very difficult challenges, 
we need not let the perfect get in the way of the good. And in fact, as one stakeholder put it, the cashless debit card is not a silver bullet, but it is something, and we can build on it. In fact, the cashless debit card is an advanced technology that's accepted now at more than one million businesses right across Australia. Uh, that's far more than the less than 16,000 merchants that accept the basics card that's operating under, that was operating under the former Labor government. It's a very practical tool. It's a practical tool that assists users to manage their money, and it helps people to focus on what it is that they need to deliver better health outcomes for individuals and, most importantly, positive change in their communities. The critics of the card will say that the increased stigma of welfare recipients its that, that prevents their, their freedom of choice and that it's discriminatory or it's based specifically on Indigenous communities. Well, that's not right, so let's get the facts straight. In fact, the cashless debit card looks and operates just like a regular bank card. It cannot be used to withdraw cash or to buy alcohol, to buy gambling products and also some specific gift cards that would enable the two former items. Importantly, the cashless debit card does not change the amount of money that people receive from the government. In fact, welfare payments for Sejuna, for Goldfields, for East Kimberley and Bundaberg and Harvey Bay region participants are allocated 20 per cent in their regular bank account and then 80 per cent onto their cashless debit card. In the Northern Territory, uh, participants receive the same payment split that they received under income management. And in most cases, the cashless debit card participants in the Northern Territory receive their welfare payment allocation with 50 per cent in their regular bank account and 50 per cent in the cashless debit card. In the Cape York region in Queensland, participants receive the same payment split that they received on income management. Um, and users can operate internet banking and they can tap and pay with their cards. Over 17,000 participants are now using the cashless debit card, and it isn't an insignificant number given the populations of the locations in which the card operates. In fact, the communities where the cashless debit card has been employed, which is Sejuna, East Kimberley, Goldfields in Western Australia, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, Cape York, they have disproportionately high incidences of drug and alcohol-related issues, and they also include higher than average rates of social security dependency and even intergenerational social security dependency. An independent impact evaluation by the University of Adelaide released in 2021 looked into the cashless debit card, and it found that 25 per cent of people reported that they are they're drinking less since the introduction of the cashless debit card's introduction. 21 per cent of CDC participants reported gambling less with the cash that was previously used for gambling, now spent, instead spent on essentials such as food. And 45 per cent of cashless debit card participants reported that it improved things for themselves and for their families. In fact, more than a dozen evaluations of income management have proved, provided consistent evidence about welfare quarantining. And most importantly, it's a dramatic improvement on what existed before. The basics card, which was operated under the former Labor government, could only be used in certain stores and it was less flexible in terms of operation. The cashless debit card operates in communities regardless. The Labor, Labor has walked away from each of these cashless uh, debit card participants and from their communities. Now, For the coalition, this is not about ideology. It's about what works. It's about what people want. But unfortunately, despite these positive results, Labor is now abolishing the program. And even more concerning, it's clear that the decision was taken without consultation of the communities that this program mostly benefits. While some of these amendments that have been discussed today, um, we know that there's been amendments that have moved, been moved to allow Cape York CDC trial sites and some of those, um, and those people in the NT that have voluntary, tr voluntarily transitioned from the basics card onto the CDC to remain on the CDC, um, while some of these amendments do go uh, uh, some way to walk back this unfortunate policy. The intention of the bill is to repeal the cashless debit card, which was put into communities as an important financial management tool to help improve people's lives, and particularly the lives of some of Australia's most vulnerable. So, in concluding my remarks, just let me reinforce just how disappointed I am that the government is seeking to extend the basics card in the Northern Territory without consultation and without transparency whilst at the same time seeking to wind back the cashless debit card. 
So even though government is seeking to walk back its bill with the amendments that are being moved and the provisioning of $50 million for additional drug and alcohol support services, because they themselves now realise the significant issues that will come if this critical program is watered down or repeated, the evidence clearly shows that the cashless debit card is a significant piece of welfare infrastructure in the communities in which it operates. More importantly, it is working. And the idea that it would be repealed is a callous act of this government and should not be removed or to undermine the importance and effective government. It shouldn't be removed because of the importance of the effectiveness of the program. And the government should be rightly condemned for its act to do so. Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, it's with great sadness that I rise to speak on the repeal of the cashless debit card, which currently is used by over 4,000 fellow West Australians in the goldfields and the East Kimberley regions. These are unquestionably some of our state's most vulnerable people. I've gone through a wide range of emotions since the introduction of this ill-conceived and botched piece of legislation, from disbelief to great anger and sadness now for the inevitable uh, results that this will cause on the lives of so many Australians. The cashless debit card was introduced by the previous coalition government as a means of ensuring that those receiving welfare payments were spending taxpayers' money on the necessities such as food, household bills and clothes, and not on habits that enable destructive lifestyles. And this is one thing that I think those opposites have seemed to have forgotten, that it is not just about the life of the person on the card. It is also about the lives that they impact. So it is about the women, the children and the elderly in their lives that have more money and are subject to far less violence uh, than they had been. And I still cannot get my head around the pious self-righteousness of colleagues on the other side who have callously put ideology above the needs of Australia's most vulnerable. It is my opinion and that of those on this side of the chamber that the card should be extended and not repealed. It is truly mind-blowing just how incompetent the new government has managed this issue. As we kept hearing from those opposite, this was a policy we took to the election. Well, they may have taken the policy to the election, uh, but they certainly didn't take an implementation plan to the election. They certainly didn't take any consultation to the election, and they certainly had none of that uh, after the election when they introduced this legislation. And in fact, there is no evidence that they consulted properly consulted with any of the communities who chose, who chose to have the CDC in their electorates. And then how they could think that those in this place and the other place would allow them to steamroll such appalling legislation through uh, this place without having and then being forced to have the quickest uh, of all possible uh, inquiries. And since then, the government has been forced into, as we'll hear shortly in the committee stage of this bill, into embarrassing backflips time and time again. But these are concessions that they're now making because they've botched it the whole way along, again impacting on over 14,000 Australian lives. They've botched it and they're now about to make it worse. Because what they don't realise, and clearly you have never been up to any of these communities, saying, oh, well, look, we'll make it optional. But if you're an abused woman who is on the card, what do you think your, other, what do you think your partner is going to do? Say, oh, yes, no problem. You just keep that card. Don't worry about giving me the cash. It makes women in particular more vulnerable than less vulnerable, and shame on you. You've forced yourself into making these ill-considered and certainly not consulted amendments. It is a disgrace. So now we've seen the Labor government on the run make new amendments to this legislation, which we're about to uh, debate shortly. Again, 
you are better to withdraw this legislation rather than try and steamroll these ill-conceived amendments that will make people's life even worse than what you are proposing to do in the first place. Despite these new amendments, the intention of the bill still is to repeal the cashless debit card, which was put into communities as an important financial management tool. Again, it is all about helping our most vulnerable. And then those opposite were trying to say, well, the Australian National Audit Office recommended that it be repealed. Well, please bring in that report and show us exactly where the ANAO said that this should be repealed. Because on our side, we can find nowhere where the ANAO report said that it needed to be repealed. That is simply a lie. That is simply a great big fib by multiple members opposite. The reduction of taxpayer-funded access to drugs, alcohol and gambling products has significantly reduced alcohol and drug abuse, assaults, rapes and murder. The evidence is there. Now, those opposite during the debate have been saying, oh, well, we haven't been able to find anyone to, you know, to really talk to to tell us about this. Well, if you don't go out and talk to the communities, of course you're not going to find anybody to comment on this. Again, you, it, with undue, with ungodly haste, shunted the inquiry through this place for the, from the committee, and you did not visit one of the trial sites and talk to one member in my own home state of Western Australia. So, of course, you didn't find anybody in Western Australia because you didn't go and talk to them. So, after all of this backlash, the Albanese government has finally conceded abolishing the cashless debit card. Oh, gee, golly gosh, will lead to more violence, more alcohol and drug abuse, childhood neglect, and violence in vulnerable communities, including, of course, in my home state of Western Australia. Now, their announcement of nearly $50 million for alcohol and drug treatment service is a complete admission of failure of this policy, that it will cause more harm and that more of the support will be required as a direct result of what they were proposing. So shame on the Labor government for doing what they have done, leaving great uncertainty in these communities amongst Australia's most vulnerable. And then, surprise, surprise, at the 11th hour, very shortly in this place, they're coming in with amendments which admit they were wrong. But these are amendments that haven't, that haven't been consulted across any of these communities. So the government has introduced this atrocious legislation without regard or consultation of those that it will impact the most. So much for an Indigenous voice. So much for an Indigenous voice. We have had two amazing Indigenous senators. Uh, Senator Nampa Jimpa Price and Senator Little, they have spoken with first hand knowledge. And anybody who listened to Senator Nampa Jimpa Price tell about her own personal experience with this, and you still think that this card is good, you have no heart and you have no shame. This ideological opposition to the CDC will leave thousands of Australians vulnerable. So let me make it very clear. This government and this parliament has not consulted with Western Australians who have, uh, who have this card and who have chosen to have this card in their communities. So, Given that the cashless debit card is only being used in six places, and two of them are in Western Australia, in the East Kimberley and the Goldfields regions, the inquiry, this Senate's inquiry conducted not a single, not one, hearing in either the Kimberley or the East Goldfields. Right. Not one. And not only that, when they were finally forced to actually consult, they were shamed into forced into consulting with uh, some of these regions. Guess how many days? Guess how many days the local councils got to deal with and to provide some input? Three days, three walking, working days to comment on four documents. Now that is not genuine consultation, and that is a disgrace. So the East Kimberley as a whole was the site with most, where the most problems were reported, and they were reported before the introduction of the CDC. And it was also the site that reported the strongest positive change. 
particularly in relation to alcohol. East Kimberley was the site affected by the most severe alcohol problems, but has been the site that has demonstrably recorded the greatest reduction since the introduction of the card. The CDC was very positive in preventing humbugging. Those vulnerable people who are subject to humbugging by their family and by their friends, their lives have been improved by the cashless debit card, because no longer can their relatives come and put their hand out and ask for money when they have cash. They can no longer stand at the ATM waiting for that money to come out and take it away from mothers and children. That is one of the benefits of this card. So I'd just like to conclude on a couple of comments from leaders in my own home state of Western Australia, both from the Kimberley, the East Kimberley and also the Goldfields. People who those opposite and this Senate committee really obviously make no effort to talk to. So the first one is the Mayor of Kalgoorlie Boulder, John Bowler. And he said this, it almost seems that they Labor are putting the cart before the horse. The Shire of Laverton said the lack of consultation is profound on the government's part and the words and the rhetoric do not go well for the future of Laverton. And as local governments do, we will pick up the pieces with other state government agencies who work under trying conditions and see the community continue. The CDC has brought some sanity to the people's lives, as most of the spending allocation is to purchase food, food for women and children and the elderly and the other essentials of life. Is this submission the motive? Yes, it is. It is because we believe and have seen firsthand the benefits of the CDC and the impact upon Laverton, for which I have called home for over 65 years, and the generation before me as Shire President. Ian Truss, the director of the fabulous Woonan Foundation in Kununurra, who knows firsthand his, uh, the foundation deal with the health and the, lively, and the lives of so many in the East Kimberley. And Ian has said this, it reduces the alcohol violence and the harassment of the elderly and the vulnerable for cash when they go to use the ATM. The cashless card is not a silver bullet, but it is something we can build on. But now there is no plan as to what happens after the CDC is abolished. We are now left in a vacuum. The government, so he also went on to say the government says if we want to go down that path of keeping income management that it has to be a community decision. But there is no information about how they want us to arrive at that decision or what the replacement could be. Classic Labor policy on the run, on the back of a coaster, a great idea, but with nothing behind it. It is inconceivable to me and I know to all of us on this side of the chamber that any government or any senator would knowingly inflict more pain and suffering on vulnerable women, children and elders. But that is exactly what this piece of botched legislation that Labor are about to now to seek to amend, that will make it even worse than it currently is. All I can say is shame on every one of you because we know we know what, the, what will be happening out in communities uh, if this passes here today. It will be more grog. It will be more violence. It will be more rapes. It will be more abuse. It will be more child neglect. And it will be more murder and death. You cannot say you were not warned. You cannot say you did not know. And yet you continue to push this based on blind ideology. Shame on you all. Thank you, Mr. Pre Deputy President. Senator Cadell. Deputy President, somewhere in Australia today, a child woke up, put on fresh clothes and sat down to a breakfast because of a cashless debit card. Somewhere in Australia this afternoon, a wife or partner won't be trembling in fear of a man coming home, grogged up and ready to fight because of the cashless debit card. And somewhere in Australia tonight, some elderly people will sleep soundly, knowing they were unlikely to be robbed or rolled for cash because of the cashless debit card. And today, we are being asked to vote to take that away from them. Mr Deputy President, 
I must believe that we as a chamber are better than that, and I have to believe that I as a person am better than that. Today, I would like to talk about two things. How did we come to the point that this chamber, filled with people that care about Australia and Australians, are about to throw some vulnerable people to the wolves? And what are the realities of dealing with these displaced communities? In looking for why people do things, I always look at the motive behind the actions. In this case, maybe contrary to some others, I get that those opposite took this policy to the election. I understand it and I respect that they are trying to meet those undertakings they made. I also get at the time, without all the information, they may have felt that the card was inequitable. I can see where that might have come from. But I also understand that whilst you can't expect people to change their minds, you can ask them to make a new decision with new information. And as brief as the inquiry was, it came up with the new information in this process must at a minimum be paused. I won't be going into the stats that many trotted out or the quotes of Noel Pearson that I've probably heard about 20 times in defence of the card here today. But I want those opposite to go and just read some of the powerful testimonies of those directly affected. Not the agencies, not the industries and not the vested interests, but the people. Imagine their faces when they are talking about the better life they have had without fear. Imagine the hope that they have had for life with less crime and better health. And imagine those same faces when we are telling them we are going to take that away. I accept that this was not the intention of this legislation when it was first considered. I can see the care that all in this chamber have for the people that this affects. But that is why. I ask if a couple of weeks in an inquiry can point out these issues, why don't we take a couple of months to try and find a better way to fix it? Mr Deputy Chair, why does this have to happen this way? Why does this have to happen on this day? I know by the proposed amendments that have been introduced that there is an acceptance that perhaps from the other side this is not as cut and dry as first thought. I can see by the looks on some of the faces opposite that even with them, it's something that still sits uneasy because of some unexpected consequences. What happens if that child can't go to school because we pass this? What happens if those elders get robbed because we pass this? What happens if that lady gets bashed or worse because we pass this? We need to get this right. And I accept that there are some flaws in the cashless debit card. It is not perfect and it can be improved. But I also know that this legislation and the rust amendments are not the way to do it. Let's take the time and do this properly. These displaced communities suffer from the double barrel of disadvantage. Cultural displacement and geographical distance. It is not hard to see that if I were located miles from anywhere, with little hope of employment or distraction, that I'd probably hit the cans and have a punt. To what end, I don't know. Throw on top of that an Indigenous communities for their displacement from culture and generational neglect, and it only gets worse. These things are not fixed by taking away something that at least had some impact. These things are not fixed by tokens or platitudes. We have said sorry. We have closed the gap. We are trying to find a voice, but all the time the problems just get worse. Mr Deputy Speaker, today I spoke to Mr Mark Lockyer and I tell this story of his family with his permission. Just two months ago, his niece, Alina Kukla, and his son, Orlando, were shot in an apparent murder-suicide at 16 Mile Camp near Alice Springs. The apparent perpetrator, the toddler's father, had a history of violence of women and had been drinking earlier all day with the victim. As bad as all that is, the only witness was Mr Kukla's older son, Ms Kukla's older son, at all of three years old. After seeing that and losing his mother, 
he can add another couple of barrels to the challenge that will face him in his life. But where was the national outrage for this? Where was the media coverage of this horrible crime? It was nowhere because it is too difficult for us to face that, despite all our best intentions and billions of dollars spent over a decade, that this problem still exists. And in the absence of answers, we give silence and throw more guilt cash at the community so we can pretend we are making a difference. But let's face it, we are not. We are asked to do that again today, with another $50 million being allocated as part of an amendment that acknowledges there will be increased crime and there will be increased alcoholism because of this bill. A coroner's report has found that 65 Aboriginal women have been killed by their partners just in the Northern Territory since 2000, and we hear nothing and do nothing. Justice Judith Kelly noted that whilst everyone is willing to talk about the over-representation of Aboriginal men in prison, but, as I have said before, and I quote, the stream of Aboriginal men going to prison is matched by a steady stream, a river, of Aboriginal women going into the hospital and the morgue. During a 2016 episode of Q&A, Professor Marsha Langdon said domestic violence suffered by Aboriginal women ranged from between 34 times national average and up to 80 at the worst. This was later checked by ABC Fact Check and found to be broadly true. The problems facing these regional Aboriginal communal communities is real and monstrous. They are very different to the problems faced by similar communities in the cities. They are harder to see and harder to solve. The withdrawal of this card will be the second blow to many of these communities after the revocation of the alcohol ban by the Northern Territory. Alina, Kukla and Orlando deserve better than that. That is why I cannot support this bill, even with the amendments. And that, Mr. Pres Deputy President, is why I ask again, delay the bill, enlarge the inquiry and come back to this place with legislation that is designed to make a difference, not tick a box. Thank you. Senator Rennick. Thank you, uh, uh, Dep Mr Deputy President. Uh, uh, I, too, rise to speak on the cashless debit card, and I want to touch on the scourge of addiction. Uh, I know that uh, there's been a lot of discussion about other issues in other areas, but I, I think that one of the strengths of a cashless debit card is um, and to enable, uh, you know, or help people uh, get off uh, you know, their addiction, whatever that may be, whether it's drinking, gambling or drugs. And I know from my experience, I was talking to a pastor at Harvey Bay who works with food banks and he said when the cashless debit card was introduced up at Harvey Bay, thanks to the hard work of uh, the member for Hinkler, Keith Pitt, uh, that the, the length of the food lines dropped dramatically. And the feedback that he was getting uh, was that a, a lot of um, people who were previously addicted basically had no other choice but to get off uh, whatever their addiction was and food was being put on uh, you know, the table, uh, which was a, a pleasant change um, uh, for many families. So, uh, look, this has been touched on a lot, but I think um, the importance, you know, it's, and look, the idea of making the card voluntary, you know, I think there was some merit in that, but the problem is you try telling that to an addict uh, and you know they just won't go down the path of um, you know choosing uh, self-control. I'll always take the cash, um, you know, because obviously a lot of things like drugs, for example, are only traded on the black market, so they'd need cash. Uh, so um, and you know, but I will point out, you know, I've always had a big issue with Labor Party and gambling um, in my home state of Queensland. I grew up uh, in a small town of Chinchilla. In the 70s and 80s, it was only a small town of 3,000 people at the time. It's now almost 8,000 people, uh, much, much bigger than it was. And I grew up in my hometown, had a maternity ward, but we didn't have poker machines. Uh, and when the Goss Labor government got in uh, in the early 90s, the first thing they did was introduce poker machines into the state. 
uh, and then proceeded to sell all of our infrastructure. So now our state, our services, my hometown basically has lost its maternity ward, it's lost its councils, uh, the roads out there just uh, continue to deteriorate uh, and, it, and it's basically being left behind. And I, I think that you know, the Labor politicians uh, should reflect, certainly from my home state, should reflect on the scourge of gambling and poker machines that they've introduced uh, into the state of Queensland and just think, well, you know, if they themselves, because they're not in the state government, can't repeal those poker machines, maybe the least that they can do to try to uh, reduce the scourge of, of poker machine, uh, online poker machine, well, sorry, gambling um, is, uh, with poker machines is to actually uh, reflect on whether or not this cashless debit card would help uh, reduce the number of uh, addicts uh, who are addicted to gambling in, in pubs. And as someone who you know, didn't in, uh, enjoy a pint quite a lot in my early days, I can't tell you how much I hate a pub full of poker machines. It just kills the atmosphere uh, uh, greatly. So uh, I'll, I'll keep my statement remarks very brief. Um, but I, I do think there's a lot of merit in keeping the cashless debit card. I, I don't think it's a question of you know, being punitive for the sake of punitive. Uh, or anything like that. I, I think it's got the best intentions. Um, ultimately, the other, the other thing too is, you know, when you are addicted, um, it is very hard to, you know, if you're, if you're spending time on drugs or in front of the, you know, uh, you know, the pub drinking or, or uh, with the gambling machine, um, you know, you're more inclined, less inclined to go and look for work. Uh, whereas if, you know, you suddenly have your card pulled away from you, you know, your cash pulled away, you might go, well, I actually might have to get a job to get some some cash, so I can, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, continue uh, to do whatever I want to do. So, obviously, you know, I think that the, the benefits uh, outweigh the, um, you know, any, any downside with this card, and, and I th thoroughly uh, would urge uh, those on the other side to reflect on the potential damage that the repeal of this cashless debit card could cause, in not just Indigenous communities, but in, you know, uh, poorer communities across Australia. Uh, and especially regional towns. Uh, so I'll, I'll conclude with that, but I will foreshadow uh, the second reading amendment uh, number 1665 uh, in Senator Rustin's name uh, as circulated in the chamber. Thank you. Senator Lambie. And Deputy President, thank you. I've visited the cashless debit card trials, trial sites many times. I can tell you life is not easy for people in Sejuna, Bundaberg, the East Kimberley and the Goldfields. I've seen the poverty, I've seen the family violence, the alcohol abuse. I wanted the cashless debit card to fix those things. It didn't. It didn't get the results I hoped it would. That's why the card is going. Right now, whatever happens to this bill, everyone in the trial sites is coming off the card this December. The card is gone. It's gone because two years ago, I didn't give Morrison the vote he needed to make it permanent. Honestly, it's one of the hardest choices I've ever had to make in this place because I desperately wanted the car to work. I wanted to see life get better for people in those trial sites. I wanted to give people an out from addiction and welfare dependency, give them a way to manage, way, a way to manage their money and fight their worst impulses. I did that because I know what it's like to be on welfare and I know what it's like to live with an addict. I wanted the card to work because I wanted to fix fix things for people like me and my family. But the truth is, the coalition government set the card up for success. The, co the, the truth is, the coalition government did not set the card up for, up for success, and that is why it failed. You know, I always said to them, if you want to, want to help people, you've got to have a carrot and a stick. You can't just punish people. You can't just, you can't just have a stick. You need the carrot so people know there's light at the end of the tunnel. There's reward. It's called reward. That there's a pathway to make their lives better if they want to take it. The former coalition government, they were good at the stick. They were crap at the rest. They put the card in. That was a stick. There was no carrot. They never put in the work to help people get off welfare, get off the card and into a decent job. They didn't set up residential rehab facilities for alcoholics and ice addicts. They didn't they didn't get proper, real jobs into trial sites or help businesses get off the ground. They just chucked the magic card at people. They expected the card to fix everything. That was the only effort they wanted to put in. That's it. Just a plastic card. Well, that card couldn't fix anything by itself. 
It was never going to be successful. It was never going to work. I set it up to fail, and fail it did. And that's why the card is going. Not because of anybody else in this Senate. Seven years. Seven years you had. And you failed miserably. That's why I voted against back then making this card permanent. The coalition have no one to blame but yourselves. And here's the thing, taking the card away isn't a good one either. That's not going to fix it either. Because when that card goes, the problems in the trial sites won't disappear. They'll only get worse. Those problems aren't going anywhere. The alcohol abuse, the drug abuse, the violence, the hopelessness, that all stays and it gets worse. That's the saddest thing for me. The card's going somewhere. It's going in the bin. It's going in the bin because, let's be honest, the coalition has trashed it. Seven years in the making and you trashed it. What should have been gold, you trashed. Taking the card away doesn't fix that. I can tell you how worried I am about that because if the coalition expected the card to fix everything, Labor seems to think ripping it out will fix everything too. It won't. You can't pull this thing out from under people and walk away like that, like it's your job's done. The kids and the families in those trial sites, they deserve better than that. I've met those kids and those families. I know their faces. I know what their lives look like. With or without the card, they aren't getting the opportunities in life that they deserve. We can't leave them to figure it out on their own. Every single one of us in this place has a responsibility to do better by those people. If this bill passes tonight, that will, be, that will not be my job done. It will be the start of our working day, not the time, not time to clock off, I can assure you. Because I will be running around those trial sites and I expect to be back here within six months telling you you have done a disastrous job. That's the Labor Party. Not only did you kill the card off, the mess that you are going to make on top of that is going to be absolutely disastrous. I've written to the minister to ask her to work with me on four issues. Here's the first one. Make sure services in the trial sites actually work. Because I can tell you public servants love paying for services for poor people. I've never known a public servant who doesn't think all the world's problems could be fixed with more services and more cash. Like Noel Pearson said, public servants see a problem, they grab their four-wheel drive, they grab their wide-brimmed hats, they set up someone with a clipboard and fax machine, and they reckon their job's done. Seriously. That's what I saw on the trial sites over and over again. It was devastating. That's where you did waste money. You shouldn't have bothered sending them, because they couldn't sell anything, let alone themselves. Plenty of money for services, no thought about whether the services actually worked. Take Sejuna as a great example here. Sejuna has a number of cashed up services that were set up as part of the cashless debit card trial. You can get a free breakfast whenever you want in Sejuna. You can hang out at the community centre and do arts and crafts. And the best you get from your local TAFE is a shirt close on first aid, and that's on a good day. If you're a heavy drinker in Sejuna, you can go to the Sobering Up Centre for a safe bed to sleep at that night. As a matter of fact, you can go there every night if you want. You can wake up and they'll even give you breakfast. How's that helping you? It's great, isn't it? There's no rehab if you want to get over your addiction and there's no psychological support. No residential facilities for you to break out of your bad habits. And if you want to go to rehab, you'll have to go five hours up the road to Port Augusta. I don't know about you people, that doesn't work for the Indigenous people. You've got to be close to family. Five hours is too far away. That's your, that was your first failure. Once you come back, more than likely you'll fall into the same crowd and you'll be drinking again and carrying on. The situation in Sojourner is the same for all the trial sites. That's why I've campaigned for each of them to receive better targeted, more meaningful support. The government's promised to put money in for services. I hope that won't mean, mean more money for free breakfast and crafts afternoons. What people in those sites don't need is more window dressing. What they need is a fair go to make their lives better. That's why I've called on the government to put the money for services toward organisations that will help people, people get their lives back on track. Funding for re residential rehabs in regional areas. Money to help people get real jobs, not just time fillers like, like work for the dole, because that's rubbish. It's never going to work. It hasn't even worked for the white people. Good luck with that. 
better mental and physical health facilities, support for Indigenous-run businesses. It's not rocket science here, people. It really isn't. It may be the case for the government will have to take money out, out from community organisations that aren't working. So sad, too bad. And there's plenty of those in those trial sites that have nothing to offer but dressing up. It will be hard, but I can assure you, apparently, we have a deficit in this country and there is, un there is not unlimited funds. We've got to make sure that that money is spent properly so people can get on with their lives. Number two, number two for the Labor Party, and I'm yet to see one, is show us your transition plan, because we're going to go from bad to worse. Next you'll be having interventions again. I have kids out there being abused, because that's where we're heading. If this bill passes, people will start coming off the card from next week. Whatever you think about whether the car worked or not, taking it away is going to be disruptive and it is not going to be helpful. We're looking at a massive change for some very vulnerable people. The first thing I'm worried about is crime. People have told me plenty of times that crime, antisocial behaviour and alcohol abuse spikes when trial sites give big cash payments, such as mining royalties, on top of people's quarantine income from Centrelink. There's your other problem. Do something about the mining royalties. It's a massive problem. If Twiggy Forest can direct it elsewhere, why can't every other mining company in this country do so? No more royalties by cheques. No more. Letting people opt out of the card is going to have a similar effect. I want, I want to know from Labor, what are you going to do about that? How will you protect these people? This bill will also make a big difference to the women who rely on the compulsory nature of the card to have control of their own money. Being able to say to your sister or brother or your husband, sorry, I can't give you cash, it's all on my card, I've got nothing left. That's useful to a lot of women. It stops a lot of domestic violence. Once again, not rocket science. You go to the trial sites and you ask the women, what do you think of the card? And I'll, I'll tell you what they say. When the blokes are around, they'll sit there and go, it's no good. When you clear those blokes out, they're nearly jumping up dancing because they can't believe how effective this card has been on their lives, especially when it comes to humbugging and abuse. Abuse. Making the card voluntary is going to take that away. My question is, what's going to happen to those women? What's the plan for them? Once again, silence from Labor. No plan. The last thing on transition that bothers me is how we're going to make sure people get new cards on time and without hassle. I don't know if you know this, but trying to get them on a brand new card up there in the Northern Territory, even though it was state of the art and get them off a basics card and selling that for three weeks around the Northern Territory, there was no way in hell they were going to buy into that. And I'm not a public servant, and I was dressed up like they are, and I'm Indigenous. These people, and many of them are uneducated in these small communities, very difficult for them. They don't understand. You can't just go out there with a public servant, put something on the screen. Not going to work. You people have got no idea what you're up against over here. None at all. You can't just get it mailed. I mean, mail's not going to work. and can take two or three weeks to do all that stuff. And then you've got to once again explain to them about this card and what's happening. Just not getting this at all, you people over here, you're like lost in a bubble. Plenty of people in the trial sites have no fixed address. They only have their card. You're giving them a whole new system. Once again, how are you selling it? I imagine committee time is going to be an absolute ripper in here shortly. And even if they do, it can take two weeks, like I said, at the best to deliver a letter. Six months after this bill passes, everyone who's still on the CDC will get the boot off the card. The government expects people to switch over the bank accounts and bank card in a day, once again with a heap of uneducated people. Good luck with that. I don't see how that's going to happen without blocking some people from their own money, then they're not going to have money. It will take a lot of careful planning and preparation to make the transition off the cashless debit card work. And I still haven't seen anything from the Minister or the Department to show how they plan to manage it. That's why I've asked the minister to release a transition, transition plan for the trial sites. The government needs to show us how they're going to handle the next six months of people who are going to come off the card. Put it on paper, since you think, it's, since you think your plan's going to work so well. Let's say it! 
Let's see what the abuse is going to look like in six months' time. Let's see how many more alcoholics you've got in these communities in six months' time. Let's look at the child abuse go through the roof in these communities in six months' time, because that's what you are facing. You're accountable for what comes next, so lay your cards out on the table and show us that you're up for the challenge. And right now, all I get from the Labor Party on the cashless debit card is a heap of silence and a stupid look at I don't know on my face. One of the last government's biggest stuff-ups on the cashless debit card was that they didn't monitor its effects properly. When you do a test on whether something works or not, you have to start by looking at how things were before you make a change. Well, here you go. I hope you've been doing your travels out there, because I want to see all that paper. What's it look like today? Because I can tell you what I'm going to be back in here in six months. I know what it looks like. I'm going to tell you what it looks like in six months' time. And no doubt there'll be silence from that side as well. You have to measure your starting point. That's how far you know you've come. We didn't do that with the cashless debit card, and the trials weren't much of a trial at all. Statistics are very important. I can come in here and tell you how many times I've visited those trial sites and the difference I've seen in them, even if it was only 20 or 30 per cent difference. I've seen the ones that were more successful than the others because they had more on the ground. They had limited alcohol consumption because they had the, some of the strictest liquor licences in the country. Then they had the cashless debit card. Then they had dogs on patrol. Then they had magistrates, the same magistrates going through the court. It's a not a one, it's not a, a one thing fix. You need all these additives with it. The cashless debit card was never going to fix everything, but it was a starter. Making the card voluntary is going to take that away. My question is what's going to happen um, to the, to what's going to happen out there? No, that's not right. No. So we haven't seen any. You know, I, I remember Labor saying that they didn't have the statistics, didn't have the data, and all that. And you guys are doing the same thing. So that's really unfortunate. There are also 4,000 people on the CDC in the Northern Territory and Cape York. Um, and those people should be left alone. That system is working very well. So where it is working, leave it alone. If the communities want them, then let them have them. And leave the card there so if anyone else has got drug and alcohol problems, they can opt in in the future. Simple. Senator Lambie, would you like to uh, foreshadow your second reading amendment on sheet 1668? What was it? I move. Do you want me to move it? Yeah, just foreshadow the amendment, Senator Lambie. Uh, It'll be fine. Right. Thank you. That's what do I have to say? So the, the amendment, the text has been circulated to the Senate. Uh, you just yeah. need to foreshadow that you will be moving uh, oh. the amendment as detailed on sheet 166. Sorry. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Acting President, I will be moving the um, amendment as shadowed. On the paper, what number was it? One six six eight. One one six six oh. Eight. Eight. One six six eight. Fantastic. Thank you very Thank much, you. Senator Lee. Sorry, Senator Farrell. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. <clears throat> I think uh, all those uh, who have contributed to this uh, important debate on this bill, the Social Security Administration Amendment repeal of cashless debit card and other me measures bill of uh, 2022. And uh, I appreciate that uh, for very many uh, people this has been an, uh, an emotional debate on uh, both sides of the uh, chamber. However, the bill delivers on uh, our government's election commitment uh, to abolish the cashless uh, debit card and is the product of ongoing and uh, sincere community consultation. This bill not only, uh, is not only the first step in the transition journey away from the uh, cashless uh, debit card, but it's a, a significant milestone in the reform of cashless welfare in Australia. Any measure we put in place as a government, we want to ensure uh, will help the people we are assisting. To that end, <coughs> the Minister for Social Services will continue to consult with the affected communities, 
participants yeah. using the card and First Nations leaders to deliver a smooth and supported transition off the card. The government thanks the community leaders and the participants who have so generously shared their experiences uh, with the Minister and the Assistant Minister for Social Services, uh, the Honourable uh, Justine uh, Elliott, MP, in Sejuna, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, the East Kimberley, the Goldfield regions, Cape York and the Northern Territory. Some of my colleagues also contributed to those consultations with the local communities, so thanks should go to Senator Pat Dodson and Senator Malandiri McCarthy and to Marion Scrimjaw, uh, MP, the member for Lingiari. Our government will continue to consult with local communities to implement solutions which communities want to see and ensure that they are supported in the transition off the CDC. The bill before us will, <coughs> firstly, remove the ability for any new entrants to be put on the card. Secondly, <coughs> enable the more than 17,000 existing cashless debit card participants to be progressively transitioned off the card as soon as the bill receives royal assent. Thirdly, <coughs> enables the uh, Family Responsibilities Commission to continue to support their community members by placing them on, onto uh, income management where the need exists. And finally, <coughs> it will allow for the repeal of the cashless debit card on a day to be fixed by proclamation or a maximum of six months after royal assent, allowing for the necessary time to support stage transition off the card. I note the report delivered uh, by the Senate Community Affairs Committee and thank the senators and the committee secretariat staff involved for their work, particularly the work of Senator Mario Smith as the chair of that uh, committee. Other senators have referred to the report during this debate and to the evidence heard by witnesses at the public hearings in Bundaberg, Alice Springs, Darwin and Canberra. I'd like to thank these witnesses for their time with the committee uh, and to all those who submitted written submissions. The report noted the strong support for the abolition of the CDC program and the concerns of many stakeholders about the lack of evidence supporting the CDC, as well as the negative impacts of the program on individual participants and communities. The hearings heard directly from participants who were forced to use the card. Social policy researchers, uh, providers of the CDC in the traditional uh, credit union, the Families uh, Responsibility Commission in Queensland, and other stakeholders, such as organisations delivering CDC support services. Taking into account all evidence provided in the hearings and the written submission, the committee report made two recommendations, which the government has caref carefully considered in our approach to this bill. The first recommendation was the committee recommends that the Commonwealth Government work with the Queensland Family Responsibilities Commission to address the concerns raised, including uh, <coughs> uh, considering possible amendments to the bill to ensure that the Commission can continue to operate effectively in accordance with its statutory responsibilities. The second recommendation was that, <coughs> subject to recommendation one, the committee recommends that the bill be passed. In response to recommendation one, the government will introduce amendments to this bill to ensure participants are supported through their transition off the card in the most safe and structured way. These amendments will, in summary, uh, further affirm the role of the Families Responsibilities Commission in the Cape York region to allow them to continue referring people to income management with an improved technology offering allowing uh, access to more uh, merchants compared to the basics card and delivered by Services Australia. 
offer <coughs> this uh, same technological uh, offering to the CDC participants in the Northern Territory who will remain on income management following the repeal of the CDC. <coughs> and finally, allow CDC participants in the remaining sites of Sejuna, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay, the Goldfields uh, and uh, East Kimberley mm -hmm. to also volunteer for this enhanced card with more access to merchants uh, and with all client interaction through Services Australia. The government is also providing a suite of measures that will ensure CDC communities are better off. These include <coughs> an updated income management techno technology solution with an enhanced card delivery delivered by uh, Services uh, Australia, <coughs> a continuation of current community support services and addition of new services, delivering $14.9 million for additional alcohol and other drug treatment services and support in the cashless uh, debit card trial sites. And finally, <coughs> providing $17 million for community-led and designed initiatives to support economic and employment opportunities in selected cashless debit card sites. This is all funding the former government uh, already had but had uh, not delivered to the communities. We will deliver this. We will also provide additional <coughs> front of house staff from Services Australia in cashless debit card program sites over the transition period. Staff will support community engagement activities, including Indigenous service officers and community engagement officers, and there will be additional remote servicing visits uh, arranged. <coughs> More financial information uh, service officers uh, will also be available to work with individuals to improve their financial work capability, foster self-sufficiency and help them make informed decisions about their finances. Social workers will be available to work with individuals with more complex issues. The Albanese Labor government remains committed to making income management voluntary over the long term for those 24,000 people on uh, income management nationally. During the minister's recent community consultation in the CDC communities, she's been discussing what voluntary income management could look like and whether there may be uh, circumstances in which a community decides how they make income management voluntary for individuals. <coughs> During these consultations, it was clear that communities are starting to think about what voluntary income management in their community may look like and if it could be something that uh, is decided at community level, such as the arrangements under the FRC. The government will work closely with communities in CDC regions to continue addressing entrenched disadvantage in communities and determine where and how support services can best be deployed. Understanding local issues at the services needed in each region is a priority for the government. The Minister's uh, consultations with First Nations leaders, CDC participants, community organisations and service providers will be the first step of a comprehensive and thorough consultation process. I will detail our government's amendments further in consideration of this bill, bill in the Committee of the Whole. But with these amendments and our commitments to communities through these additional support services, the government will have addressed the recommendations of the report and in line with the second of the committee's recommendations, I will re recommend that the bill be passed. So the question for the chair is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1627 moved by Senator Rustin on behalf of the opposition be agreed to. Sorry. So move a further amendment. Uh, to foreshadow that you will for be moving? Yeah, at the second reading, yeah. Uh, is that the same one that I understand Senator Rennick uh, on sheet 1665? Oh, did he do it already? My apologies if that's been My done. understanding is okay. he has foreshadowed yeah. that. Thank you. Already? 
So just to repeat, the question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1627, moved by Senator Rustin on behalf of the opposition, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 26 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I advise senators I have a number of second reading amendments, and I'm going to call Senator Rice, who foreshadowed a second reading amendment. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. I move my second reading amend amendment on sheet 1611. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against? No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One, one minute. Four. Four minutes. Uh, we're ringing the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice to be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 11 ayes and 41 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'm now going to move to the second reading amendment, which was foreshadowed by Senator Rennick. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, are you moving that, yeah. Senator O'Sullivan? Oh. Senator O'Sullivan. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, oh, Senator Rustin. Okay. Um, I move amendment number on page number 1665, standing in my name. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Rustin on behalf of Senator Rennick be agreed to. Those of that opinion, those of that opinion say aye. 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 Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. The ayes have it. A division required? Ring the bells for one or four? Four minutes. Ring the bells for four.
capacities. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the motion, the amendment is foreshadowed by Senator Rennick and moved by Senator Rustin be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. And I advise senators to please remain in the chamber after this as there's one more foreshadowed second reading amendment.
order, there being 24 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Now going to move to the motion order, as foreshadowed by Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie. Yeah. Uh, uh, I move the second at 168. 1668. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. I've got, I've got stuff here either. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, I move, um, I move the amendment um, uh, for 1668. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Thank Lambie. You. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required? Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
Order, lock the doors. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. I'm going to put it again. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I believe the ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Order. So the question is that the bills be now read a second time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Sorry, I forgot to say close the doors. Um, those of that opinion say aye. Uh, sorry. Um, I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 32 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. I believe that we have a committee stage. I'll just wait for a change in the chair. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Van. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Sorry. Minister. Thank you. Uh, I table were three supplementary explanatory uh, memoranda relating to the government amendments uh, to be moved to this bill. I seek uh, uh, leave to move items uh, 1 to 13 on sheet TK324 together, noting the question on some items will be put separately to enable the question uh, that items stand as printed. Is leave granted? Speak to the amendments. I for him to move the amendments first. Yes. Chair, I uh, move the amendments. And, uh, seek to I speak to them. <coughs> um, the government's uh, amendments allow for an enhanced technology option to provide a modern user experience for Cape York participants. Witnesses requested this <coughs> in the Senate uh, committee hearings, including Mr Noel Pearson and the Commissioner of the uh, uh, Family Responsibilities Commission, Ms Tammy Williams. These amendments uh, also further affirm the operation of the Family Responsibilities Commission, which was also heard in the committee hearings. Commissioner Williams has reviewed and supports these amendments. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr Chair. Um, uh, before I go into the, um, the substantive of the amendment just moved by uh, Minister Farrell, um, I'd just uh, like to put a couple of um, comments on the record and then seek some uh, further clarification around the general nature of, uh, of this bill uh, before we uh, move to, to be voting on his particular amendment. So, um, firstly, um, you know, currently income management in Australia is delivered by two particular means. Uh, it is either delivered through the basics card, which sits under a piece of legislation called the income management legislation, or it's delivered by uh, a technology that is commonly referred to as the cashless debit card uh, through the cashless debit card legislation. Um, I'm very keen um, to understand, um, Senator uh, Farrell, um, whether it is your intention uh, to cause ongoing uncertainty uh, for communities that currently um, have the cashless debit card technology operating as income management uh, because of your intention for your so-called enhanced technology solution, which you have uh, indicated today that you are going to be uh, bringing into this place for um, consideration prior to the 6th of March 2023. Uh, I also noted in your contribution uh, when you uh, gave your final second reading speech uh, that you referred to consultation. Um, I probably would like to draw attention to uh, this chamber about what the definition of consultation actually is. Consultation occurs when you actually go out and seek the views of somebody around a particular issue 
prior to making a determination or a decision in relation to that particular issue. Consultation is not the definition of going and telling people what you're doing after you've made that decision and after you've announced that decision. That is actually just going out and telling them what you're intending to do. So to come in here, uh, Senator Farrell, uh, and many of your colleagues before you in their contributions also referred to consultation. You did not consult this bill with anybody before you made the decision in the lead up to the election that you were intending to bring it into this place. So I put that on the record. Um, but what I'd um, like to understand uh, from you on this particular uh, uh, amendment that you've got before us, Senator Farrell, um, is uh, is it the um, intention um, of this government um, to pursue any form of compulsory or mandatory income management in Australia from this time? <clears throat> Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Chair. Um, in uh, response to the uh, questions from the uh, shadow uh, minister, I, I think I'd start <clears throat> at the beginning, and that starts with the, uh, the election result, um, where Labor took a position to the Australian people, um, where we said, um, because of all the problems with the uh, cashless debit card, uh, we were going to move to uh, abolish that, uh, that card. So that was the position that we took to the Australian people. Um, we didn't do that lightly. Um, we did it after much thought, but more particularly we did it after much consultation and people like People like, people like um, Senator McCarthy um, traipsed up and down the Northern Territory in the seats of Lingiari and in the seat of Solomon, <coughs> both, of which, both of which were saved by campaigns that uh, Senator uh, Alan Deary um, conducted in the Northern Territory. <coughs> um, and in all of those discussions and consultations with um, can I say a damn sight more people than you would have spoken to, uh, Senator Rustin, uh, well, in I the course of the? I think. Uh, <clears throat> well, look, I'm happy to I'm happy to lay the cards on the table and uh, and uh, and uh, show you just how much um, Senator McCarthy and uh, uh, former Minister Scrimgeour and uh, Luke Gosling consulted. Uh, just in the Northern Territory alone, um, and they didn't stop talking with the people of uh, the Northern Territory in, in this particular case. Um, and uh, uh, and what did the people of the Northern Territory do? They re-elected two Labor ministers, uh, two Labor members, um, as well as Senator McCarthy, of course. Uh, and so um, I think there's no doubt that um, we've gone beyond the call of duty to consult. But let me talk to you a bit about what, what we did. Um, prior to the election, Labor heard um, the many calls from people living on the card who said the card was negatively affecting their lives and their ability to manage their money. The Minister for Indigenous Australia, uh, the Honourable Linda Burney, visited many of the uh, CDC communities and spoke with participants. The, ministers, the minister heard uh, the card did not help, um, well, she was then shadow minister, but she's now minister, <coughs> did not help them uh, manage uh, their money or improve their lives. Since the election, um, <coughs> that terrific uh, Minister for Social um, Services, um, Amanda Rishworth, and the Assistant Minister, another fine uh, minister, Justine Elliott, <coughs> have visited each of the six communities affected by the CDC. They spoke with participants uh, on the card, local government representatives, emergency services and the First Nations leaders. 
Um, and I'm happy to go through the dates of uh, those visits. Um, <coughs> in Sejuna, it was the 23rd and uh, 24th of June 2022. That was Minister Rishworth. East Kimberleys <coughs> on the uh, 29th of June to the 1st of July. That was Minister Rishworth again. Um, in fact, um, uh, in Bundaberg, Bundaberg uh, Harvey Bay was the 4th and 5th of uh, July. That was Ass Assistant Minister Elliott. Uh, Cape York was the 9th to the 10th of uh, August. Uh, that was Minister, uh, Assistant Minister uh, Elliott. Uh, Cairns was the uh, 12th of August. Um, that was Minister uh, Wishworth, Rishworth. Then the Goldfields, 15th to the 16th of August. Uh, that was uh, Minister Elliott. And finally, the Northern Territory was the uh, 17th to the 19th of August. And again, that was Minister uh, Rishworth. Um, so um, <coughs> I'd submit. That, that's pretty conclusive evidence of the consultation, the, co the consultation that uh, this government, the consultation that this government participated uh, in uh, before we move this uh, move this uh, legislation. Um, now, as to the other particular question that uh, uh, the shadow minister asked. Um, we simply can't sit back and wait for 2023 to roll around, uh, meanwhile extending a payment management system that amounts to privatised uh, welfare. This is not in the best interests of the recipients, but more importantly, not in the best interests of taxpayers. And that's why we are passing the legislation to abolish the card through the parliament right now. Minister Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr Chair. Um, could I ask um, the minister, um, I asked you two quite separate questions. Um, I'm asking you, are your, is it your intention, is it the intention of the Albanese Labor government to um, continue from this day with compulsory income management? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, once again uh, Shadow Minister Rustin for her question. Um, as we transition people away from mandatory measures, we'll continue to offer assistance. We'll take the time necessary to research, develop, consult and implement a future social security payment system that will target uh, supports to the people who identify that their family would benefit from it. The government is making uh, the path to life beyond CDC our focus today, and we will focus on the future. We will take the time necessary to research, develop, consult and implement a future social security payment system that will target uh, supports to the people who, are, uh, who identify their family would benefit from it. As we work through this, we must also work with communities to identify what other key supports are needed, not only to support individuals as they tra tra transition off the card, but to put in place other programs uh, that support to the help uh, the community address uh, issues of uh, alcohol and other drug misuse, domestic violence and problem gambling. Senator. Senator. Um, Chair, um, can I perhaps be really, really clear here um, to, for the minister? My question is, is it the intention of the Albanese Labor government to extend or keep in place any form of compulsory or mandatory income management from today? Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and I again thank Senator Rustin for her, uh, her question. 
Um, while income management legislation in the uh, Social Security Administration Act 1999 does not sunset, it operates through a number of legislative instruments that sunset every 10 years. These instruments enable the income management to operate in specific locations and or income management measures. Six of these legislative instruments were due to sunset on the 1st of October 2022. In order to consult effectively, the Attorney-General has agreed to a deferral of, the six, of these six instruments uh, for a period of 12 months. We are extending the instruments to allow time for consultation with communities, including First Nations peoples and leaders, on the future of income management. This will include um, what a voluntary model of income management looks like at a community or individual level, and the best way to transition people who have been living on the compulsory income management uh, uh, for uh, 15 years. The, traditional, the uh, transitional arrangements for the abol abolition of uh, CDC will also consider pathways for participants to uh, uh, voluntarily uh, income manage. This is why it is uh, practical and appropriate for the existing instruments to remain in place until further decisions are made on the future of income management. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, a, a Senator or Minister, you made the comment that it was appropriate to keep in place these instruments until the future of income management in Australia had been decided when you were referring to the extension of compulsory income management in the Northern Territory and a number of other sites around Australia. And yet, um, can I then ask you, is it your intention to continue with compulsory income management uh, in the four trial sites? Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, <coughs> Senator uh, Rustin for her uh, follow-up follow -up, uh, question. Uh, the answer is no. Senator Rustin. Um, yesterday, um, in a following question time after you were questioned um, in relation to the extension of compulsory income management in the Northern Territory and other sites, um, uh, whilst failing to answer the question during question time, you did come back to the chamber after question time and put on the record that it is the intention of the Albanese Labor government to extend compulsory income management in the Northern Territory and other income management sites around Australia. Uh, today, uh, the Minister for Indigenous Australians said in the House uh, that mandatory income management has been a failure across the board and we do not believe in mandatory income management. Uh, can you please clarify to me uh, your position in extending compulsory income management in the Northern Territory and the other sites uh, with the position of the Minister for Indigenous Australians who has said publicly today uh, that we do not believe in mandatory income management, and yet you have extended that today in selected sites across Australia, whilst this piece of legislation seeks to, to move away from compulsory management in other places. Perhaps the minister might be able to explain to us why the government has made the decision to keep compulsory income management in place in the Northern Territory particularly, but has taken it out of um, other sites. Uh, the Northern Territory uh, income management predominantly uh, affects uh, Indigenous Australians in other sites around Australia, uh, where the CDC is not necessarily as, uh, as high a number of Indigenous Australians. Why has the government chosen to keep compulsory or mandatory income management in place for a majority Indigenous population? Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair. And uh, once again, thank uh, Senator Rustin for uh, her, uh, her question. Um, um, Minister Burney can obviously speak for herself. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm not uh, <coughs> here um, speaking on her behalf. Uh, I am, uh, of course, of course. Um, well, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the minister, who's uh, responsible for this piece, uh, particular piece of legislation, and that's Minister uh, Rishworth. Um, and uh, as Minister for uh, Social Services uh, and her department, uh, working with the uh, FRC to affirm um, uh, income management for people in Cape York 
and to ensure the continuation of support services uh, for people. Uh, the minister and the assistant uh, minister, uh, Elliot, <coughs> visited Cape York communities to consult on what income management should look like and what supports will be required to ensure communities are best placed to address the complex social issues that they face. Um, the model of income management operated uh, in Cape York region by the Families uh, Responsible Re Responsibilities Commission is distinct to the broad-based compulsory income management models elsewhere in the country. The uh, FRC model is one informed by self-determination, which is something that the um, Albanese government is committed to supporting for our First Nations communities. We will always listen closely to these communities about the solutions they would like to see in their communities. The Minister for Social Services visited the Cape York region in recent weeks and uh, spoken with uh, Commissioner Tammy Williams and the local commissioner for uh, uh, Duma G. Uh, we um, also um, met with Noel Pearson. She also met with uh, Noel Pearson, who gave evidence to the Senate committee hearing into the CDC that he does not agree with the blanket uh, imposition of the card. Assistant Minister Elliott also visited the remote Cape York communities of uh, Aracoon uh, to observe the FRC's uh, operation at work. As far as the Northern Territory is concerned, <coughs> there's no evidence that this card has made any difference. The card has not worked. It has not addressed the concerns of some communities <coughs> about alcohol abuse and violence in the community particularly against uh, women and children. We need new ways to do better for Northern Territory Australians and forget about the discriminatory practices introduced by those opposite. People on compulsory income management in the Northern Territory will go back to the basic card for the time being. We're continuing our discussions with people in these communities so that we can consider their needs in any future decisions. NT communities deserve opportunities to participate in meaningful work and receive the support they need while they are seeking jobs just like everyone else in Australia. Senator Rustin. Uh, should I ask the Minister if he could confirm what he just said? He just said that the CDC had not worked in the Northern Territory and he said that those people in the Northern Territory who are on the CDC would transition back to the basics card. Can you confirm that's what you just said? I mean, we can always give you the hand. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, uh, the, um, um, <coughs> thanks, Senator Rustin, for her, um, uh, her, um, her question. Um, to um, provide the ca a card uh, with functions uh, people on the CDC are used to uh, requires the involvement of an en entity with uh, a banking licence. This provides certainty to merchants um, as well as Visa and FPOS that someone, uh, someone uh, purchases something with a card uh, they will be paid. It also allows people to use uh, the BPAY system Purchases um, using the internet are also supported through having a bank account that is used to make uh, the payment. What are you talking about? The, well, I'm answering your question. No, you're not. You are not even asking my question. I asked you to clarify a statement you just made. You, you, you asked some questions about the technology, and I'm providing, I'm, I'm providing some. I can. Oh, I'm simply. Oh, you can take any point of order. Whether it, it may not assist the, the minister if I uh, perhaps um, reframe uh, my question. In, in a previous answer the, before that one, the minister said that the CDC had not worked in the Northern Territory and that people in the Northern Territory on the CDC would transition back to the basics card. I'm just wondering whether you could clarify whether that is correct or have you misspoken? 
Senator Farrell. Well, I propose to answer in the way I started answering, and uh, that is that the government is working to engage a third-party provider to provide a modern card for people leaving the CDC and moving back to income management. Under the uh, new arrangements, Services Australia uh, would do all customer functions, such as uh, um, taking calls, providing replacement cards and accounts balance requests. The third party provider would uh, only provide the back office functions of the card, such as maintaining an account, so payments uh, are made uh, through visas uh, and uh, merchants, processing transactions and reporting uh, to Services Australia. Specific negotiations with a third party provider are commercial in confidence and I cannot uh, comment on those. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, can I just, just seek some clarification, uh, Senator, and I thank you for the detailed answer you gave me um, around where you're going, and I probably am sure that my colleague, um, <coughs> uh, Senator O'Sullivan, will have some more questions around this supposed um, enhanced technology and third-party provider, which you have just referred in that answer. But I just would like to take you back to a comment that you made, and I'm just seeking clarification whether this is correct. You said the cashless debit card had not worked in the Northern Territory and that the people on the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory were going to transition back to the basics card. And I'm quoting you there, transition back to the basics card. I'm just seeking clarification about that statement that you made a minute ago as to whether that is correct. <coughs> Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, Senator Rustin, for her question. Um, the uh, people in the Northern Territory can and choose um, the enhanced tech that I was just talking about at the moment, a uh, moment ago, um, or the uh, or the basics cards. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry, can I just Rustin. be really clear? Really clear. Um, are people in the Northern Territory who are who have currently made the decision? 4,300 and something of them who have transitioned from the basics card onto the cashless debit card will, after royal assent of this legislation, subject to the passage of the amendments that have been put forward by the government, will those people retain their cashless debit card and the functionality of it, or will they be forced to transition back to the basics card? which is what you appeared to be indicating in your previous answer. I'm not talking about what's happening in the future. Um, uh, at all. Not, could I just perhaps seek um, for the senator to allow me to continue yes. my senator question? McCarthy, I just want to be very, very clear here, Senator Farrell. We, we have currently two forms of income management. We have the basics card and the CDC. You are talking about a new advanced technology that you are proposing to bring in sometime between now and the 6th of March next year. I'm talking about the current technologies that are in place. The advanced technology does not exist at the moment. Well, maybe I should ask this question. Senator Farrell, does the advanced technology that you are talking about exist at the moment, and will it be available for implementation on royal assent of this legislation? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, look, I can only uh, repeat my earlier answer, and <laughs> I suppose we can do this all, all night, uh, but uh, the people in the Northern Territory can choose uh, the enhanced uh, um, technology or the basic cards. I think the questions, with all due respect to Senator uh, Rustin, I think the questions you are asking uh, relate to the next amendment rather than this amendment. I'm happy to answer uh, <coughs> questions um, if you want on the next amendment, and that might speed up the process when we get to them, but um, um, I think it's probably more sensible if you ask the questions as they relate to the particular um, uh, bef um, amendment before the uh, Senate. Yeah, yeah. Well, Senator Rustin. Senator Farrell, and I will come back to asking the question, but um, and in the meantime I'll, I'll perhaps seek for if we could get the copy of Hansard as soon as possible for the comments that the minister made. 
that I'm referring to so that I can actually seek clarification about that. Um, so I'm not talking um, about the next amendments in relation to um, the people in the Northern Territory that are on the cashless debit card. I'm just going to ask you right now, you keep referring to enhanced technology. Could you please explain to me um, whether people who are currently on income management will have access to what you refer to as advanced technology when this bill receives royal assent? Senator Farrell. Thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Rustin again for um, the, um, the question. Um, <clears throat> I answered that question previously, uh, Senator, and I suppose I can go over and I, I suppose I can spend all night repeating the um, answers I give, but I don't think that's terribly uh, helpful. It's probably not terribly helpful to any of the, uh, the, uh, um, the, the um, people uh, listening. Um, and um, I've answered the question. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Thank you. S Senator Farrell, could you just indulge me, please? You've said you've answered this question on several occasions. You are referring to a thing. You are referring to advanced Senator technology. McCarthy. I am just seeking to understand. Um, I mean, I'm sure Senator O'Sullivan can ask you a whole heap of questions around what this advanced technology is. I'm just seeking to understand when this advanced technology, if I'm, if I'm a, a recipient of the cashless debit card or of income management of, of the basics card, when would I be able to get access to this advanced technology? Senator Farrell. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Senator, um, uh, Senator Rustin, for a question. Uh, 6th of March 2023. Senator, Senator Lambie. We've got a third card in place. Is that what you're saying? We've got a brand new card. We've got the basics card. We've got the injury card. And now you're going to do in a matter of six months, which took quite a few years to get the injury card down pat. I can tell you, you're bringing out a third card. Is that what you're telling us? How's this working? Senator Farrell. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I don't think I can be any clearer than what I've already said. Uh, Senator Lambie, and thank you for your question. Um, there's uh, going to, uh, in, the, in the Northern Territory, people are going to be able to choose between the enhanced technology that I started to uh, talk about before. You didn't seem very interested uh, when I started to explain that, so I won't, uh, I won't repeat uh, what I said about the enhanced technology or the basics card. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, I want to start by just putting our perspective on the agenda, on the uh, on the record. So the context of my questions will be um, considered in in that context, and and that is the Greens' position of being against any form of compulsory income management because it has clearly failed to work. We have had what is it, six years of the so-called trials of the cashless debit card, which have failed to address the social problems which they were set up to address. We have had, we have had evaluations that have shown very clearly that there has not been any evidence that the cashless debit card has addressed those social problems. We've had a scathing report from the, uh, the Auditor General that has shown that compulsory income management has failed. It is a harmful, punitive approach, and it's basically trying to mask an awful lot of other social problems, which are the issues that need to be being addressed. We've heard in many speeches yesterday and today people being very concerned, and quite rightly, about social problems in some communities across Australia. Um, but then jumping to this conclusion that compulsory income management is going to fix those problems, and clearly. The evidence from the basics card, which was introduced in the Northern Territory after the intervention, the evidence of the cashless debit card over the last six years has shown that compulsory income management has not fixed those problems. Otherwise, the communities which it has been imposed upon would have had very clear evidence of having 
an improvement in those social issues, and it just hasn't happened. So, given that context, the Greens are supporting this bill because it is going to mean fewer people under compulsory income management. The fact that the people in the four trial sites are going to, after the Royal Assent on this bill, have the ability to get off compulsory income management. And that is a huge step forward. And I am going to be celebrating with those people in those four trial sites, and I know that there are many of them who are just waiting to get off um, the cashless debit card. So, and I, as is clear, um, we've got amendments that are going to be attempting to be getting more people of compulsory income management. But first of all, my questions are, as I said, we're going to be supporting this bill because it's going to mean fewer people under compulsory income management. So I want to just ask some questions of clarification the Minister, starting off with just confirming that will anyone who is currently not on compulsory income management be forced to go on to compulsory income management as a result of this bill? Senator Farrell. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator uh, Rice, for your uh, contribution, and thank you for your support of the uh, of the legislation. <coughs> um, I can talk um, about um, specifically the Northern Territory, but I think it uh, answers your question generally. Um, our amendments uh, relating to the Northern Territory allow for the new enhanced technology to be offered to the current CDC participants in the Northern Territory. This amendment places no new people on compulsory income management that would otherwise not have been subject to this program. The affected participants are subject to the income management legislation in the Northern Territory and would have been uh, placed back onto the basic cards without this amendment offering them enhanced technology. Senator Rice. Thank you, um, Minister. So, okay, so that is clarifying and just putting on the record that you know, the rationale for us supporting this bill is that, well, it's a step forward. It's moving some people off income management and compulsory income management, and it's not putting any new people on. Um, Minister, the media release that was put out by Minister um, Richworth um, refers to 17,300 people transitioning off the cashless debit card and onto the new arrangements or off the program completely. Could you just take us through how many people are transitioning off completely? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Rice uh, again for her, uh, her question. Um, the government's amendments uh, allow people to choose to stay on the card as a voluntary option. Therefore, I can't provide an exact answer, but the government does expect that the majority of participants in uh, uh, the Bundaberg, uh, Harvey Bay, in Sejuna, in the Goldfields and the East Kimberleys uh, to transition off the card if they choose to do so. This would be a total of 12,515 based on current participants as at the 16th of September 2022. There are currently 4,300 people on the CDC in the Northern Territory and Cape York. These people will tra be transitioned to a new arrangement on the 6th of uh, March next year, as I've previously indicated. Senator Rose. So I just get some more clarification, Minister, about that 4,300 people who are on the CDC in the Northern Territory and Cape York. How many of those are in the Northern Territory and how many are in Cape York? Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, again, thank the Senator Rice for her uh, uh, question. Um, I can probably provide you with a little bit more um, information um, to answer a few um, <coughs> broader questions. Um, as at the 16th of September 2022, uh, there are currently 16,886 participants on the cashless debit card. Uh, in the Cape York region, um, the number of participants um, 
105, and uh, First Nations participants are 92 per cent. In the, the Sejuna region, uh, there are 692 participants, um, and First Nations participants represent 78 per cent. East Kimberley region, uh, there's 1,236 people, <coughs> participants, uh, and First Nations uh, represent 86 per cent of those. In the gold fields, um, uh, there are 2,513 participants, and they represent 50 per cent of, um, and, and the First Nations represent 50 per cent of that uh, figure. In Bundaberg and uh, Harvey Bay, there are 4,209 uh, uh, participants, and um, First Nations uh, represent 18 per cent of uh, that figure. In the Northern Territory, uh, the figure is uh, 4,266, as I previously indicated, uh, and First Nations participants uh, represent 79 per cent of that figure. And then uh, out of the uh, area uh, people, uh, there's uh, 3,865, of which um, just under half um, are uh, uh, First Nations uh, participants. Um, that comes to a total of uh, 16,806, as I, um, sorry, 16,886, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, First Nations uh, participants representing just over 50 per cent. Senator Rose. Thank you for that, Minister. Um, so, in terms of my question then as to how many are transitioning off completely and how many are transitioning to new arrangements. We've got the 4,266 in the Northern Territory who are going to be transitioned either back to the basics card or the new enhanced technology, and similarly the 105 in Cape York. So all of the others will then be given the option to be off compulsory income management altogether. So can I clarify that that, that is the case for the people who are out of area, all of those, the 3,865. I'll ask that first, and I've got another question about the numbers as well. Senator Farrell. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Rice. And it's good to uh, get questions from somebody who's uh, actually read the, uh, the bill and uh, all of the associated uh, documents. And the answer to all of your questions just then is, uh, is yes. Senator Rice. And then one last question on the numbers then, in terms of not knowing how many people are going to be transitioning off completely because you don't know how many people will choose to voluntarily stay on the card. Have you got any indications as to sort of the numbers you know, from the consultation that's been done in the lead up to the abol abolition as to what proportion of people might choose to stay on the card voluntarily? Senator Farrell. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Look, part of this whole process is giving back to individual Australians um, the rights to make decisions which the previous government took, took away from them in a particularly uh, unfair and, uh, and cruel manner. Um, the work that's been done by uh, Minister uh, uh, Rishworth um, is giving back to these people uh, rights to make their own, their own decisions um, about what they do in their life, um, how they, uh, they spend their money. Um, we could only guess what the final numbers are going to be, and if I could give you a more accurate answer than that, um, I certainly would. But the whole purpose of this is giving back to in, particularly Indigenous Australians, because they uh, represent such a large portion of the people under, the, um, under this uh, scheme. Uh, but we're giving back to those people some rights to make decisions about their future. Um, I can't tell exactly uh, what those numbers will be, but um, we will get some results, and we'll get some results pretty quickly uh, as, the, uh, as the changes uh, roll out and I'd very happily uh, supply those uh, results to you when they become available. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Um, 
so um, giving them their rights back. So Labor's okay with our children giving all their money to a bikey to um, buy their ice. We're okay with that, are we? I just want to know, because you're okay about giving them back, but you won't answer these hard questions. So I just want to know what you're going to do with these people once you give them all their money back. And they go and spend all that at the bottle shop, they run around drunk, they're abusing their communities, or they're buying ice and they're being violent in their communities. Labor's okay with that, is it? We don't need to manage them at all. We don't need to provide services ready to go. You want to take 12 months to work that out. You tell me what that's going to look like in the next 12 months. Because you're so okay with that, bringing harm to the rest of the community. Just explain that to the rest of Australia, because I'm not getting it. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and I uh, thank uh, Senator Lambie for her uh, rather emotional uh, question there. And uh, I totally reject the proposition that you. Uh, um, well, I totally reject the proposition. I totally reject the proposition that you just put to me. And, and to be honest, <coughs> Senator uh, Lambie, I find it quite offensive. I find it quite offensive. I find it quite offensive that you should even. Senator Look, Lambie. Senator Lambie. Senator Lambie, I find the um, implication in your question totally offensive. Um, well, I find I find that comment Senator even, Lambie, you don't even offensive. Call. And uh, <clears throat> look, I found in political life that um, uh, civility, uh, particularly in the Senate, has never been a, uh, a weakness. And uh, I simply say to you that I totally reject the implication in your question. But to try and provide you with more information <coughs> about what the government is intending to do, we are committed to ensuring that people are able to come off the card as quickly as possible and support will be available to those who need it, including for those uh, opting for voluntary income management. And uh, we're setting up uh, a centre pay uh, arrangement and referrals for uh, local supports. It's critical that those who do need some extra help with the changes to their financial arrangements are able to get it. This may include an option for individuals to transi transition to voluntary income management uh, programs. Uh, the participants in uh, Cape York and the Northern Territory will will automatically uh, be referred to enhanced income management. These participants will continue to access a contemporary card with customer service and support, such as the replacement cards and account inquiries provided by Services Australia. Services Australia will provide a new card uh, to people in existing CDC sites that volunteer for enhanced income management or new people referred to uh, by the uh, FRC. Income management participants in the Northern Territory and uh, place-based locations will have the option to access the modern technology and transition uh, to enhanced uh, income management uh, from the date I, from uh, the 1st of July 2023. Senator Lambie. I was wondering if the Minister um, can commit to publishing as soon as possible a transition plan to the department website so people know what's going on. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Lambie um, for a more balanced um, question. Uh, and uh, we'll take uh, that uh, on board, and uh, uh, I'll come back to you with, uh, with a response. Senator Lambie. I'm wondering, um, since the Labor Party is talking about the cards and who's coming off and who's coming on, I'm wondering if you might be able to supply me the evidence that you used in the last election where you put out there on all those cards and scared the bejesus out of old, pen old age pensioners that they were going on that card because the, co because the coalition were going to put them on there. So I was wondering if you could supply that evidence to me where you got that from. Today's good. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you uh, again for uh, your question, Senator Lambie. Um, we didn't make the decision lightly, uh, and uh, we did take into account. Uh, <coughs> we didn't. Okay. Well, I'm. 
I'm about to provide it for you, uh, Senator uh, Lambie. Um, the University of Adelaide uh, reported uh, in January 2021 20, uh, found that the uh, evidence to support the CDC was inconclusive. The, the study found that any reduction in alcohol and drug abuse could not be attributed to the effect of the, uh, the card. Uh, the report found that the CDC introduced widely felt and costly hurdles to many participants in relation to financial planning and money management, and that the large proportion of CDC participants reported that their quality of life were, were, was affected in a negative way. But there is also uh, a wealth of uh, research available uh, on the CDC. A study by the University of South Australia and Monash University in 2020 found the CDC had no substantive impact on gambling and intoxicant abuse in Sejuna and no substantive impact on crime or emergency department presentations. A 2020 study by the University of Queensland also found that CDC participants in Hinkler said that the card impacted their emotional well-being, lived in fear of stigma of their records uh, being declined uh, and reduce their ability to participate in community life and leisure activities that required cash. Uh, excuse and of me, course, Senator Farrell, we have a point of order. Senator Lambie, point of order. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I, I simply just asked for you to show me the evidence that Labor was using during the last election. Is, what's your point of order? Sorry, Sorry my, my point of order is that you, you're not answering my question. You give me a lot of babble. I simply just want a question on where's, what, so, the evidence that was used. My point of order is I'm not getting, you're not giving me the evidence that was used uh, when you ran the Senator campaign. Lambie, that's pensions. not a point of order. Um, Senator Lambie. Thank you. I just wanted to know once again, let me, let me rephrase the question, on um, what evidence did Labor use during the 2022 election to go out there and tell aged pensioners that the coalition intended to put them on, on the um, cashless debit card as an aged pensioner? I just want to know where you got the evidence, where Labor got the evidence to say that the coalition was going to do that because you spent, you, you spent a lot of time scaring aged pensioners about that. And I think that's really unfair, and I think that's a real low point of Labor. So I just want you to supply me the evidence on how you come up with that, that the Coalition ever said they were going to put aged pensioners on that card. Where's the evidence? That's what I'm asking you. And every aged pensioner out there deserves an answer. Who was lying? Did the Coalition Show me the evidence that the coalition said this on paper or said it elsewhere, or show me where you got that evidence from. I'm not getting away with this, not tonight. Senator Farrell. Well, look, I totally reject the uh, proposition. Um, I've explained to you where we, um, all of the reports that were done. University of Adelaide, a very, very fine establishment. Um, the University of South Australia, another very fine establishment. We've done all of these um, surveys and the proposition that we took to the Australian people at the last election was a very simple proposition <coughs> uh, that uh, we, would, uh, uh, we would abolish the uh, cash cashless uh, debit card. Um, uh, that was the proposition we took. Uh, we explained that to people. Um, we explained that. We explained that. Um, well, well, that's what you say, Senator Lambie. But, but, but the, look, you say, you say that. But we we took a very we we took we took a very clear position. We took a very clear position to the Australian people. Um, we, in particular, let, let, let's look at the Northern Territory. Um, we took that proposition to the people of the Northern Territory, and Great. the people of the Northern Territory 
re-elected uh, Mr Gosling by a 10 per cent uh, increased uh, margin. They elected uh, uh, Marion uh, Scrimjaw in the seat of Lingiari, and of course they elected um, Senator uh, McCarthy. And, um, and, it, and, 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 uh, and the people of Australia elected an Anthony Albanese Labor government. And what we are doing, what, what we are doing is implementing uh, what uh, we told the Australian people we were going to do before the, uh, the last election. And I think if we hadn't done that, Senator Lambie, you'd be the first to, uh, to criticise us. So we, we took the proposition to the Australian people. They elected an Anthony Albanese Labor government. And I'm here tonight to implement um, the promise that we took to the Australian people to get through this uh, uh, cashless debit card. And that's eventually what we will do tonight. Senator Rustin. Um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, could I ask the Minister, is it the intention of the Albanese Labor government um, to have aged pensioners uh, uh, on the, either the cashless debit card, the basics card or your uh, new form of advanced um, technology or whatever you call it, enhanced technology? Is it the intention of the government uh, to place aged pensioners on this card? <coughs> Senator Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin, for her, her question. Um, the uh, only way that that uh, would happen would be if somebody volunteered or if the FRC um, uh, placed that person uh, on the scheme. Senator Rustin. Can I be absolutely clear that it is not the intention of the government to place income uh, to force age pensioners or service pensioners onto income management. The Commonwealth Government, it is not the intention of the Commonwealth Government <laughs> to place. No, 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 Senator, 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 let me finish, please. It is not the intention of the Commonwealth Government to place age pensioners or veteran pensioners on income management. I'm not talking about the FRC, I'm asking about the Commonwealth Government's intention to place age pensioners on the cash debit card the basics card or your enhanced technology card. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rustin, for her, uh, her question. Uh, I've answered that question already. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Um, well, could maybe could the Senator please explain to the Chamber and the Australian public why, about an hour ago, you voted against an amendment that explicitly requested that the Senate call on the government to ensure that no recipient of the age pension or a veteran or service pension will be placed on income management by the Commonwealth Government or any of its agencies. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Chair. Thank Senator Rustin for uh, her question. Um, we're uh, offering people a, uh, a choice here. And, um, that's um, the, uh, the effect of uh, the bill and the, uh, the, uh, the amendments. Senator Rustin. Um, could I just seek clarification? Um, was it the intention of the government to vote against an amendment that explicitly prohibited or prevented the government from placing people on income management? Not for people to volunteer, Senator Farrell but for the Commonwealth Government to place people on income management. Was that your intention? So you voted against that amendment. So that is, is that your, was that the intention? So you believe that the Commonwealth Government should have the right to place age pensioners, veteran pensioners or service pensioners on income management? Senator Farrell. Chair and thanks, Senator Rustin. Uh, look, um, we voted against uh, your amendment because we are the government. Uh, we have um, put forward a bill. We've amended that bill, and 
it reflects what we took to the Australian people at the last election. And I know you were the former minister in this uh, area, um, Senator Rustin, and I know you've got an attachment to the cashless uh, debit card. And I know there's a reluctance on the part of the opposition, because I see it every day in question time, to accept the result of the Australian people. But like it or not, the Australian people elected uh, an Anthony Albanese government. Um, the Prime Minister appointed um, Senator R uh, Minister R Rishworth to the, uh, uh, this uh, portfolio. And I have to say, she's been doing a terrific job, uh, both in uh, preparing this legislation and consulting with the Australian people about the introduction of it. And I know you're having trouble coming to terms uh, with that, uh, that change. And I know you think that amendments that you introduce should be supported by the government. But unfortunately, Senator Rustin, um, the Australian people didn't elect you uh, as a government. They elected the Anthony Albanese government. Um, and we're presenting our bills and uh, our amendments to the Australian people. We're presenting it to the Senate. Um, and uh, we are asking the Senate to make a decision about uh, what we have proposed. Senator Lambie. Okay, so, look, I'm sorry. I was just going to make a point of order. I don't know what all the jargon was about, but it was not answering the question. It'd be nice just to get the questions answered in here. If you don't know the subject, um, Minister, then maybe you need to bring in someone that does. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Chair. Um, Minister, when you were talking, when we were talking about the numbers of people that were transitioning off the card, you talked about giving people's rights back, which is certainly the case back in the four um, sites, the, the four trial sites. But of course, in the Northern Territory, um, we've got 4,266 people who aren't getting their rights back that they are being transitioned either back to the basics card or to the enhanced the new enhanced technology however you do acknowledge in the media release that there's going to be an 18 month consultation on making income management voluntary is that it just specifically is that just the northern territory that we're going to have this 18 month process for making all income management voluntary so covering people on the basics card as well as those people who have been transitioned off the cashless debit card onto the basics card now. And can you tell us some more about that process, please? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. And again, thank um, Senator Rice for a question. And thank you for um, taking such an interest in this area and uh, taking the trouble to read the, uh, the minister's um, press releases, which. Um, uh, explain much of what uh, what we're doing uh, today. Uh, under the uh, this bill and amendments, the uh, government uh, is delivering a long-term plan to ensure certainty, choice, and support to communities moving off the CDC program. First Nations people and other stakeholders have called for a measured approach to reforming income management. During consultation, they made the point that uh, transition needed to reflect the complex needs of the participants and to mitigate any disruption to the ability to manage their money, disbursements and ability to buy essential goods and services. We'll continue consultation over the next 18 months to ensure communities are supported to decide what the future of income management looks like for them. The government has considered whether to make changes to income management concurrently with the um, ab abolition of the uh, CDC. However, we do not recommend this approach due to the difficulties in accessing the large number of participants in the various locations which are uh, vastly spread out across Australia. Our proposed 18 months time frame will ensure that there is sufficient amount of time to consult effective communities on the look of the program, and it will also ensure the transition of participants in a supported and targeted approach, noting that many people 
that have been part of this program for more than 10 years. Thank you, Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Senator Farrell, I was hoping just to follow up on Senator Lambie's question earlier around claims by members of your party before the last election um, about the CDC. In a media release dated October 27, 2021, Labor MP Emma McBride said, Thousands of Coasties who rely on the age pension are at risk of being forced onto the cashless debit card scheme by the Morrison government. They have a plan to force 80 per cent of people's pensions onto a cashless debit card so they can control and limit how pensioners spend their money. Labor Deputy Leader, now Deputy Prime Minister Richard Miles, made a similar claim in a Facebook post from October 21 that said, Prime Minister Scott Morrison wanted to keep the card and extend it to all pensioners. Claims the government wants to force all pensioners onto the, the cashless debit card were also made by other Labor politicians, including Justine Elliott, Brian Mitchell, Kate Thwaites, Tim Watts and Julian Hill. In a media release dated October 25, 2021, Senator Rustin, in reply, said, let me make it crystal clear. The Morrison government will not force age pensioners onto the cashless debit card. We were never going to and we never will. Three days later, on October 28, Senator Rustin told a Senate Estimates Committee that she categorically rules out expanding the scheme to all pensioners, saying there never has, there isn't and there never will be under this government any intention to require age pensioners to go on to the cashless debit card. In an article that the, the AAP did, they found this claim by Labor to be false. My question to you, I guess, is uh, one, this I think really highlights the need for truth in political advertising laws. Um, and I really commend your commitment to electoral reform and look forward to working with you to ensure that this sort of thing doesn't happen in the future. Labor did a great job of conflating all income management with the CDC and my hunch is that there's a lot of Australians out there who think that your election commitment to repeal CDC simply means that all uh, compulsory income management is going, which, which isn't the case. And I look forward to seeing your plan to actually do that. I look forward to seeing your plan to work with communities. My question to Senator Farrell is, given Labor clearly has made these comments before the election, why, why not just own up to it? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, uh, Senator Pocock, for, uh, for your question and uh, for coming in uh, for the, uh, the debate. And uh, <clears throat> part of my uh, portfolio is, um, of course, um, dealing with uh, electoral form reform, and uh, I look forward to uh, working with you to do a range of um, reforms to the Australian uh, electoral uh, system. Um, you've mentioned uh, one, but there uh, will be many others, and uh, I uh, look forward to having some uh, cooperative uh, discussions um, uh, with you um, about what those reforms might uh, look like, and ultimately looking forward to your support uh, for those uh, very sensible changes to our electoral laws. Um, <coughs> Senator Rustin made a number of statements uh, in the lead up to the, uh, the last election. Uh, and uh, just to the question that you asked, um, I'd uh, put uh, to you that uh, the opposition did not rule out um, uh, the application of uh, the CDC to uh, pensioners. Uh, can I refer to Senator Rustin's comments as uh, minister? She's told uh, the uh, Channel 7 News in February 2020 that we're seeking to put all income management onto the universal platform 
which is the cashless debit card. Um, my office and uh, other offices, I'm sure Senator McCarthy's uh, offices uh, were uh, uh, contacted uh, with worries and fears uh, by pensioners. Um, and uh, um, as a result, um, we made our election uh, commitments. Now, Senator Rustin might want to walk away from those uh, statements that, or that statement that she, uh, she made, but look, um, that statement was made, it was unequivocal, and uh, we stand by what we said. Senator Rustin, can I just seek some clarification on the comment that Senator Farrell just made? Um, Senator Farrell, would you be able to, um, give to uh, explain to the chamber what income management is? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, I know, Senator Rustin, that you don't like being reminded of that comment. And I know that, um, look, I guess if you had your time again, you might uh, not have said uh, what, uh, what you said. But I think your, um, uh, your words were pretty unequivocal there. You're the one. You're the one in that statement that's talking about income management, and I know I know it's embarrassing that you said those comments, and I know it's particularly embarrassing because you said it uh, in front of a TV camera, and there is a record for it uh, of it. Um, but I'll repeat what you said. This income management is what you referred to. We're seeking to put all income management onto the universal platform which is the cashless debit card. Thank you. Senator Aston. Chair, I would just seek um, for the minister to answer the question of what is income management. That was not my question was, Senator Farrell. I didn't ask you about you know, your opinions about everything. I just clearly want you to, to articulate what is income management. That's all the question is. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, you obviously uh, <coughs> struggled to uh, understand what uh, income management was oh, when you did when matter. when you did that uh, interview. But let me explain it. Let me explain it to you. I know I know you don't like these answers, um, Senator Rustin. But at some point, at some point, you have to let go. There's been a change of government here. You have lost the portfolio. We've now got a terrific new, new young minister uh, who's uh, dealing with solving the problems that you created uh, over the, uh, the previous uh, nine or ten years. Um, the income management uh, scheme that you're referring to uh, actually predates the cashless uh, debit card program. Uh, it's been operating for more than 10 years in the Northern Territory, Cape York and 12 other communities across Western Australia, Queensland, South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria. Income management was created in uh, 2007 as part of the Howard um, Coalition Government's Northern Territory Emergency Response, often referred to <coughs> correctly as the intervention. As part of that scheme, income management was initially introduced to prescribed areas of the Northern Territory, including 73 remote communities, associated uh, outstations and 10 town camp regions. They form part of the Howard government's response to the high levels of alcohol and substance abuse that were linked to child protection issues described in the uh, Little Children Are Sacred report that was released in April 2007. The income management scheme was further developed and expanded under the Rudd Labor government. Income management is for people who are on income support payments, live in an income management location and who would benefit from assistance in managing their budget. It's a tool that helps individuals budget their welfare payments to ensure that they are able uh, to pay for the essentials such as food, clothing, housing and electricity. It works by making a proportion of a person's welfare payment income managed and directing it towards these essentials. The uh, key objective of uh, income management under section 123TB 
of the Administration Act are to reduce immediate hardships and deprivation by directing welfare payments to the priority needs of the recipients, their partner, children and other dependents. Help affected welfare uh, payment recipients to budget so that they can meet their priority needs. Reduce the amount of discretionary income available for alcohol, gambling, tobacco and pornography. Reduce the likelihood uh, that the uh, welfare payment recipients will be subject to harassment and abuse in relation to their welfare payments. And finally, encourage social responsible, socially responsible behaviour, particularly in the care and the education of children. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Um, can I thank Senator Farrell for, at last, actually putting on the public record the fact that uh, I did not say what I was accused of saying uh, by the then opposition and now government? Senator Farrell has just very kindly um, put on the public record um, that income management is actually uh, the mechanism by which um, people in the Northern Territory and the other sites around Australia uh, that he defined uh, received um, income management by, by way or means of the basics card. Uh, he has confirmed um, that the comments that I made uh, were about the superiority of the cash and debit card as a platform for the delivery of income management for those people that were on the basics card in the Northern Territory and other sites around Australia. Uh, and so I thank him very much for correcting the record. I really appreciate that, Senator Farrell, because for a very long time um, a, a number of your colleagues um, have been out there um, making a statement that you, you, clearly they knew was false and misleading. Um, but the fact that you have acknowledged that my comments referred to income management and that income management was the mechanism for the delivery of the basics card in the Northern Territory and other sites around Australia uh, is, very, uh, is very appreciated, Senator Farrell, the fact that you have now put on the public record uh, the misleading scare campaign that was run uh, by the opposition during uh, the election campaign and prior to it. So, uh, Could I just, um, while um, I'm on my feet, uh, Senator Farrell, just um, uh, seek some clarification in relation to whether uh, the department or the minister has taken any legal advice in relation to the Religious Discrimination Act in relation to this bill? Could the minister please advise whether the government or the minister has taken any advice in relation to the Racial Discrimination Act in relation to this bill, please? Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying, <laughs> Senator Rustin. <laughs> My apologies, Senator. Minister Farrell. I did, um, I did struggle to see why it might be. <coughs> and, um, it's interesting to note that Senator <laughs> Rustin makes um, mistakes. Um, you've made you made a clangor there, um, but the answer is. Um, I understand that uh, all the well, this bill in particular has uh, there has been uh, advice. Uh, in relation to the uh, application of the Racial Discrimination Act. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I'm um, just wondering whether you might be able to provide us some more detail, because um, as you probably would be a bit aware, when um, the Income Management Act was first passed, um, the then government um, actually had to suspend uh, the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, and considering that you've put on the record that 84% um, of income management uh, recipients in the Northern Territory are um, Indigenous and the, the removal of um, compulsory man income management from the other sites around Australia that have got a high percentage of non-Indigenous populations. I was just wondering whether you'd sought specific advice uh, in relation to um, non-compliance with the Racial Discrimination Act uh, and whether you believe that there was any need to consider the resuspension of the uh, Racial Discrimination Act in relation to the extension of the instruments that relate to in compulsory income management in the Northern Territory. Thank you. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. I thank uh, Senator Rustman for her, uh, her question. Um, <clears throat> look, I, I think the first observation I'd make is that um, you, as the Minister, uh, would have, uh, you'd, you'd be aware of advice that uh, has been received in respect of uh, the Racial Discrimination Act, in respect to this or the uh, legislation that you uh, dealt with in respect of this, uh, um, these issues. Um, the, um, um, look, it's not customary for us to release that uh, uh, advice. Um, you're obviously aware of previous advice um, in your capacity as, uh, as minister, uh, but we're not proposing to release that uh, legal advice. Senator Russell, I'm just um, seeking as to whether you said you're not intending to release the advice. Um, but I'm just seeking to understand whether you sought advice about the suspension of the Act. That's all I was asking. No, I, I'm not expecting to release the advice. Minister. All our bills receive advice uh, in respect of uh, the Racial Discrimination Act. Thank you. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator Farrell, does the government know how many additional staff Services Australia will have available to assist with people wanting to transition off the CDC as soon as they're able to do so. A number both on the ground in communities and also answering phones and emails. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Um, we'll seek some advice about that, and uh, as soon as I've got that advice available, I'll provide it to you. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Does the government have a date for when the new co-design process will commence for future income management, and how will you ensure that it is appropriately tailored to the unique needs of individual communities? Minister. Thank my assistants here. They're <coughs> on the ball with every uh, every question. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Pocock, again for your uh, for question. Um, the um, under the bill, and particularly the uh, the amendments. Um, it's our intention to um, deliver a long-term plan to ensure certainty, choice and the support of communities moving to the uh, CDC program. First Nations people and other sto sto um, stakeholders uh, have uh, called for measures, uh, me a measured approach to reforming uh, income management. During consultation, they made the point that tr transition needed to reflect the complex needs of the participants and to mitigate any disruption to the ability to manage their money, disbursements and the ability to buy essential goods and services. We will continue consultation over the next 18 months to ensure that the communities are supported to decide uh, what the future of in income management uh, looks like for them. The government uh, has considered whether to make changes to the uh, income management concurrently with the uh, abolition of the CDC. However, we do not recommend this approach due to the difficulties in assessing the large numbers of uh, participants in various uh, locations, which are vastly spread out across Australia. Our proposed 18-month uh, timeframe will ensure there is sufficient amount of time to consult affected communities on the look of the program. It will also ensure the transition of uh, participants in a supported and targeted approach, noting that uh, many people have been part of this program for more than 10 years. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Does the government know how much they will have to pay in due for the transition period 1 January to 6 March next year. Minister. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Pocock. Um, that amount is a uh, commercial in confidence uh, amount. Senator Lambie. Um, thank you. I was just wondering, will the government commission a review on the impact of the cashless debit card withdrawal um, so we can see the, obviously, uh, check out the stats and what's going on? Does the, how, you, how are you running this so we can all find out what's going on on a monthly basis? Um, and also uh, publish the transition plan to the department website once again, which I think you said you were going to get back on. But more importantly, how are you reviewing the withdrawal and when are we going to get updates on the withdrawal? Is that going to be monthly, quarterly? And who's doing it? Surely you've got someone ready to review it. You're pulling it. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Lambie, for your, um, for your question. Uh, I can advise that um, uh, we will publish a transition plan um, on, the, uh, on, the, um, uh, on the website uh, as requested. And to commission, and to commission a review. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, uh, really appreciate the questions that uh, we're hearing from Senator Pocock and uh, Senator Lambie. Uh, they've been able to, I think, get to the very nub of the the, the reason that we're we're here in this uh, in this predicament, uh, where we're debating the abolition of the cashless debit card. And what is the what is the genesis of the the fact that we're right here now talking about? Getting rid of a car that we know is helping communities, helping uh, helping vulnerable people to make better choices with uh, with their money and to provide protection to a you know, wider community, particularly the elderly and particularly women uh, in in these communities. We hear from from so many of them that uh, talk about the that impact. So, that what what is the genesis? And I think uh, I think you've really hit the nail on the head with those questions about the the lie that was spread. Uh, in the lead up to uh, in the lead up to the the campaign that the that the coalition was going to put people uh, put age pensioners uh, veterans indeed onto uh, onto the cashless debit card and this is why we're, we're now in this position because if you're going to make a lie true you, you've got to you've got to demonize the instrument that's actually been used to help communities to help people and and so you had to single out the, the cashless debit card as the instrument that's helping people, because they're, they're forced into a into a situation where, where because you are demonising it, and of course when journalists were asking the question, well, what are you going to do about it? You then said, well, we're going to abolish it without actually really thinking about the impact that it's going to have on the ground and in communities. And what we're now seeing with the amendments that we're dealing with here now. Is that they've actually, through the committee process, and, and credit to the government, they've actually listened through the committee process, where they've recognised that the basics card is a really old, redundant technology. It's a stored value card, which doesn't, you know, it's not universal. You can't use it everywhere. There's 16, less than 16,000 merchants you can use it in, compared to the cashless debit card, which is over 900,000 merchants or thereabouts that you can use it in. Uh, They've got to themselves into this position of, because, because they had to make their lie true. And we know that you can't make a lie true by just telling more lies, by just telling more lies. And, and what they're not doing here, and what we're not hearing from Senator Farrell, Minister, is, is, uh, is you're not coming forward with the truth about what this new card is actually going to look like, uh, or what it actually, uh, wh how it's actually different, because we know that the basics card is an old, redundant technology. You've acknowledged that you're, you're going to create this enhanced card. So I've got some questions in relation to what this new card is going to look like. So, Minister, can you start, please, by just explaining to us what the, some of the, can you detail it to us the features of this new? Enhanced card, please. Thank you. Minister. 
Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> boy, it took a long time to get to your question, uh, Senator uh, O'Sullivan. Yeah. Look, I know you've got. I, 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 I know you. I know you've got 10 minutes, but um, order, um, order. I mean, at least, at least uh, Senator Pocock and uh, Senator Lambie could think of uh, their own uh, questions. Uh, you didn't have to uh, uh, repeat uh, what they uh, they said. Um, I thought you were here earlier when I started talking about this issue, and uh, um, we're listening, we're listening uh, closely, but obviously uh, you weren't. So. Well, order, please. Well, order, Senator McKenzie. Well, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, thank you for that protection. Yeah, thank you for that protection. Um, so, how will the how will the system uh, how will the system work? Uh, Services Australia will open an account on behalf of a uh, participant uh, with a deposit-taking uh, institution. Services Australia will also issue a new card to uh, the person. The new card will be a debit card connected to the account. This will provide similar functions to the normal debit card. It will have tap and go uh, with the ability of the person to turn this uh, off if uh, they don't uh, wish to use it. It will have uh, internet uh, banking uh, using the, uh, the Visa system. Uh, it can be used in stores with access to FBOS or Visa card systems with the exception of block merchants such as uh, bottle shops. Um, an account exists uh, in both the CDC and income management programs. The account provides uh, the certainty that funds are available to pay the merchant when the card is used. This is essential <coughs> for any transaction card. The account will be uh, a bank account that allows a person to use the BPAY system to pay bills. A person will be able to set up direct debits from their account, and people uh, will not be able to with withdraw uh, cash from the account. Uh, services Australia will be responsible for customer-facing uh, services, including opening the account, issuing the card, the call centre functions, <coughs> issuing uh, temporary cards, providing uh, statements and websites uh, or participants. Participants will be able to get information on their account and transaction from Services Australia. This is similar to the services they provide under the income management program. <coughs> the uh, account provider will uh, perform the uh, back uh, of office uh, functions that support the card. These include providing uh, the uh, bank account, uh, transaction uh, processing, the system that uh, approves uh, transactions at the sale terminal, uh, payment of accounts to Visa and uh, FBOST, fraud monitoring and reporting to Services Australia. Um, <clears throat> in recognition of the unique role of the traditional credit union in providing banking services uh, on the country, uh, the <clears throat> government will seek to continue their contract and allow them to provide services to their customers. Uh, the, t the TCU are a not-for-profit Indigenous controlled organisation that employs local staff. Senator O'Sullivan. Look, uh, not, maybe my question wasn't clear. I was asking what the features of the new card is going to be, because the minister has actually just described precisely the cashless debit card. Exactly. I mean, and I'd like to seek leave to table a document here. Please, uh, that, I did provide the WIPS uh, notice of this before. It's it's from the DSS website. It's publicly available. I'm ha I mean, otherwise I can read it all out if you prefer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, because uh, this document here, which is available on the DSS website, describes pretty much word for word almost uh, what, what the minister has just described with the cashless debit card. So can I, can I just my next question is, uh, how different? Is there any difference between the so-called enhanced card or contemporary card, as it's referred in the EM? Uh, how, how different is it from the cashless debit card, or is it in fact the same? Very good question. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan for um, uh, his, uh, his question. Um, well, the short answer is no, uh, and that while the enhanced card Look, um, well, do you want to hear the answer? Just let him 
We've been going quite well here uh, tonight, Senator McKenzie. In a respectful manage, uh, manner, I respectfully listen to all of the questions and I respectfully try and answer them uh, without interruption. I, I do not interfere or interrupt uh, the questions that are being asked and I would like the same uh, respect uh, when I answer, uh, answer the question. And I try and answer the questions as honestly and uh, straightforwardly as, uh, as I'm able to do, and I'd like to continue doing that, with your permission. <laughs> um, uh, well, you weren't here a bit earlier, but I did indicate that uh, I've, in politics I've never saw civility as a weakness. Uh, in fact, I think we can generally <coughs> behave in this place in a civil manner. Um, <coughs> respectfully um, deal with all of the issues that uh, you'd like answered um, and then in due course vote on the legislation and implement uh, what the Australian people voted for at the last election, uh, which is the uh, end of this card. So <coughs> in answer to Senator O'Sullivan's uh, question, um, no, while the enhanced card will retain some of the technical functionality of the CDC, uh, this will be the case with any banking product with a debit card attached. The government has listened to communities that they want functions of this type uh, of banking product. However, the government's uh, amendments establish a program with important differences to the existing CDC program. All client interaction and management of the account will be done by Services Australia and are not for profit and not for a profit company. Uh, the government firmly believes that uh, participants uh, should not have to deal with a private company and our amendments return this role to government. Senator O'Sullivan. So will the new card be either on uh, the FPOS platform, Visa platform or MasterCard platform? Mm. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank um, uh, Senator Sullivan. <clears throat> I think I answered that question quite uh, clearly uh, in an earlier answer. It's the Visa platform. I might have, might Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. I might have, may have missed that. So, just confirming, the, uh, the the government is not seeking to be a deposit-taking institution. It's not going to hold the account on behalf of the, uh, the, the welfare recipient? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Sullivan um, <coughs> for uh, his uh, question. Uh, the account provider will perform the back office uh, functions that support the card, and these include providing the bank account, transaction processing, uh, the system that uh, approves transactions at the sale term terminal, uh, payments of accounts to the Visa and FPOS, fraud monitoring and reporting to Services Australia. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, will there be, for the enhanced card, will there be a tender process for the provider? Okay. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, Senator O'Sullivan, for his uh, question. Uh, the government is working to engage a third party provider to provide a modern card. Uh, for people leaving the CDC and moving back uh, to income management. Under the new arrangement, Services Australia will do all customer functions, such as taking calls, providing replacement cards and account balance requests. The third party provider would only provide the back of office functions of the card, such as maintaining an account so payments uh, are made to the uh, Visa FPOS, and merchants <coughs> processing transactions and reporting uh, to Services Australia. Specific negotiations with a third party uh, provider are commercial in confidence uh, and I cannot comment on the status of these. Senator O'Sullivan. 
Will card holders have to get a new bank account in addition to the the card? Finding the answer to that, will, will will there be support provided to card holders uh, because many of them have direct debits already in place uh, in with the with the cashless debit card? Um, you're essentially replacing it with the same thing, but you're going to have a new account. Uh, so, are people going to get help to make that transition to the same account that they've, same features that they've already got? Thank you, Minister. The account or the card number will change. Sorry, can you just repeat? Sorry. Sorry, Minister, could you repeat that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, neither the account or the card number will change. Senator O'Sullivan. Well, this is very interesting. So, if they're not changing the account number, I don't know if senators here have gone to a different bank. Uh, you, ch you, you have a different account number. You have a different BSB and account number. You have a different credit card number. I'm sure everyone here has changed providers, changed bank providers. You get a different number. So you've just said, can I just, just give you the opportunity to clarify, will there be a new number? Because if it's the same number, then it's still the same product. It's still the cashless debit card people. Just got a different name. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, I answered your question uh, previously. <laughs> okay. but we, people are staying on the cash debit card. You've just heard it. Yeah. All that's happening here is it's just getting relabeled. It's currently a silver-coloured card. It, it, maybe it will be maybe a different new picture. You might be able to get your face on it. You might get it printed with some pretty colours or something. I don't know. But so you've just revealed to us that it's it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay, so let's deal with a couple of things then, if it is the same. So currently on the basics card, if you're on a if you're a basics card holder, uh, you can't purchase pornography or tobacco. So with this new card, this new enhanced card, contemporary card, will you be able to uh, purchase pornography and tobacco? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, um, Senator Sullivan. No. <coughs> you won't be able to purchase. I just want to let me just be very clear. If you are a holder of the new card, will you be able to go into a store and purchase tobacco or pornography? Thank you, Minister. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Sullivan. Oh, look, I've answered that question already. Thank you. Point of order, um, Senator Malandiri, if you want to be the minister, I, I, Se Senator McCarthy, if you want to be uh, the minister able to answer the questions from this side of the chamber, I suggest you swap positions Senator with Minister Farrell. Senator Mackenzie, thank you. Um, we just uh, direct all the points of order through the chair. Thank you. Um, I believe Minister Farrell, can you take your seat? Uh, had, didn't answer the question. Is that correct? Um, Chair, I, I did answer the question. Okay. I know, Thank you. Just to clarify. I, I know the opposition are desperate to uh, keep this debate uh, going by asking the same question over and over and over again. But um, I've answered the question, and uh, I don't have any further comment to make on that answer. Thank you for clarifying that, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, I refer to the Guardian article that was published three days ago, which stated that the enhanced card will allow access to more merchants, online shopping, and BPay, and it will be delivered by Service Australia, which you've, which you've detailed to us tonight. So, uh, is it more merchants and services than the Basics card, or more than the cashless debit card? Like, is this is this 
an enhanced card? Is it enhanced on the cashless debit card that currently exists, or is it enhanced on the basics card? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Look, I'm sorry, uh, Senator uh, Sullivan. I haven't read the uh, Guardian uh, article. Okay, well, I'll just re, re ask my question. Is is the card the features that you talk about? The fact that there's it can be used for online shopping, fee pay, the things that the cashless debit card currently does. Uh, is is are the services enhanced? Is, is that based on the assessment of the features that are available on the basics card, or is it an assessment, if you're calling it an enhanced card or a contemporary card, is that based on the basics card, or is that enhancement of the cashless debit card? Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair. Um, uh, we're abolishing the cashless debit card, and uh, I don't know how many I don't know how many times I can say that, but I'll keep saying it until eventually um, you get the drift, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, we're abolishing the cashless debit card and we're making enhancements to the basic card. It's a very simple proposition and I'm sorry you can't understand it. Senator O'Sullivan. Well, then, can, can you explain how they've got the same number if it's been abolished? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Look, I've already answered the question over and over again. I'm not going to answer it again. So that's Senator right. O'Sullivan. Okay. So, uh, how much then will the, the government does the government estimate it will cost to develop a new enhanced income management technology? Minister. I'm sorry, uh, Chair. I didn't hear that question. Would you mind repeating Can you repeat it? Repeat the question. Yeah, the, no problems. Uh, how much will does the government estimate that it will cost to develop the new the new technology? Minister. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for a new line of questioning, Senator Sullivan. Uh, those issues are uh, matters, as you fully uh, would understand, are uh, matters of uh, commercial and confidence. Uh, Senator Ruston. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, Madam uh, Chair. Um, can I just um, uh, take you back to um, some comments that you made very early on in the night um, around the consultation that it had been undertaken um, prior uh, to the, um, the decision by the government to make the election commitment in relation to the abolition of the cashless debit card? Um, you listed a, a number of consultations that have been undertaken by Senator McCarthy uh, and, and other uh, ministers. I was wondering whether you would be able to table um, for us or provide us with um, a list of the consultations that um, were take, undertaken um, outside of the Northern Territory um, by uh, any of the ministers or, or members of uh, that your party at the time, prior to the election, you, you listed a whole heap of um, activities that had happened post the election, um, after you'd already made the decision. I was just wondering if you would be able to provide um, the information about the visits to uh, the four cashless debit card sites and the and the uh, the, North, and the the Cape York site. Whether you could provide us with information as to the consultations that occurred with those at those four sites and Cape York prior to the decision being announced by the, the now government when they were in opposition. Okay. Minister. Thank you, uh, um, Chair, and uh, thanks uh, to Senator Ruston for her question. Um, look, you're right. We did extensive uh, consultation after the, uh, the election, um, and I outlined that in uh, very considerable uh, detail in uh, one of my uh, earlier uh, answers. Um, we took this, <coughs> and I still think you don't quite get this concept. We took the abolition of the cashless debit card to the Australian people. Mm -hmm. Why did we do that? Because people like Senator McCarthy um, went around the Northern Territory for days, for weeks, for months, for years, in advance of the last election. And what was she being told 
by the people who were on this scheme, these people who were compulsorily forced to go on this scheme, she was being told that we don't want this scheme. So I couldn't tell you just how many people Senator McCarthy um, spoke to, but it was a damn lot of people. And for, for days, for weeks, for months, for years, she went around the Northern Territory and the rest of our MPs and our candidates uh, did the same. Um, <coughs> Minister, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Shadow, Shadow Minister uh, Burney, of course, um, did heaps of that, but um, <coughs> Marion Scrimshaw traipsed up and down uh, Lingiari talking with people about this. Luke Gosling, who got a 10 per cent swing to him, a 10 per cent swing to him at the last election, went up and down the seat of, uh, of Solomon uh, talking to people. And our candidates in other states, uh, wherever uh, the, the uh, cashless debit card might apply, they did the same thing. And we talked to people around the country. And what did they tell us? They said, we don't want um, the cashless debit card. And we took that to the Australian people. You, know, you might not like it, but we took that to the Australian people. And what did they do at that election? They elected a Labor government. And what are we doing here tonight? Well, we're implementing the policy that we took to the last election. And you might not like it, and you might not accept that the Australian people have made a decision about this, but they did. They did make a decision about it, and it's time for you to accept. Look, the coalition will never move on if you don't accept that the Australian people made a decision at the last election to reject your government, your government that had forced upon them the cashless debit card, and elect a government who was going to take that cashless debit card away. And that's us. That's us. That's that's Minister Rishworth. She's uh, brought to this place. It's already passed the lower house, and tonight it's going to pass. Will we hope, or tomorrow morning, sometime, it's going to pass the Senate. And you've got to get over the fact that the Australian people rejected you at the last election. They elected a Labor government, and what they want us to do is what we told them we were going to do, and that is abolish the cashless debit card. Senator Rustin. But you're not. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I was just wondering um, whether the minister might be able to tell me, um, within a thousand, how many people in the Northern Territory um, were consulted who had been forced onto the cashless debit card? Minister. Look, I can repeat. <coughs> I can repeat the last uh, answer I gave, but, uh, but, but I won't. Um, um, Senator McCarthy, Mr Gosling, uh, Mrs uh, Scrimjaw um, went out there and consulted and consulted and spoke and spoke and spoke, and there was a single message coming back from those people who were forced onto the cashless debit card. Um, we want you to change this, and in order to do it, we're going to elect an Anthony Albanese government, and that's exactly what they did. Senator Rustin, uh, I was just wondering whether the minister could tell us how many people in the Northern Territory um, are on the cashless debit card that uh, did not go onto the cashless debit card voluntarily. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, Senator Rustin, for the question. I went through in uh, quite some detail the, the uh, data that I had, uh, both in terms of the numbers and also the uh, number of um, uh, Indigenous First Nations people on it, uh, and uh, that is the information I'm uh, providing tonight. Senator Rustin. I'm just going to try one more time, um, Senator Farrell, but I'll give you a hint. Um, there is nobody in the Northern Territory 
that is on the cashless debit card that has not voluntarily chosen to go on the cashless debit card. So there is nobody, and I mean nobody in the Northern Territory, who has been compulsorily forced to go onto the cashless debit card. Uh, and so I think for the minister to come in here uh, and make statements about thousands and thousands of people being consulted in the Northern Territory who told um, you know, Senator McCarthy and Mr Gosling and, and a number of other people um, about, uh, about the cashless debit card and how they told uh, them that the, how they hated the fact that they had been forced onto the cashless debit card. Uh, I would uh, ask whether Senator Farrell wishes to correct the record and actually put on the record that there is no one—I mean no one—in the Northern Territory who is on the cashless debit card who hasn't voluntarily chosen to go on it. Minister. Um, look, Senator McCarthy is here. We can ask her all about the people that she spoke to in the Northern Territory. She can answer for herself. But I can tell you that what she will say is exactly what I told you. Senator McCarthy, Mr Gosling, the Scrimjaw, travelled around the Northern Territory. They spoke to people about um, what, um, what they wanted. We put a proposition to the Australian people. There was no equivocation about the proposition that we took to the Australian people. Uh, Shadow Minister um, Bernie, as she was then, <coughs> made it unequivocally clear, if you vote in a Labor government, then we will abolish this card. Why did they do it? Because they spoke to people in, these, um, in the Territory, in other parts of the country, and that was the message that uh, came back uh, to us. We want you to abolish um, the cashless debit card. And uh, we did it. We, we spoke to the uh, Australian people. We said, will you support us on this? And the unequivocal answer was, yes, we support you. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, Senator Farrell, you've been in this place for, for quite some time, uh, a lot longer than, than, I, than I have. Um, and you'll know that it is a standard convention that you do not mislead the Senate by providing false information. Um, you are on the record tonight, and I will ask um, the, the, uh, the President and the Deputy President review the record tonight. You have gone on the record and you have knowingly lied to the Senate. You have said that you and your Order. colleagues have consulted with people in the Northern Territory who have said to those people that they were compulsorily forced onto the cashless debit card. Uh, and in the absence of you being able to provide any information or evidence whatsoever that any person in the Northern Territory has been forced onto the cashless debit card, I would ask you to reflect on your comments and perhaps come back to this chamber at another time and actually uh, address the chamber about the fact that you continue to mislead the chamber, even though I actually have advised you that there is no way that anybody in the Northern Territory uh, has been forced onto the cashless debit card. Um, so, uh, Senator, I, I will just move on specifically to some questions um, directly around uh, the amendment. Um, uh, could the minister um, please advise the chamber? Is it the intention of the government for the FRC to determine the percentage of funds quarantined, or will they be required to meet the 50-50 rules as outlined uh, by other amendments? Thank you, Senator. Minister Farrell. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, uh, <coughs> Senator Rustin. And I absolutely reject the proposition that I've lied to uh, the Senate. I <coughs> take my integrity extremely. Um, yeah, yeah. seriously, and I absolutely reject your proposition. Everything I've said tonight, you may not like what I've said. You may not, you may not like what I said. You may not like what I said, and you may not like the result. You may not result the, um, like the result of the last election. Uh, but the reality is the Australian people 
voted for a Labor government that was going to abolish the, uh, the CDC. Um, as to this question, um, the answer is that that will be up to the uh, FRC to determine that uh, issue. Uh, thank you very much um, for answering the question. Um, what certainty have you provided the Family Responsibility Commission that your enhanced technology uh, that it will be able to be used at all sites that currently that the CDC is able to be used by those people, uh, and that is that it will be able to be used um, on all FPOS places, all online and overseas transactions. So, have you given an undertaking to the FRC that the current um, accessibility of service and outlets by your enhanced technology? Will be uh, that they will be able to use it at every outlet that currently they can use the CDC card. Minister, thank you, Chair. I thank you, Senator Rustin, for uh, her question. Uh, we can do even better than uh, than that, uh, Senator Rustin. Um, uh, the uh, FRC have examined the uh, the amendments and uh, have indicated that they can uh, comply with everything uh, they are required to do. Uh, could you confirm, please, then, uh, Senator, that your advanced technology will be able to be used at all places that the, ca the cashless debit card can currently be used at? Minister. Look, I'm not sure why the minister wants to ask the same question over and over again. I've just explain well I've explained to you that the FRC have looked at the amendments and they can meet all of the requirements under the uh, uh, under the uh, the amendments as proposed Senator Rustin. yeah look thank you um, and I heard your answer very very clearly Senator Farrell very very clearly what I'm seeking for you to answer is whether the enhanced technology that you are proposing will be able to be used at every site currently the cashless debit card is being used. It's a pretty simple question. That's a pretty simple answer. I've given it to you two or three uh, times now. They, look, the FRC are going to, they're going to do everything. I mean, I, I don't know how I can be clearer than what I'm... Order, look, order, uh, Senator Farrell. Anyway, I, I just can't be any clearer than what I've already said. Senator Rustin. Senator Farrell, I can only assume by the fact that you are refusing to answer my question that your enhanced technology will not be able to be used at all of the outlets. Senator McCarthy. <coughs> that is totally incorrect. Senator Farrell answered those questions earlier this evening. No, excuse me, and Senator McCarthy, that's not, that's not a point of order. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you. Um, perhaps, Senator Farrell, you might take on notice uh, the specifics of my question. Um, and that is, will your enhanced technology be able to be used at all sites that the cashless debit card can currently be used at? You don't have to give us the other answer again that didn't answer the question, but if you'd like to take it on notice, because clearly you do not either have the answer or the fact is that your enhanced technology won't be able to be used at all the sites that the cashless debit card can be used at. Um, I'm just wondering um, if the minister might be able to advise us as to whether uh, the government has made any commitments either to the Cape York Institute and Mr Pearson or the Families Responsibility Commission in relation to ongoing impound management in Cape York outside of what you've advised the chamber today. Minister. Uh, our uh, amendments uh, protect uh, the role of uh, those organisations um, and um, uh, yes, that's the answer. Can I take it from your answer, Senator Farrell, that you have made no additional um, undertakings to either of those two organisations in relation to income management going forward? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, our legislation is our response to those, uh, those organisations. They have had a look, they support, uh, and uh, in due course, sometime tonight, we're going to uh, pass that legislation. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Um, I, I just um, would like to put on the record that um, 
I would like the senator maybe to come back and answer the question as to whether there are any other um, commitments that have been made to either the Cape York Institute, Mr Pearson or the Families Responsibility Commission that have not been advised by either the minister tonight or the actions of this legislation. Senator Rice. Thanks, um, Acting Chair. Um, minister, in your evidence before about the consultation that has been done in the Northern Territory and the overwhelming evidence that people wanted to abolish the cashless debit card, I'm interested to know whether that consultation said that they wanted to abolish the cashless debit card in order to go back on to the basics card or an enhanced basics card, or whether they wanted to have the cashless debit card abolished altogether and compulsory income management abolished altogether. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator McCarthy. Sorry. Um, Could you just repeat that question, please, Senator? Uh, Senator Farrell's just popped out for five minutes. He will be back in. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator McCarthy. Um, and in fact, given that his evidence was that it was you that did a lot of the consultation in the Northern Territory about people wanting to have the cashless debit card abolished, it would be good to get your response to this. So that the evidence that Senator Farrell gave was that people in the Northern Territory who were consulted with overwhelmingly wanted to see the abolition of the cashless debit card. What I asked was in that consultation, did they say that they wanted to their, the people wanted to stay on the basics card or be transitioned from the cashless debit card onto the basics card, or was the overwhelming evidence was that they wanted to see the end of any form of compulsory income management altogether? Minister. Um, uh, thank you, Senator Rice. This, this began quite a number of years ago, uh, certainly uh, even prior to the 2019 election, where uh, First Nations organisations across the Northern Territory uh, either met with me personally or they travelled here to Canberra. So you'd have uh, groups like APONT, the Aboriginal Peak Organisation Northern Territory, you'd have the Central Land Council, you'd have the Northern Land Council, uh, you would have AMSAT, the Aboriginal Medical Services Alliance NT. So they came on numerous occasions here to the parliament. We even had from Central Australia, I think it was, uh, the Tungandjura. Uh, women's group who came down in 2018. And then I was able to take a couple of senators up north, and I do thank Senator Lambie, uh, who was one of those, and also the former South Australian senator, Rex Patrick. So both came up and, and also from the House, I'm trying to think who it was, one of the staffers that came from uh, Rebecca Sharkey's team. Uh, travelled as well. And in Central Australia, we went out to Papunya. Uh, we also visited uh, communities around Alice Springs and then went up to uh, Darwin and out to northeast Arnhem Land uh, to the Yulungu country and spoke with uh, the people from Millingimby. And there was also an opportunity, uh, I think it was only with uh, the former Senator Rex Patrick that we went to Nullumboy, so we were able to go that far as well. And on all of those occasions, Senator Rice, uh, First Nations people raised their concerns, uh, obviously wanted to talk about the basics card, were trying to understand what this new cashless card was and what that would mean. Uh, so that was important in the lead up to a debate that we had here in the Senate, uh, I think it was uh, late 18, early 19 that went to all hours of the morning. Um, so that was, uh, obviously that debate was about uh, trying to make some changes to the cashless debit card further going across the country. And that's why First Nations from the Northern Territory uh, advocates came down to make sure that the then Shadow Minister, Linda Burney, uh, was also consulted. And it was made clear uh, the opposition to the cashless debit card coming to the Northern Territory. Senator Rice. And, but to be specific, was that opposition to the cashless debit card coming to the Northern Territory 
meaning that they were happy to stay on the basics card, or was it opposite, did that include opposition to in compulsory income management altogether? Minister. There was certainly a view of um, being against uh, compulsory income management. Uh, there was also uh, the concern uh, in terms of the cashless debit card. Uh, the, the basics card, as you know, has a, has a history uh, that uh, didn't begin with grassroots people, as was raised in one of the, the meetings here. It, was, it actually began with the former Prime Minister and, and with Senator O'Sullivan's uh, former boss uh, with the, the Forrest uh, family. So we know that um, uh, the, the basics card came in with the intervention and then the CDC came in after the, uh, the re review, the report with the Twiggy Forrest report, and proceeded from there. So, so to answer your question, um, people were still unsure about the basics card because there was, there's grannies. Uh, there's women uh, who want to have that, and it was made clear. And I certainly know from my own experiences uh, in the Gulf country that some of them like it. Uh, they choose to be on it. But what people didn't like was the, the idea of being forced to go on to something. They also raised, uh, through those consultations, the need for further jobs. You know, the, the concerns around CDP uh, and the lack of jobs, and they also raised uh, the need to be able to um, have extra services uh, that would require, would give them support, whether it was around the care, care for their children, extra school programs, uh, certainly there was issues around extra housing. So they were asking for other things that helped the social lifestyle of families in these uh, communities. But it was very, very clear uh, from those meetings that I've mentioned, that compulsory income management was uh, something that they did not want. Senator Lambie. I just want to go back to um, the basics card, actually, because it is income management card, which you are now keeping in. Uh, we know that it was brought out in 2007 by the Howard government and Labor expanded it to a wider cohort of job seekers and not just Aboriginal people in 2010. Please tell me why you did that in 2010, yet we still have the same social problems around and you don't want income management now, apart from a basics card. Tell me why that is, because I don't understand this. Thank you. Minister. I think what I have to do, um, Senator Lambie, is perhaps give you um, my understanding of, of that journey with the, with the basics card. So when it came in in 2007 and was imposed on you know, pretty much, well, we have the numbers, you know, so many thousands of people across the territory, um, there was no review of that card until around, uh, for memory, between 2012 or 2010 and 2014. So the next decision was made in 2012. Uh, that was by, uh, obviously, going into the election here. Federal Labor took it over from, from um, the coalition. And I remember from a personal point of view, I, I was not in the federal parliament at the time, but from a personal point of view, we were lobbying our colleagues in Canberra to, to have a good look again at the basics card and wanting them to, to review it, to look at it. And I think, like all people in politics, you, you go into it in the hope that you can influence change, in, in my view, what I think is for the better. And so when I came in in 2016, and that position was still the same, it has been a deep concern for me that uh, here we had laws governing the people of the Northern Territory, but this parliament hadn't sought to review its own legislation, review and look into what was going on with the basics card. And, and that's something that is very close to my heart. Uh, I know that even with this particular legislation, which is on the cashless debit card, I know that there was no work done by the previous government into the basics card, and that has always troubled me. So I would certainly like to say, uh, should this uh, legislation pass through tonight, this parliament must 
look into the basics card in the Northern Territory. Now, half those families may say, don't touch it. We want to stay on it. We like it. It suits. It works for us in our communities. That's what they may say, but they've never really been asked because every focus has been on the cashless debit card. Senator Lambie, and then I'll come to Senator Sullivan. Mm -hmm. I think uh, my problem is I think we all know why those cards were issued back in 2007 by the Howard government. Those issues are still around. Okay. Yeah, we understand that. So I want to know why you're ripping the card off others and giving them a choice, but these people. You're going to put them on a new butte card if they want it, but they, they, they're, still on, they're on income management too. Income management is basic card and cash is debit card. It's income management. Actually, as a matter of fact, they're slightly different because one's 2080 and the other's 5050. So I just want to know what angle you're playing at here as a government. Look, I can, I can certainly tell you from from the way I see it, Senator Lambie, and it's this. If the previous government for nine years did no reviews whatsoever on the, on the basics card, and yet this Senate did six inquiries on the cashless debit card, it shows where the priority was for this parliament. There was no priority on the people of the Northern Territory. So why would we make a decision to do something with the basics card when there's been no work done whatsoever by this previous government. So we have to, we have to, we have to do it carefully and cautiously, and yes, that will take time. But in the meantime, the previous government had a flawed card, had a flawed card, and you know how flawed it was because the Yolngu people told you when you came order, up here to order, the Northern Territory. Order, Senator, so Senator that's Senator why when this parliament does not follow its own due process, and yet it does six inquiries into the cashless debit card. Six inquiries. That is the only information we had to go on as to what was not working with this flawed card. Now, these senators on the other side had the chance to fix that up, and you know it. You stood in this Senate and you called them out for it. So don't backtrack now. You remind them. You remind them of that, and you need to remember that. And yeah, look, you can check Senators, us and Senators keep us order. in check, McCarthy, and that's fine. To... That's fine. You can keep us in check, Senator Lambie, because let me tell you, I certainly will. But for now, the only information that is sufficient information for those Australians across the country is this card. The cashless debit card has to go. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, let's have a few questions, if I can. Uh, is the government aware of any deposit-taking institution in Australia that allows for bank account number portability, i.e. the ability to keep the same account number, the same BSB number, and shift to a different bank? So you're a Commonwealth Bank customer, your number starts in 016 or whatever it is, and you keep that same number if you transfer to ANZ or any other deposit-taking institution, aka bank, in Australia. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Look, I've answered this question already uh, this evening. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, We've been uh, spent two and a half hours and haven't progressed an amendment, so I'd like to move that the amendment be put. The question is that the amendment. The question is that the question be put. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against? The ayes have it. The question is that amendments one to four, six and eight to 13 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that items 20 to 26 and 38 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. 
those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. Thank you very much. We now move to further government amendments. Minister. Um, I seek leave to uh, move uh, amendment ZA181. Um, Excuse me, Minister, I think you mean sheet ZA181? Yes, is that not what I said? Yes, you said amendments. I'll repeat myself, uh, Chair, just to be clear. I seek leave to move items 1 to 16 on sheet ZA181 together, noting the question on some items will be put separately to enable the question that some items uh, stand as printed. Thank you, Minister. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, the government's uh, amendments allows for an enhanced technology option to provide a modern user experience for Northern Territory participants. It does not move any new people in the Northern Territory onto income management that otherwise wouldn't be the subject to the basics card. Mm. Senator Ruston. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr Chair. <laughs> um, could I ask the, the minister, um, the, just, to, just to try and get some clarity around so some semantics here. As we're sitting here today, could you advise me um, whether the amendment that you've just put forward on sheet ZA181 will mean that people um, in the, who are currently on uh, income management and have the cashless debit card, whether they will remain on the cashless debit card until such time as your enhanced technology option becomes available on the 6th of March. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Ruston uh, for that question. Yes. <laughs> Senator Ruston. Uh, thank you very much. Um, is it possible for people in the Northern Territory who are currently on the basics card to continue to transition onto the cashless debit card in the time period between now and when your more permanent form of income management comes into place on the 6th of March 2023? Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thanks Senator Ruston for her question. Uh, no. <laughs> Senator Ruston. Thank you. Uh, could I ask the minister, will the people in the Northern Territory uh, on the cashless debit card, currently on the, voluntarily on the cashless debit card, keep that card for the next six months? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin. Uh, they'll keep that card uh, until the uh, 6th of March uh, next year when they will be uh, transitioned. <laughs> Senator Ruston. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it the intention of the government to offer access uh, to the CDC in other sites that currently have the basics card income management in place? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Minister Ruston. Uh, we are not offering the CDC. We are abolishing the CDC, and that's what this legislation does. <coughs> Senator Ruston. Uh, can I seek some clarification from the minister? You're saying that the legislation um, that's before us abolishes the cashless debit card, and yet I thought in the previous answer that you'd given me you actually said that the cashless debit card would remain available to people who were on the cashless debit card uh, until the new form of income management um, came into place. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Perhaps Senator Ruston doesn't get it, but um, there's nothing, uh, nothing unequivocal about my previous answer. Senator Ruston. Okay. Um, perhaps I could just run through a couple of questions. So, um, income management um, has been operating in the NG lands in um, in Western Australia for some time. Um, the NG lands, they're next to the APY lands. Um, what happens now to uh, those people on income management um, following the passage of this bill? Minister. 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Uh, this bill does not deal uh, with that situation. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Um, income management has been operating in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, what happens now to the people on income management in Perth? Does this bill impact on them? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. No. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Income management has been operating in the APY lands in South Australia. Uh, what happens now to the people in the income management in the APY lands? What effect will this bill have on them? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks, Senator Rustin. Nothing. Uh, income management has been operating in the Greater Adelaide uh, area in South Australia. What happens to people in income management in Greater Adelaide? Will that have any effect from this bill? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Uh, no. Senator Rustin. Senator Farrell, um, income management has been operating in the Kimberleys in Western Australia. What happens to people in income management in the Kimberleys? What will the effect of this bill be? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, Senator Rustin, for your question. Uh, the answer is no. Um, income management has been operating um, in, uh, in Playford in South Australia. What happens to people on income management in Playford? What will be the effect of this bill? Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin, for her uh, question. The answer is uh, no. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Income management has been operating in the Greater Shepparton area in Victoria. What happens now to people on income management in Greater Shepparton? What is the effect of this bill? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Nothing. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Income management is operating in the Kirikura community in Western Australia. What happens uh, now to the people on income management in that community? What effect will this bill have on them? Minister. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank uh, Senator Rustin for her question. Nothing. <coughs> Income management has been operating in Bankstown in New South Wales. What happens now to people on income management in Bankstown? What is the effect on them of this bill? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rustin, for her question. Uh, nothing. Income management has been operating in Logan in Queensland. What happens now to people on income management in Logan? What is the effect of this bill on those people? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin. Uh, nothing. Senator Rustin. Income management has been operating in Rockhampton in Queensland. What happens to the people on income management in Rockhampton and what is the effect of this bill on them? Minister. To the end. I've got the list here. Minister. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thanks, Senator Rustin, for her uh, question. The answer, as she knows, is no. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Income management has been operating in the Northern Territory. What happens to the people on income management in the Northern Territory? What is the effect of this bill on them? Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin. Uh, I think that completes your list of questions, and as the other answers have been, the answer is no. Senator Rustin. The cashless debit card has been operating in Sejuna in South Australia since March 2016. What happens now to the people in Sejuna on the cashless debit card? What is the effect on them of this bill? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thanks, Senator Rustin, for her uh, question. Uh, as I think I've said on previous answers, they'll be uh, offered the uh, enhanced uh, technology that uh, this, uh, this legislation uh, provides. Senator Rustin. Uh, the cashless debit card has been operating in the East Kimberley in Western Australia since the 26th of April 2016. What happens to the people in the East Kimberleys that are on the cashless debit card? What are the effects of this bill? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Uh, the answer is the same as the previous one I gave. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Uh, Cash's debit card has been operating in the goldfields in Western Australia since the 26th of March 2018. What happens to the people in the goldfields as a result of the passage of this bill? Minister. 
Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, Senator R Rustin. Uh, the answer is the same as the two previous answers I've given. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. The cashless debit card has been operating in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay, Queensland since the 29th of January 2019. What happens to the people in, uh, in Bundaberg and Harvey Bay um, who are on the cashless debit card as a result of the passage of this bill? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, Senator Rustin. Um, the answer is the same as the three previous answers I've given. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Well, um, and, and I thank the Minister for his uh, direct and short answers to the questions. So what we have um, just heard uh, from the response that we received from the Minister is the sum total of the effect of this bill on recipients of income management across the whole of Australia is the fact that uh, there will be uh, an offering of an enhanced technology to people in four sites, Sejuna, East Kimberley, Goldfields and Bundaberg and Harvey Bay. And apart from that, this bill does absolutely nothing. Um, the people of Cape York, we found out through prosecution of the previous amendment, uh, will remain on the cashless debit card. The people of the Northern Territory, who have transitioned from the basics card onto the cashless debit card, will remain on the cashless debit card. And those people in the Northern Territory who are currently on the basics card will be forced to remain on the basics card because of the extension of instruments that uh, are, is being undertaken uh, by this government this week as well. In all of the other income management sites across Australia that I had listed in my previous questions, there will be no change. Every single person that is currently on compulsory income management in those sites will remain on compulsory income management in those sites. So what the minister has basically just done is, I think, build the cat. Um, what we have seen is that this bill is, uh, is basically a shell of what they promised when they went to the last election. They went to the election and they promised that they were going to abolish the cashless debit card. This bill in itself is called the Social Security Administration Amendment Repeal of Cashless Debit Card and Other Measures Bill 2022. The cold hard facts are really this bill should read Social Security Administration Amendment extension of the cashless debit card and other measures bill, because what we have heard from the minister tonight is that there is no effect whatsoever on compulsory income management as it is currently outlined under the uh, income management legislation, and that all we are seeing uh, is a so-called transition onto enhanced technology, um, which we have heard in answers uh, given to other members in this place, is that people will still have the cashless debit card. And even when they are supposedly being transitioned over onto this new technology, they will still have a card with exactly the same number on it as is currently on their cashless debit card. And as we all know, you can put as much lipstick on this pig as you like. The fact is that the cashless debit card is going to remain in place. This is one of the most embarrassing backflips I've ever seen. The only thing I can say um, is there are some small mercies by what's happened here tonight. Um, obviously, the government has been forced into listening to a community like Cape York, and we've seen an amendment that has enabled the Cape York to be able to continue with the functionality that they have fought so long to be able to have, despite the fact that this government, without consultation, went to the election and said they were going to abolish the cashless debit card in Cape York. They clearly hadn't spoken to the members of the Cape York community because, of course, they would have told them at the time that they didn't want the card to be abolished, which they've subsequently told them they've backflipped on it. And I have to say I'm pleased that they have backflipped on that because the, the community of, uh, of Cape York clearly have worked very, very hard to try and deliver good outcomes for the members of their community. Um, so uh, it is extremely, extremely disappointing um, that despite all the fanfare and all the con that we have seen um, from those opposite, that the, fact, the cold hard facts are that this particular bill does really very little. They've tried to, uh, to cloak this in some sort of amazing sort of uh, decision and delivery on an election promise. They have delivered very little by this legislation tonight. Um, the government, uh, yeah, uh, but the opposition is not going to stand in the way of the amendment that is before the chair, um, because we believe that it is appropriate for people to be able to have some continuity and some consistency. Uh, so we are happy that the government is actually making the decision to allow people who are on the cashless debit card uh, in, the, uh, in the Northern Territory to remain on the cashless debit card. 
Uh, and we look forward to seeing what the government comes back with with its enhanced technology option. I uh, will make you a fearless prediction in here that the government will come back with the cashless debit card technology. They'll probably pop it in a different act. They'll probably give it a different name. But the cold, hard reality is that what they will come back into this place with is the cashless debit card dressed up as something else. Uh, if those officers would like to, to disagree with me, I'm more than happy for them to do so. But you can be assured that every single person in this place will be watching what you're doing because this has been nothing more than the most monumental con of the Australian public. You have not sought to abolish the cashless debit card. You have actually sought to extend it in some places. You have not sought to get rid of income management. You are intending to extend income management by the extension of instruments that put in place income management across the Northern Territory and all of those sites that I have just listed here where you have said there will be no change to income management in those sites. So, as I said, the government will support this amendment. We will support this amendment because we think it is the right thing to do. I mean, the opposition will support this amendment because we believe it's the right thing to do. And we thank the government for actually listening, actually listening to the people in the Northern Territory. So, despite the fact that uh, Senator Farrell has continuously misled this place by saying that there are people in the Northern Territory who have been forced onto the cashless debit card, there are none. But at least you have given those people that voluntarily chose to go onto the cashless debit card the opportunity to remain on the cashless debit card. And I look forward to seeing the legislation that you intend to bring back into this place to put what you are proposing for income management going forward. But I just put you on notice that if you think that you can bring back the cashless debit te card technology under some other different name and popping it into a different act and thinking that we're going to believe for one minute that you have done anything apart from extend the cashless debit card in this country, you are sadly mistaken. You need to come clean with the Australian public about what your intentions are. I think it's been very clear from all of the amendments that you've put forward. It's been very clear by the $50 million that you have re-announced on Saturday uh, to go towards drug and alcohol um, services, that you know that the removal of the compulsory nature of the cashless debit card in those four sites uh, that are going to voluntary cashless debit card, um, there is a very, very high chance that we will see significant increases in social harm, significant increases in domestic violence, significant increases in police presentations and hospital presentations uh, and child neglect. You know that's the case and that is why you have put this band-aid of additional funding onto it. But as I said, the opposition will not stand in the way of this amendment because we believe that it is appropriate for people to at least be able to have some sort of consistency going forward. Your decision that you put forward put to the election uh, to the people at the election was ridiculous. You've obviously realised that yourselves. Uh, so we will be supporting this amendment. Senator, Minister. Chair, and we appreciate the support uh, from the opposition in the interest of progressing the bill. I move that the amendment be put. The question, the question yeah. be put. I put the question that the question be put. Those for the question say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. I put the question. There are two questions, but I put the first question that amendments 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against. The ayes have it. I now put the question that items 2 to 6, 8 to 10, 12 to 14, 16, 18, 27, 40 and 63 of Schedule 1 stand as printed. Those for the question say aye. Against no. no. The noes have it. We now come to uh, government amendments. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Chair. I seek leave to move uh, items 1 to 5 on sheet uh, TK326 together. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move the amendments and uh, <coughs> indicate that the government's amend amendments allows for an enhanced uh, technology option. Uh, any, participate, uh, any participants wanting to voluntarily stay on income management 
in the uh, other four cashless debit card sites. That is Sejuna, East Kimberley, Bundaberg, Harvey Bay and Goldfields. Senator, Senator Sullivan had the... Senator Rice. So look, I didn't get a chance to speak to the last lot of amendments. But for this one, I'm very happy to speak um, to these amendments and for the Greens' support for these amendments, which would allow for voluntary income management for people who find income management to be of value to them. And I have spoken to, to people who, indeed, that is the case. I've heard many stories and many examples of people who say that it's a useful thing for them to have. Um, then we are happy to support that. There's a very big difference between choosing to use something as a tool that helps people and to, that a person individually chooses to say that this is going to be helpful to me in terms of managing my finances and having, some, having income management forced upon people with absolutely no choice. We're very happy to support this, but reiterate that big difference between voluntary income management, choosing to be able to use this, versus having compulsory income management forced upon people, blanket across the board, which is still the case. And as the, the opposition have just stated, that there is going to be ongoing income management in far too compulsory income management in far too many places across the country despite the fact that it has been shown to fail. It does not work. It does not address the social problems that it is aimed to, aimed to address. There has been so much research that shows that, in fact, it can even have a negative impact. Compulsory income management in recent research um, has shown that it is negatively correlated with, um, with birth weight, for example. So I think for all of the talk about the value of the cashless debit card in a compulsory way, the evidence just does not stack up. And in fact, what we need to be doing is, as well as having one tool like this one, voluntary, a voluntary tool, is to be giving people much more support, and in particular for people who are living on inadequate income support to be increasing the rate of income support, because so many of the problems that so many people around this country have in managing their income, if they are living on income support payments, is that it is just far too little, way below the poverty line. And the impact that has on people is absolutely dire. People who just cannot afford to, to eat three meals a day, even two meals a day, people who cannot afford to pay the rent, People who cannot afford to put clothes on their kids, to put sh shoes on their children's feet. People who can't afford medication to tackle the, and people who can't afford to go off and, and in fact see medical practitioners where there is a gap fee involved. We need to be tackling the fundamental issues that are at play here. And Increasing the amount of income support to above the poverty line is an absolutely fundamental part of that. So people, and we, we have had the evidence during the COVID supplement, um, during, the COVID, during the COVID lockdowns, when the rate of income support was doubled. And there's absolutely wonderful research that was done there that showed so many people were able to get their lives back on track were able to participate in the workforce, were able to pay to get their washing machine fixed, were able to pay to get their car back on the road, were able to go off and have their medical problems treated because they had enough money to live on. So we will support this measure of saying, yes, here's one tool that people might find useful, but it needs to be put in the context of all of the other things that need to be done. And the fact that the government is not choosing to do them is a choice. Keeping people in poverty is a political choice. And so we would urge the government, as well as taking measures like this one to give people this tool of being able to opt in to voluntary income management, to take all of the other measures that need to be taken, in particular raising the rate of income support so that people are no longer living in poverty. Uh, Senator Sullivan or was oh, oh, sorry. Get a chance no, I to can, I respond. That's the normal. Senator Farrell, to get the call. 
my end things work. Um, look, I just note that I um, appreciate Senator Rice's uh, comments and uh, note that they're not particularly uh, relevant to this particular piece of legislation. But uh, can I uh, say that the uh, <coughs> Albanese uh, Labor government is deeply committed to building a welfare and social security system that is a strong safety net that protects vulnerable Australians and doesn't stigmatise anyone for needing income support. Uh, those, uh, well, the government knows that um, those who are receiving income support are facing cost of living pressures and that's why we are acting uh, to provide relief, relief across uh, the government. Uh, this month has seen the largest indexation increases to government allowance in this country in more than 30 years. It saw 4.7 million Australians receive a much needed boost to their payment, including those on uh, JobSeeker. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you um, very much, um, Chair. Um, the, uh, the opposition will be supporting the amendments that have been put forward and just been moved by. Uh, Senator Farrell on uh, sheet number TK326. Um, but um, in, before um, I, uh, we uh, give our support to these formally, I um, just want to have a few questions I'd like to um, ask uh, the minister. Uh, has there been any contractual costs incurred uh, to the government to move from the uh, compulsory um, cashless debit card scheme in these sites to the voluntary scheme that is being proposed by this amendment? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thanks, Senator Rustin, for her question. As she would know, these matters are uh, matters of uh, commercial uh, inconfidence, and uh, I'm not proposing to answer them here tonight. Uh, Senator Rustin. I, I, I ex uh, respect the fact that you um, uh, are not going to give me an exact amount. I was merely asking you whether there had been any cost. I didn't ask you what that cost was, so I was wondering whether maybe you could advise us if there has been any cost at all. Minister. Um, look, the answer is the same. Um, these are matters of uh, commercial uh, incompetence. As a minister under the previous uh, government, you'd be well aware of that, uh, and uh, I don't uh, propose to uh, answer that uh, question. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Can I just give you notice that I will be asking these questions in estimates uh, and you probably need to have your public interest immunity ready to go as to why you would think a, an answer as to whether you incurred any cost in any way could not be in the interest of the public. Uh, so, um, uh, Minister, on Saturday um, the, the Minister for Social Services made an announcement in relation to funding to go towards drug and alcohol um, services in the sites that, uh, that are going to go voluntary. Um, I was just wondering when the services that were being proposed by the minister will actually be on the ground in those sites. Well, that's kind of the we are pulling the cashless debit card out of them. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Rustin. And I point out that we don't need her gratuitous advice on how to answer questions in mm. estimates. Um, could you clarify, in respect of your last uh, answer, what particular services you're re referring to? Uh, Senator, I was referring to the $50 million or $49.9 million, the announcement that was made by Minister Rishworth on Saturday in relation to drug and alcohol services that are set to go into the sites where the cashless debit card is going to move from being a compulsory tool to being a voluntary tool. And I was just wondering when those services would be available <coughs> to the people in those sites. Minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank uh, Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Well, as we um, previously pointed out, um, your government committed all of that uh, money but never spent a zack of it in all of the time that you've, uh, you've been in, uh, in government. Um, we've made a commitment, and, uh, Senator, uh, and uh, Minister uh, Rishworth has uh, made uh, a commitment that we will spend that uh, roughly $50 million. Uh, we'll be talking to the communities where the, the, uh, where the money is going to be spent, um, and I can assure you that we will be rolling out the assistance that that money will be uh, provided as quickly as we can. 
Senator Rustin. Yeah, thank you, uh, Minister. Um, we're just wondering, in relation to the services that will be um, available to people who um, transition off the card uh, when they're able to go from compulsory to voluntary um, uh, cashless debit card in these sites, um, would, whether you may be able to outline some of the services that will be available uh, when, at ascension when this actually occurs? What supports will be in place for those people? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank uh, Senator Rustin for, uh, for her uh, questions. Um, we, uh, I previously outlined in, I mean, I did make the point that you were in fact asking questions that didn't relate to the particular amendment that was uh, before us. Um, I did answer this question in, uh, in an earlier uh, answer, and I would uh, refer uh, Senator Rustin to my earlier answers. She's obviously looking up the, uh, the Hansard for a whole range of other things. You can uh, dig up that Hansard and you'll be able to understand everything I've previously uh, answered uh, this evening. Senator Rustin. Carol, I fear I will never understand every answer that you've given me this evening because I don't even think that God himself would understand the answers that you've given tonight. Um, so uh, I was just wondering, um, uh, Minister, whether the department has done any modelling as to the number of people it believes were, are likely to seek to come off the cashless debit. At work. How many have, have you done any modelling, or do you have any figures in relation to the number of people uh, in the, cash, the four cashless debit sites that this particular amendment refers to, as to how many you believe are going to come off, and how many people you think will voluntarily stay on? Minister, thank, Chair, thank you, Chair, and thanks, Senator Rustin. Um, perhaps uh, Senator Rustin was out of the uh, the room, but uh, Senator Rice did uh, ask that question uh, earlier. Uh, in the evening, and uh, I don't wish to uh, repeat myself again. I make the offer for you to uh, grab Hansard um, at your leisure, and you'll be able to read the answer to that uh, question. <coughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Oh, oh, uh, yeah. um, yeah. uh, so I'm just wondering um, whether the government has got any uh, modelling as to the um, the likelihood of increase in social harm activities that are going to occur in each of these four sites, uh, such as you know, uh, domestic violence, child protection, etc. Have you done any modelling? Um, I'm not asking you for the numbers. I'm just asking, have you done any modelling? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thanks, um, uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, we, uh, we committed uh, previously uh, to Senator Lambie to, uh, to do a review, which will be uh, published, and, uh, and that's what we intend to do. <coughs> Senator Rustin. Can I just quickly confirm, so I, I heard you say that to Senator Lambie. I was just asking, have you done any modelling to date um, as to the kind of services that may be required in these communities when the cashless debit card is no longer compulsorily uh, incurred in, that, in those communities? Minister, I thought the, uh, with all due respect, I thought Senator Rustin had uh, jumped up again, and I was respectfully uh, listening to um, any other question uh, she might have been uh, seeking to ask me. Uh, my last question, uh, Senator Farrell, on this amendment: um, Has the government offered the four trial sites, um, Kimberley, Sejuna, uh, Goldfields, and Harvey Bay, Bundaberg? Uh, the opportunity to retain income management um, by version of the cashless debit card in the same way uh, that you have allowed Cape York to retain the cashless debit card. Has that offer been made to community elders in those communities? Minister. Look, I, I can probably say this over and over and over and over again, uh, Senator Rustin, but we are not offering the uh, cashless uh, debit card. <laughs> Senator Rustin. I'm just seeking clarification on your answer. You've just said that you are not offering the cashless debit card, and yet in a previous answer you said that the cashless debit card will still be uh, available to. Um, people in Cape York and people in the Northern Territory and voluntarily in the trial sites around Australia until such time, uh, until the 6th of March 2023. Could you confirm uh, whether which of your answers is correct? 
Minister. Thank you, Chair, and um, I thank uh, Senator Rustin for her uh, question. Uh, look, I've answered this over and over and over and over again. <coughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have just foreshadowing. I've just got a series of questions here. So if we could keep the call, if that's okay, if it, up to the Senate. Uh, so uh, the government have uh, said uh, th throughout this debate and even the lead up to it uh, that the transition for uh, for participants needs to be staged and needs to be slow uh, with individual support, which makes sense. Uh, so if someone chooses. So I've just got, my question is going to really go to the mechanics now of how people are going to transition. So if someone chooses to move to voluntary income management, how will that process work and how will it be staged? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, <clears throat> thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan for his. Uh, his question and thank you for your endorsement uh, of, uh, of our bill um, in your last uh, answer. Um, <coughs> respecting, no, no, I appreciate that. I didn't think I'd hear it uh, tonight, but uh, very much appreciate your um, endorsement of uh, the legislation <coughs> and uh, look forward to you voting uh, with us uh, on this very sensible uh, proposal. Um, but in answer to your question, uh, People will be able to uh, opt out of the CDC from the day after the bill receives royal assent, uh, which we expect to be the 4th of October 2022. There are no processes or exit applications required to do this. CDC participants, uh, with the exception of those in the Northern Territory or Cape York, who want to leave the CDC program can simply call Services Australia and say they no longer want to participate. Senator Sullivan. So once they've called Services Australia, how long will it take for them to transition off the CDC? Minister. Yeah, and uh, thank uh, um, Senator Sullivan for uh, Sullivan. A sensible uh, question. Uh, a maximum of seven days. <laughs> Senator Sullivan. Seven days does seem rather quick, uh, given the changes that uh, individuals will have to make, uh, arranging new bank uh, transfers, uh, regular deposits and transfers that people have. So, uh, How will you facilitate that rapid transition? Minister. Th thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, we're just a lot more competent government than uh, you ever were. And, uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah. Proof is in the pudding. Proof is in the pudding. Uh, but uh, when we when we say that uh, that's the time frame, that's what we are committed to. And uh, I go back to the <coughs> 50 million that you uh, said that you were put aside for drug and uh, alcohol uh, uh, abuse. Not a zack cent spent. Um, when we say we'll do something, when this government says we'll do something. That's exactly what we'll do. <laughs> Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, with, with respect, that seemed to be quite a flippant response. I mean, oh, this is a this is a uh, quite a significant change for people to make. Uh, so I'm just interested in what sort of services will be there. Will Services Australia be on the ground to actually help people with this transition? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan again for another. Uh, sensible question, and the answer is yes. Senator O'Sullivan. Now we heard. I sat through the uh, the inquiry into this bill, and we heard from a number of witnesses that spoke about the shield that compulsorily been on the CDC provided to them, because they were, frankly, when they were uh, uh, hassled or humbugged, as some would call, uh, by other members of the community to hand over cash, uh, they were able to hold up their card, whether physically or figuratively, and say, it's not me, it's the government that's put me on this card, and, uh, and there's been a, a shield for them, if you like, uh, to deal with the coercion that often occurs within these communities. And we heard 
This is uh, mainly from, from women and elderly people in the community. So what measures is the government putting in place to ensure that cardholders are protected if they choose to voluntarily stay on the cashless debit card, bearing in mind that members of the community and their family and others could uh, uh, put extra pressure on them for now having voluntarily made this decision? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. I thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan for his uh, um, questions. Look, um, the bill um, pro provide. Yes, no, we've thought it through, and uh, obviously you weren't here a little bit uh, earlier in the evening when I uh, explained the extent to which uh, we have uh, consulted uh, with uh, the communities that are affected. Uh, by the cashless uh, debit card. Um, we've said to those communities that we're going to give back to them uh, what they've told us uh, they wanted, which is, uh, which is choice. Um, you made it uh, compulsory. We're offering uh, Australians uh, a choice. Uh, and I'd be confident that, um, well, hopefully, the sorts of issues that you have raised um, won't present themselves once we get back to a situation where um, people can make their own decisions about their own uh, financial management. Words, uh, word hopefully. Can the minister guarantee that no one will be harmed or feel any coercive pressure? from others in the community as a result of their voluntary decision. Uh, thank you, uh, you Chair. Uh, thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, look, I, I just hope, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, that you're not uh, seeking to uh, scaremonger um, here. Um, um, I, I've said this earlier um, tonight, and I'll, I'll say it again. Um, we consulted with communities. I went through in some exhaustive detail the amount of, the amount of um, uh, effort that uh, Senator McCarthy and uh, her colleagues in the Northern Territory and the Labor Party went to, uh, to, consult, to consult with people about uh, this issue. Um, we went to the last election with this policy. The Australian people, including the people in the Northern Territory, voted for this uh, government and what we are doing here is implementing the promise that we took to the Australian people. And I understand um, that you don't like that result, um, but the reality is that that's what the Australian people voted for uh, and we intend um, to do what we said we would do um, and uh, that is uh, pass this piece of legislation, which uh, hopefully we'll do sometime tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. Senator Sullivan. Uh, Minister, you, you mentioned the Northern Territory and, uh, and the result of the election there. Uh, you've, not throughout, you've mentioned that several times now throughout this debate. You've not mentioned the seats of Hinkler, O'Connor, Durack or grey, seats that all were able to see the return of coalition members, uh, members that have been very vocal in their communities about their support of the cashless debit card. It was very clear to people that were voting ahead of the election in those electorates their position on the cashless debit card, and they were all returned. Can the minister explain that difference, please? Good Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator, Senator O'Sullivan. I don't have the results of all of those uh, seats uh, in front of me, and, 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 but, but I do. My, my guess is, my, my guess is 
that in all of the seats that uh, you uh, you just you just mentioned, um, Labor got Labor 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 got a Labor got a swing to it, and one of the reasons we're now on this side of the uh, chamber rather than the other side of the chamber is um, we got a majority of seats at the last election. So the Australian people voted in an Anthony Albanese government, <coughs> obviously for very good reasons. As we've seen over the last uh, three months, what a terrific job uh, <coughs> Prime Minister Albanese has uh, done. He's, uh, He's been a fantastic uh, example of what a prime minister ought to be and uh, what a prime minister ought to do. And uh, I think when uh, tonight, either tonight or early in the morning, uh, this legislation passes, once again the Australian people will know that if an Anthony Albanese government says they're going to do something, that's, that's what they'll do. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rice. And look, um, <laughs> I'll be very short. That's right. And in fact, I want to seek the indulgence of the minister because this is a question that's actually related to the last amendment that was moved that I couldn't ask because the question was put, which I didn't get to, <laughs> didn't complain about. But it was basically whether in the Northern Territory. When people are being moved off the cash of debit card onto the enhanced income management, um, whether people who are on the basics card will have the, the choice to also move on to the enhanced card. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, um Thank you, uh, Senator Rice. And uh, um, we're, we're currently looking at all of those uh, all of those issues and all of those options at the moment. And uh, the moment that uh, a final decision is uh, is made, I'll come back to you with an answer. Senator Rice. Okay. And then my sep sec second question is then: So it looks like in the Northern Territory we're going to continue to have these two different. Um, types of income management. We'll have the enhanced card and then we'll have people on the basics card. One of the differences between the cashless debit card and the basics card was there were different provisions as to whether peop as how people could get off it or apply to get off it. With, on the cashless debit card, the exemptions for the cashless debit card were if people could um, were able to make the case that participation would pose a serious risk to their mental, physical or emotional well-being, or that they could demonstrate reasonable and responsible management of their affairs. Um, whereas for the basics card, um, the ability to get off the basics card, people have told me, is much more limited. And in particular, if somebody is on the basics card in the category of being a vulnerable welfare recipient program participant, it's almost impossible for them to get off the card. So what I wanted to know is if in this new enhanced um, income tool that people from the cashless debit card are being moved on to, what are the criteria going to be for people to be able to apply to get off that card? Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rice. And, uh, <coughs> we are, of course, happy to answer questions that uh, related to a uh, previous uh, amendment. Um, look, the, I, I suppose the truth of the matter is that this uh, legislation doesn't uh, specifically deal with the, uh, the issues that you've just raised, but I, I will say this, that uh, some people uh, are able to apply for an exemption from income management through Services Australia, and uh, if granted, uh, an exemption means a person is exempt from um, income management. Uh, for 12 months unless their circumstances change. Uh, circumstances where exemptions can be granted including, <coughs> include if you don't have dependent children, you can uh, be exempt if you're either a full-time student or an apprentice and less than 25 per cent of your basic rate of payment for at least uh, uh, four of the last uh, six fortnights and uh, get special benefits uh, and are uh, 16 years or older. <laughs> Senator Rice. 
Um, thank you, Minister, and thanks, Chair. So, are these criteria for these exemptions are they going to change for people who are being moved off the cashless debit card onto the new enhanced technology, or will there be the same criteria for exemptions? Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Senator Rice. Um, look, you're asking questions that don't particularly relate to this uh, oh. this uh, this piece of legislation, uh, but I'm happy to uh, uh, come back to you at a later date and uh, provide you with uh, some answers to the questions that you're uh, you're asking. Senator Rice, with respect, this is absolutely. This legislation shifts people off the cashless debit card in the Northern Territory onto a new technology. And so my question is, and look, I'm happy for you to take it on notice and get back to me, but I think the question is very valid as to whether the same conditions are going to apply for people who are then compulsorily on this new enhanced card compared to when they are on the cashless debit card. And the connection with my previous question is if people on the basics card are able to apply to go on to the new enhanced card, well then the conditions it may be easier for them to get off it, which I think is of great significance because um, we know that there are a lot of people who are currently on the basics card in the Northern Territory who do not want to be on it. And so if they are able to apply and actually have it a um, an easier mechanism to actually apply to get off the basics card, that would be a very big step forward, which could be implemented immediately. Minister. Uh, thank you. I okay. move that the uh, amendment be put. Okay, the, the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Uh, the question is that the question be put. All those of that, uh, can you say aye? Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is now that the amendments be agreed to. All of those op that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. We now move to opposition amendments one to four on sheet 1639. Okay, just uh, for the clarity, Senator Rice. Okay, so just for the clarity of those in the chamber. Uh, I can't answer that, and um, the officials at the table can't ask that. But if you can contact the drafting office for clarity on that point, uh, we can move to the Australian Greens uh, amendment. I'll come back to provide further clarification of that. So we now move uh, to the Greens amendment one to three on sheet one six one two. By leave that they be moved together. Yeah, yes, so I wish to move amendments one to three on sheet 1612 and, and by leave together. Um, this Greens amendment requires a transition plan from the government in the four trial sites where the cashless debit card is being abolished. Um, we want to have some certainty about what, that, what the services which will be provided to support people in the transition, because we've heard consistent evidence through the inquiry process that whereas compulsory income management is a failed program and does not work, what does work is actually being able to have services provided to people to support them, to be helping, helping them um, overcome the disadvantage that they face and help them to do the best they can if they're relying on income support payments that are below the poverty line. They deserve support from the government. So this amendment requires the government to prepare a plan and publish a, pla and publish a written pa plan within six months of the passing of this bill that would, first of all, show that they have consulted with the local communities um, and prepare that plan th which would improve community services in the area and address the social issues in the area. 
and we, it would require the minister to publish this plan on the department's website and to be tabled in each um, House of Parliament in six months' time. So I'm very pleased to be able to um, support that, and I think it's important in terms of transparency and accountability to make sure that these communities, which you know, are suffering a lot of social problems that need a lot more support, um, are actually going to have a really well documented and transparent plan to innate, to, so that we can see what levels of support across what services are being provided. Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Uh, thank uh, you, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Rice. I'll indicate that the uh, government will support uh, this, uh, this amendment. Um, the, uh, the amendment uh, causes the minister to prepare and table in parliament uh, six services plans for each CDC site. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we welcome uh, the uh, Greens' amendments to uh, uh, table the uh, costs of the cashless uh, debit card program, given the significant investment made by the uh, former government without evidence supporting the effectiveness of the uh, cashless debit card. Similarly, we welcome the opportunity to further demonstrate our commitment to supporting communities through the development of the local services plans for the cashless debit card sites. And, uh, as I said before, the government supports this uh, amendment. Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Um, the, the opposition will be supporting uh, this amendment as well. Um, because we do believe uh, that it is necessary for the transparency that, that there are plans on, in these transition sites. Um, the opposition obviously remains extremely concerned uh, that the removal of this, this card and the uh, so far inadequate demonstration um, of the necessary supports that are being put in place and, and the fact that the minister tonight has either not been able to or has refused to answer questions uh, with any great clarity as to kind of supports that will be in place and when they'll be in place in these particular sites. We think it is absolutely essential that the amendment moved uh, by Senator Rice be put in place, uh, and we also believe that the, uh, the costs um, to be tabled in this place. We would also uh, request, if the government is prepared to support this, uh, this particular amendment, uh, that they be a little more transparent about the costs of the measures that are contained in this bill, because so far all we've heard tonight is that apparently uh, that it's commercial in confidence and, uh, and is not able to be made available. But um, the, the opposition will be supporting these amendments because we believe it's in the best interests of those people that are affected by this piece of legislation. Thank you. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. All of that uh, opinion say aye. Anyone against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Right, we now move to uh, another uh, amendment moved by the Greens. That is uh, amendments one to four on sheet one six five six. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so I move amendments one to four on sheet one six five five six by leave together. And these amendments would go to the heart of what I've been talking about all evening. And uh, that's sorry, the Senator Rice, before we continue, is leave granted? Sorry, leave is granted, Senator Rice. It would go to the heart of what um, we have been talking about in the whole debate about compulsory income management right back from the very beginning, right back to the intervention through the imposition of the cashless debit card that compulsory income management doesn't work. That we are, there are social problems that need to be addressed, but compulsory income management is not the way to address them. We have heard so much evidence. There is so much evidence on the public record of how compulsory income management is a failed tool. And so we're supporting this bill tonight because it goes some way to moving some people off compulsory income management, the people on the cashless debit card in the four trial sites. But we are particularly concerned that that leaves around over 20,000 people in the Northern Territory and overwhelmingly First Nations peoples in the Northern Territory still having to suffer being under compulsory income management. As we've previously discussed, if it's voluntary, fine, but if it's being imposed on people as a blanket measure, it is inappropriate, it doesn't work, it's harsh, it's punitive and it's a failed measure. So this amendment would allow anybody in the Northern Territory who was on the basics card or being transitioned off the cashless debit card to apply to be off compulsory income management. So within uh, the same as people who are 
being in the trial sites, who are being moved off compulsory income management, can apply, that they can pick up the phone and ring Services Australia a week after royal assent, we reckon that should be available to people in the Northern Territory as well. If people want to stay on income management, fine. But if, after, if this amendment was passed, what it would mean is that anybody who is suffering, who has said, we do not want to be on compulsory income management, it is a failure, it is impacting our, their lives, they would also be able to pick up the phone and ask to be off compulsory income management, and within a week they'd be off it. This is what we are hearing from across the country. This underpins our commitment to the, the fact that compulsory income management is having a massive, punitive, destructive impact on, impact on people, that it needs to be abolished. And while we welcome the, the government's commitments to be doing an 18-month consultation process in, with a view to be ending compulsory income management in the Northern Territory, we think that is taking far too long. There are many people who are now languishing under the impost of compulsory income management that should be able to get off to, to be allowed off it. And so our amendment would allow them to pick up the phone and to say, take me off income management, please, and that would happen. Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank uh, Senator Rice for her contribution. Uh, unfortunately, the government won't be uh, supporting her uh, amendment. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the opposition um, would seek uh, that, uh, if it is possible, um, and I would seek the advice of the, the clerks, if it would be possible for us to vote um, on uh, part four um, of the amendment uh, separately to the rest of the amendment. Uh, so we're seeking to vote separately in relation to uh, the minister being required um, to cause the local services plan for compulsory income management areas to be published on the department's website on or before the publication date and that tabled in each House of Parliament within seven days of, the, uh, of that House uh, after the plan is published under paragraph A of the schedule of which this amendment um, applies to. Um, uh, Senator Rice, um, we will not be supporting the remainder um, of your amendment, um, but if it was possible for us to be able to support part four, uh, then we would uh, do so if the bill is able, uh, the amendment is able to be split. Um, Thank you, Senator Rice. We're just seeking advice from the clerk. If you, Senator Rustin, while we are just seeking the clerk's advice on this, can I just go back, please, to the opposition uh, amendments one to four and sheet 1639? You were just seeking a clarification about whether you were going to confirm about withdrawing those ones. Yes, you are. Thank you. Just need that form. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Uh, the clerk's advice is that they can be split, but uh, one and three would have to be, can be dealt with together, but two and four have to be done together as well because two relates to four. So just to clarify, they're, if we, they're split, they'd be split. The first vote was one and three could be done together and two and four together. Okay, thank you. Okay, the question is that uh, amendments one and three on sheet 1656 uh, be uh, agreed to. All of those in favour of that say aye. Against say no. no. I think the noes have it. The noes. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Four minutes. Yeah, it's done. 
Lock the doors. The question is that amendments 1 and 3 on sheet 1656 be agreed to. Uh, those, uh, those, the eyes will move uh, to the right of the chair and the nose will move to the left of the chair. And I appoint Senator O'Sullivan as the tellers for the no. And Kim, are you the teller? For the eyes. The result of the division is eyes 11, noes 32. The question is therefore resolved in the negative. We now move to uh, amendments 2 and 4. Ah. Senator Rice. Yes, I want to withdraw amendments 2 and 4 because they are redundant. They basically depended upon 1 and 3 getting up to be relevant. Okay, okay so amendments 2 and 4, 4 have been withdrawn. Uh, the question is now that the bill as amended be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Division required? No? Okay, the ayes have it. Sorry, just to clarify. Okay. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the bill as amended be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Urquhart, teller for the ayes, and Senator O'Sullivan, the teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33 and noes 26. The question is resolved in the affirmative. The question now before the chair is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those uh, against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Okay. The committee has considered the Social Security Administration Amendment, repeal of cashless debit card and other measures bill 2022 and has agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting uh, President. Uh, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. All of those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill uh, be read a third time. All of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. The ayes have it. Division, requ no, have it. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. Order, lock the doors. 
So the question is that the bills be now read a second time, the, a, a bit third time. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator o, um, O'Sullivan as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 26 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Uh, pursuant to order, the Senate now stands adjourned until 9.30 a.m. tomorrow.